France. We're live on international television with the Golden Trail for the very first time. So thank you so much for joining us. My name's David Hellard. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am about today. And I am Jess Rogers. We and we are we are. I am Jess Rogers and I'm joining David Hellard and there you can see the start line. We are so excited to be here for the Marathon de Mont Blanc, which is round two of the Golden Trail World Series. The sun is going to be shining today. It's going to be hot and it's the first time that we are live broadcasting the whole race on TV. We thought we were going to be seeing a lot of athletes warming up here. They're going to be running. The ladies are off first, are going to be starting in just half an hour. We expect they'll be here in about 10 minutes time. Um, at the moment, they're going to be jogging around in the background. But we have approximately two and a half thousand runners who are going to be taking part in this race today, a Mont Blanc Marathon. And surprisingly this year, Mont Blanc Marathon is longer than a marathon. Yes, I've seen that. It's, it's not what we expected quite, is it? It's a bit longer. Talk to us about that. Is it? It's 44.6 kilometers, right, David? Yeah, so every year it slightly changes. So when we look at the times, and we're going to be looking at the previous winners shortly, you're getting an understanding that just because their times are slightly different doesn't mean they're necessarily worse performances. Because each year, there's normally an angry father somewhere who's decided we could no longer go through their line, which is exactly what's happened this year, extending it an extra couple of kilometers, which is... I think if you're a runner, it's, it's not what you want to be seeing at a, a, a marathon, that actually you're going further. You're not getting the credit for it when, you, when people see your race time at the end of the, uh, end of the day. Yeah, so compared to last year, this, this, is a bit, this is a bit longer then, yeah? Is it a couple of kilometres different? So it's about two kilometres different. We're going to be seeing approximately 2,600 metres of climbing. So there's a, a, a halfway, they're going to be doing those extra two kilometres with a short, sharp, technical climb of around 70 meters, which is going to be interesting for the cameramen who are, the bikes can't get up there because it's too technical. So we'll be having a runner taking over that part to just quickly run ahead. Okay, so talk to me about the, the cameras then. You say, oh, actually, let's have a look at this lineup then, David. You're going to recognize quite a few of these names. Uh, but the story of, of who's returning is John Album is back. But David Magnini, Stian, Killian, they're not going to be here. Um, and in the women's, Sarah, unfortunately, has been injured. But we've really got a stacked field of runners today. And I'd expect to be seeing very similar performances to previous years. Yeah, so these are the, the five previous winning times, winning runners, right? And we can see there's a real like mix of nationalities. Um, are we expecting to see the same today? Yeah, absolutely. We've got athletes coming from all over the, uh, all over the world. Significantly this year, China are no longer in lockdown, though, so we're, we're welcoming them. And Miao Yao is one of the favourites in the women's. She's, um, she's spent her time in lockdown focusing on the marathon. She's extremely fast. And we saw it's a gamma, um, the first race in the series, that she took it out very, very hard. She didn't quite hold on to that pace, but I'd expect a similar strategy strategy from her today mm. which is exactly what we want we want someone taking it out from the beginning because it unsettles the other runners and you can see the start line here which is also the finish line and it's it's 6 34 local time the women are going to be setting off first in about 25 minutes followed by the men just 30 minutes later both men and women will be racing the same course today uh, and we're going to see them actually come up against each other aren't we later on as the, as the men catch up with the women and that's going to be super exciting and we can see oh we're getting a little wave on camera there uh, we can see people milling about we're going to start to see the runners come through soon and so we'll look at the map here you'll recognize this almost as the classic map from previous years two years ago we finished up in the Alps but we're running back into town and um, that means the finish will be fast it's great for people like John Album, uh, the Descenders, people like uh, Manu Marias, but we're actually flowing through here. So you can see we're starting in the Chamonix Valley, and this is an extremely fast start to a marathon. So the first seven kilometers is very gradual climbing, and that means for, um, for our sprinters, they're going to be able to make quite a dent. They then climb up to Col de Possette, um, which is the, the halfway point, the highest point in the race. You can see they then 
have a second climb before descending into Chamonix. Now look at the gradients of some of those ups and those downs. And, and for the runners, this is a real challenge in a marathon distance. A lot of trail runners, classically, you only do one big climb and one big descent. But the issue with having to do it twice is that after the first descent, your legs are already tenderized. You're very, very tired. And it becomes extremely painful, painful to do that second downhill. And so we're going to see people really struggling the second half of this race. And so you said there's quite a lot of up and down. I mean, this is, this is nicknamed the roller coaster, isn't it? The Marathon de Mont Blanc roller coaster. And it's just that. There's a lot of undulating, a lot of the runners having to go up and then down again, right? Yeah, absolutely. And in running, it's so important to get into a rhythm because that's when you can actually listen to your body. You can control your breathing, control your pace. And in a roller coaster, I mean, by the name, as it suggests, you just can't do that. And you have to live a bit more on your instincts. And that's extremely hard if you're not an experienced athlete. But we're going to be looking shortly at the, at, at the, the Golden Trail World Series and exactly what it means to be part of this series. Because Mont Blanc is just the second race um, of seven this year. And we're going to be showing you exactly what the series is all about. What a series 2023 looks to be. I mean, those are the seven locations we're going to, David. And, you know, why are those locations chosen? We're here at round two of the Golden Trail World Series. There's, there's six in, in the main part, and then there's a final, isn't there? And we're heading, heading to an island just off the coast of Italy. Now, can you talk us through those, uh, those, different, those different races that make up this Absolutely. So the Golden Trail World Series, the whole idea behind it is to bring together the best trail races on earth and to challenge athletes over different distances, different terrains and different skills to then crown the overall best trail runner in the world. So uh, the reason why we're starting here on race two is uh, in May, we had Zagama, another marathon with uh, the most climbing in this series. But we'll be talking about Zagama shortly it's so wet and it doesn't have great 5G. So it means if we were to try and bring that to you live, a lot of the time we'd just be looking at the, uh, a, a rainy floor rather than actually seeing the runners. Moves on to the second race here in Mont Blanc. Marathon distance, as we've already said. The third race we're moving to is the Dolomites in Italy, which is short and sharp, um, around a half marathon in distance. We then go to Sierra Zanel, the oldest race in the series, 40, 40 years old where road runners come together to take on trail runners on a 30K race. We head out to America for Pike's Peak Ascent. Starting at 2,000 meters, it then climbs into heavy altitude, 4,000 meters, before moving to California, where we'll be taking on another short race in the Mammoth Trail Race, which is approximately a half marathon, and the grand final in Italy, a completely new trail race that they're designing to test all elements of technical, fast, up-down trail to then crown our overall champion. And right, it's time to look at what happened in the first race of the season in Zagama. And, and this race was crazy, as you'll see by the videos. So if you don't know Zagama, Zagama's in the Basque region of Spain. And as you can see, it's incredibly well known for its rain. It rains 50% of the time. And this has a massive impact on the trail. There's 500 runners, it's limited places, 10,000 plus people apply. And from the start, we saw Bart Podjieski lead out. He was in a, a tight group of people like John Album, Elo Azine. But as soon as the trails hit, Remy Bonnet took to the front. But tracking them throughout was Manu 
Marias from Spain, a specialist on these kind of conditions. In the women's at this point, you can see them coming through Sanctus Spiritu. People camp overnight and they hike up to be able to watch the athletes. In the women at this point, Miao Yao had led out hard and was batting with Blondine Hirondel from France. But surprise runner, Danielle Omas, who we can see from Germany, she's raced on the international scene, but she's never podiumed. And she was in incredible form in this mud and on the trails. And we can then see Caitlin Fielder running through the cave, the famous cave of the race. And you can see the technical skill she had there. Manny managed to overtake four people on the final downhill to win his very first Golden Trail series. Elazine was in second. He was on his shoulder until the town he was shaken off. And John Album, early favorite, former world champion of trail running, he came in third. His legs just weren't ready for a heavy pounding on the downhill. Daniela took her very first podium, a win at the Gamma. It was a huge surprise to her and everyone else. Caitlin flew through the field to take second, her second second in the Golden Trail. And Therese LeBeuf from Switzerland, her first podium as well. She's not been on the international scene for very long. So these are our top five ladies. A lot of new faces there. And the crazy thing about this race was that Daniela didn't actually realize she was in first place until she went to the final turn. So we can see this is our top 10 from Zagama. Are these uh, uh, new names for you? Anyone in there that you'd... Um... Well, I've been really enjoying watching Caitlin Fielder's journey. And I just want to just want to ask, so all of these runners, this is the top 10 overall standings in the Golden Trail World Series right now. We're obviously at round two here in Mont Blanc. Are all of these runners going to be here competing today? Absolutely not. And it is a series, but you don't have to run every race. Okay, and so they, they, they choose they choose up to, well, they choose three, don't they? That they definitely, they definitely, they, they, they take the points from three of the races. Absolutely, there's a lot of tactics going on here and we'll see the men's as well. So this was the finishes of Zagama. And today we've got Manu starting, El Hussein, John's back, Remy's back, Bart's back. So there's a huge number of our top 10 going to be racing, but the distances do vary, but also this isn't a game of football where you can play every week. Most runners, when they run a marathon, it takes them three weeks to recover before they can actually train hard and race properly. And so to be running every month is a challenge, but it might be some of the terrain and some of the distances don't play to you quite as well. So your top three races from the, the first six, those points carry through to the final. And the final is then worth, um, the two races of the final worth twice the number of points of a typical race in the series. Okay, and out of the, the top 10 women and men who competed in Zagama in round one of the Golden Trail Series, who is here this weekend and who do you expect to see on that podium? Well, we're going to hear from Remy, who for a lot of people is today's favourite. He's, he's got huge form but hasn't done well. Let's, let's find out how he's feeling about this race. So I am Remy Bonnet, I'm from Switzerland and I run for Salomon. You're coming to Mont Blanc Marathon, what are you after? Uh, I think I am after revenge, like uh, I didn't start or I want to start in Zegama. So I think I am more prepared now and I will try to, to go better than Zegama. I don't have a good story with this race, I never been on the podium, I think I finished two times four, I have to drop two times also, so it's a bit... Uh, Mixed feeling, but uh, I will try this time to do uh, like a consistent race until the, the finish. What is your plan? What is your game plan? Yeah, I know that the shape is really good, like in uphill at the moment. So I will try to to make the most of it, but don't. I will keep it for the last long climb. But uh, I hope it will be not too fast at the beginning, and so I will decide a bit during the race how how I will manage it. Remy Bonnet there, and not only is he a bit of a favourite, but he's, he's, you know, fairly local too. You know, he's French. He's going to want to do well here, isn't he? Well, he's actually Swiss-French, so almost the same, but uh, he'll, he, he's, he's very passionate about being Swiss. And um, he's, as you can see, he's, he's not his usual confidence. Remy is someone who, he will tell you how he feels. And he, when he knows he's running sublimely, he will tell you that as well. And he's in the shape of his life, but... He's nervous about this race. He's actually been in the lead here 
in three different years and he's never podiumed. Oh, so like always the bridesmaid, never the bride type Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And, and this is really unusual for him because normally he knows he's the best climber in the world, um, potentially of all time. And we can, we can say why we're making that statement later. It's a bold claim, but I, I believe it to be true. Um, but he's always had issues with his stomach. And in a race like Mont Blanc, it's a very long race. Eve already longer, as we've, we've, we've mentioned, 2K longer. And so he struggled to take on enough fuel to make sure that he can run strong to the finish. And so because these races start fast and you always do the climbing first, he has to use his strength earlier. And that means he tires himself out earlier in the race. And so he goes into this knowing he's in the best form of his life, which is unusual for him this early in the season but he's still got that question mark at the back of his head. Am I actually going to be able to run to the finish? And you can see such a variety of athletes here getting ready for the start line, can't you? We've obviously got professional athletes, but we've got lots of amateurs here today. Uh, it's in the thousands, the number of people taking part. Absolutely. We've, uh, and, and there are races that go on for the whole weekend. So the marathon is the, the crown jewel of, um, the, there's a, a VK, a 90K, a half marathon that have already happened this week. But we're going to be finding out from Daniela, last race's winner at Zagama, about how she felt to win and how she feels about her chances today. Yeah, and it was quite a surprise win for Daniela. She didn't actually realise she was in the lead and winning the race until right at the end. So it will be really great to see how she does this year and what she makes of her chances. Um, I'm Daniela Oemos, I'm from Germany and I'm uh, 34 years old um, and I run for Salomon. Yeah, top 5 would be great. I think top 10 was still a very good uh, result. What is your race strategy? Not get influenced too much by the other competitors because uh, 42k is a long, uh, yeah, it's a long day and if you go too fast or too slow then um, it won't be ideal in the end. What if things don't go according to plan? Um, if I just um, see that I'm too slow or slower than I um, would have wished, um, yeah, then I, I, I will go to the finish. Um, if it's an injury that's um, yeah, blowing up, then yeah, you have to decide if it makes sense to carry on or if it just makes sense to stop. And, Daniela there and she's going to have a bit of a target on her back for this race isn't she I mean it was a bit of an unexpected win I think for her and also for for, for us watching and for fellow runners so you know are people going to be after her today well they're, they're, they're certainly wary of her now and, and this is why trail running is so exciting it's such an accessible sport that someone could come along who has been running for years but she's actually been focusing on her family the last few years and, and doing more local races and so she did run Mont Blanc, Mont Blanc last year and she was actually in fourth um, she finished in fourth but because it wasn't on the podium and she wasn't so we knew, we knew well that still went slightly under the radar and the other runners they know she's done well at Zagama but because Zagama was so muddy it was so wet there's an element of athletes wondering whether that was down to the conditions rather than being able to race well today in a race like Mont Blanc. And we have got just over 10 minutes until the women's race starts and we can see them, some slightly nervous, some people just making the final finishing touches, can't we? We've got a bit of a variety of, of outfits going on here. Some, some, are, some are wearing, you know, all in, they're ready for the race. Some are just in shorts and crop tops. And can you talk us through about who is running down and who we should be looking out for? Absolutely, and, and I was just laughing there. I talk about the clothing is, is uh, Yao Miao is, she looks like she's wearing a full rain jacket in anticipation. Maybe because she's nervous about how cold it is at the top. And as a gamma, that was one of the issues, is it was raining early and you got cold. But um, we had Fabio Conti run through there. Um, we've got a Yana from, from a very experienced runner from Spain coming through. Um, we... are, the, are these the top 10 coming through? How, how is it decided about who's running down there now towards that start line? So the athletes have already been presented to the, uh, to the crowds last night. Our, 
expected top 10. And this is normally based off the best knowledge at the time, because often there are athletes who we, we don't quite realize are turning up in good form. But um, we see Teresa Berthier came third in the gamma. She's coming in here. Um, and the great thing is we do have our podium racing again today. So we're, we're going to be expected to see similar battles. Um, Caitlin taped up, it seems. Yeah, a bit of a hobble there, is it? Caitlin Fielder from New Zealand. She seems really happy to be here, though. In the press conference last night, she seemed really positive. And here we've got Sophia Lackley from the United States, who, you know, she's a lot of people's favourite, isn't she? She is. She, this, there's a lot, as I've said, there's a lot of questions, but Sophia is incredibly nervous, though. So, Sophia is a Olympic skier. In the, the close season, she's been focusing on the in her on, on schema and, 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 and skiing. And so she's, she's yet to transition into a full running race. And this will be the furthest she's ever ran. Not even race, the furthest she's ever ran. And so she's nervous about whether she can maintain her nutrition all the way to the finish line. I mean, I'd be nervous if it's the first furthest I've ever run and, and I'm tipped to be the favorite. It's a, it's a time to do it, isn't it? And we're, we're just getting some close-ups of these elite female athletes now. Yeah, little shake of their head there from Sophia. You can see that she's feeling some nerves, but I think the vibe's great here in Chamonix, isn't it? It's been buzzing all weekend. And yeah, we've, we've got all the runners lining up and behind them, you can see it start to fill up as well. We've got people out on the streets. It's obviously nice and light here. It is 6.52 a.m. local time and these women are going to be setting off in about eight minutes time. And these are our potential winners now. Um, so we've got Daniela. We've talked about her already. She's, she's, she's won the gamma. She's feeling confident. Sophia, her first race ever in trail running in the Golden Trail. She won it. Caitlin came second here last year. She's in better form this year. Therese LeBeouf came third in the World Championships two weeks ago, so she has to be a strong favourite as well. Sylvia, we don't know at this distance. Miao Yao has got some incredible math and times, but whether she can balance her pace throughout the whole race. Tabor's been racing in America already this season, and Mathilde is another slightly unknown who's not really challenged the top five in, in Golden Trail previously, but has got a huge depth of experience. But there's people like Elsie Davis, who is the, she's the holder of the Bob Graham round, which is a 24-hour challenge in the UK, the winter edition of that. So she has won some, some very strong races, and she's not even mentioned in our top 10 that this is how packed the field is today. It really is a very elite women's field. And, you know, they are some of the best trail runners in the world, aren't they, over this distance, without a doubt. Absolutely. And, and they... This is the race where, because Ninka, who is expected to be here, isn't here, they all suddenly sniff that they've got the opportunity to win this. And talking about winning, it's about points, isn't it? So every round in the Golden Trail World Series, you get points. Uh, winner gets 200 points, don't they? So if the, if the front runner of the series isn't around, you're thinking, oh, I could nab those points. And this is a great opportunity for so many of these runners. Especially when... Not all the athletes can travel to all the races. Uh, people like El Hussein, because he's from Morocco, has issues with getting visas to America. And so there are only a certain number of races where people can actually get these 200 points. And so the best runners have to be tactical and ensure they're performing um, at the races they can. Because if you get behind early in the season, you could win the final, which is worth slightly more points but it might not be enough. We can see um, the crowds are starting to gather now by the time they finish, which will be in approximately 4.15 4 from now, four hours and a, four and a half hours from now. The crowds are going to be massive. And it's worth saying that this is the 20th year of the Marathon de Mont Blanc, isn't it? And I think it's the fifth year that a Golden Trail series, that, it's been, that this race has been part of the Golden Trail series. As we mentioned earlier, there are seven races in the Golden Trail World Series, and this is the second of seven for 2023. Oh, yeah, you can see the nerves. Some people just bobbing about. Some people getting those final stretches in, making those final adjustments. Now, we're looking at a drone shot here, and this is giving you an idea of the beauty of Chamonix. But today, the course is going to have a mixture of drones. There's going to be camera runners who are actually 
running with the athletes with large sections of the course. And then there's also mountain bikers as well. But because the race is significantly technical at certain sections, that's when they need the runners to be able to get through narrow paths and also to be able to get scrambling up and down very rocky sections that the bikes just can't cover fast enough. And this is quite a monumental kind of time for the Golden Trail World Series, isn't it? This is the first television broadcast of it. And that's why we've got so many more cameras, more drones, more people involved in the filming of every aspect of this race so that we can get those incredible shots and we can follow the journey and we can really follow the drama that is going to unfold. And it, it's, it's, you know, it's a big day for us, isn't it? It's the first time for the, the everything to be broadcast live on TV. And the whole intention of trying to grow the sport and, and why it's such a big step to get these shows on television is, is first to showcase the skill that these athletes have. If you're not used to trail running, it's, it's so different to road running where you can go out and you can look at a watch and just run at the pace on your watch. You might even have pacemakers when you're at the very front end of things. Whereas for these runners, they have to not only be able to pace themselves over very different terrains, but trying to run at the paces they're able to through rocks, up and down mountains is incredibly skillful. And so the more people that can see that, we believe the more people will start to run, the more the sponsors will then be able to pay these athletes. And that's a huge challenge for these runners as well, because not all of them are professional athletes. Some of them are juggling incredibly hard jobs. Some of them are having to raise their family while they train. And, and we'll speak a greater length about that, particularly with Therese LeBeuf and Daniela Omus, who have, have only recently returned to the international scene because they've only had time to now that their children are slightly older and they're, they're no longer um, having to do so much maternal care. Yeah, and we're going to definitely get into that more later. But we have got just over two minutes before the women set off for round two of this Golden Trail World Series and what a location for it. Mont Blanc, Chamonix. It is, it's a bit of a mecca of trail running, isn't it? There's, it doesn't get that much better than this. When you think of amazing trails and you were just saying it's so different from road running, but when you are running with views like that, I mean, it's hard to beat, isn't it? And, and for a lot of runners, this it's, it's special just to come to Chamonix. But for a lot of people, they see that as the home of trail running globally. And... It's, it's, this finish line is so famous that just to take part is something that can be quite an emotional experience for people. So to, to be here on the start line, you have nerves and you have tingles already about actually racing the course you've dreamt of. Now we see a lot of athletes here are strapped up. Now don't worry about that being a massive injury. It doesn't necessarily show that anything is wrong. You can hear the crowd getting behind this. Just one minute 13 until the Marathon de Mont Blanc round two of the Golden World Trail Series is getting underway. Some, some smiling faces, some nervous faces, some, some running faces. Yeah. Try and guess what, who actually is feeling confident or relaxed. It's very hard to tell. Yeah. Just from seeing, I mean, Elsie looks cool as a cucumber, I'd say. But this, this is the thing. They'll be looking at each other, mm. trying to, to, to assess who they think is feeling feeling good and also worrying about how they look because it, this is a mental battle as well yeah and also it's it's about who around the world is going to be seeing them because it's the first time we are doing this live tv broadcast of the whole race and we've just got 30 seconds to go and the atmosphere is absolutely palpable hopefully you can hear that the crowds cheering everyone is going to be supporting these athletes so much and who do we think is going to go out first I'm pretty certain Yao Yao is going to be taking off. And, but pick a favourite at home. So I knew you think you think he's going to do well. But this first 7K, oh, in fact, we're going to count yeah. them down. The very first star on television for the Golden Trail Series. And we are away in Mont Blanc. The Marathon de Mont Blanc is underway for round two of the Golden Trail World wow. Series. Wow, wow. I mean, she's already baking a gap in the first 50 metres. That is going to be unsettling. And that, that is the Chinese athlete that you mentioned, right? That's Miao Yao. Absolutely. She, she's she got huge pedigree in trail, but not for a few years. And so during lockdown, she focused more on trying to get a fast marathon time 
We know that she's achieved some very good times recently. I mean, look at her. That she's in red and she's got the the white cap on, and she's already she's already got a good, I don't know, twenty metre lead. Look at that, and it's stretching, it's stretching all the while. Do you think that 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 group behind her are just thinking, we'll let her go right now, we'll let her go? Absolutely. And and the fact that they raced with her in Zagama, and mm. this is what happened, will give them some confidence because. In Zagama, she, she took it out very hard. Uh, Blondie Lorondel, who um, also an incredibly good trail runner, was leading and battling with her. And it shows, it shows their maturity, the fact that they didn't try and run with them. But Miao Yao really started to struggle towards the top of the climbs as she clearly just paced that, those first few miles wrong. And so they'll be hoping the same thing's happening today. And so the shots we can see now are running through beautiful Chamonix as the sun is rising over the valley. It is 7.01 local time here in France. And this is a lovely drone shot we've got. You mentioned, David, that we're going to have a lot of drone shots, which are going to give us some, some of this sensational footage. But can you talk us through just this first section of the course? What are we expecting? How much of it is on road? How much of a climb is there? So... As you can see, they do start on road, which is, is never an athlete's, a, a trail runner's favourite surface, particularly because they'd have chosen trainers, which are good for them um, over technical terrain. So it, it might not be that comfortable. Here we see Miao Yao, and she is going to be eating this up because she has a 2.30 marathon time. And, and just, just for people who aren't maybe familiar with, with marathon times, what, how does that compare to, you know, uh, world records and, and Olympic times? So if you, were, if you were wanting to run in the Olympics for something like Team GB, if you were around the 2.30 mark, you'd be qualifying for the Olympics. Okay. The Olympic so, qualification. So she is, she is like Olympic standard road runner at a marathon level. She, probably just behind, but runners like Ninka Brinkman, who've run 2.22, you know, she's the second in Europe for, for the marathon. So that's the level of runners here. They're going to be running the first 7K, uh, which is called gentle climbing. But for the runners at home, they're still going to be eating up close to 400 metres of climbing in that. So you're you're calling a 400 metre, like, uh, you know, climb, gentle running. I wouldn't call that gentle running, personally. I mean, <laughs> I'm used to running on, you know, flat canals. So, so we would, as, as, you know, mere mortals, we would still feel this. Can I ask you, what approximate pace do we think the women will be over this first section? Oh, that's a good question. And one I don't have a number in my head for. <laughs> but I'd imagine right now they're going to be looking at kind of five minute pace, yep. approximately. Um, Meow Yao is slightly faster than that. But the first, the first six and a half K, they do um, 200 meters of climbing. And then all the way up until La Tour, which is 13 K in, it's 450 meters of climb. And so it will look like it's flat to you on screen, but they're going to be working slightly harder than if they're running on a flat surface. And to remind everyone, uh, the total length of the Marathon de Mont Blanc is 44.6 kilometers. So it's just over a typical marathon distance. But of course, it's not a typical marathon. It is, it's much harder than, than an average road race marathon, you might expect, because of so much elevation. There's 2,610 metres of elevation. And of course, they're at altitude, aren't they, David? They are, although this, this won't affect all the athletes. So, Germany is based at around 1,000 metres above the sea level. And so, that, you might notice it a tiny bit, but it's not until you really start to get into 1,500 metres, 2,000 metres, the altitude becomes a factor. Um, the top, the very peak of this race comes in at just over 2,000 metres. Um, at, when they're running down the Col de Possette, that's 2,200 metres, which isn't a significant altitude, but if you're Sophia Lockley, who's yeah. been in Norway at sea level, she will start to feel that. Interesting. So that's Sophia Lockley there. We say she's been in Norway, but she, she is American, but she is also of kind of Norwegian descent, isn't she? Absolutely. And, and so she's break, broken away from the leading women's group there, just to, just to go up with the, the, the race leader at the moment from China. So it's a China one, America two at the moment. And we kind of expected to see these two up there, didn't we? We did, and, and but so Sophia was saying in the press conference yesterday that she was cautious and she she was very aware not to start too fast. So I don't know whether this means the effect of having Miario take out so quickly has already changed her game plan, or whether this is 
this is her not being too fast, which, if that's the case, is good news for her. Yeah, and we are five minutes in, just over five minutes, and we've kind of left the roads of, of the, the middle of Chamonix, and we're, we're kind of starting to go on trail. Some lovely trees here, a nice little tree route, and, and you, as you say, it's a bit of a gentle incline, about 400 metres. Absolutely, and I, I ran this yesterday, the first seven miles, and you can see this is lovely trail. Don't don't get sucked into thinking this is going to be the same type of terrain for the whole race. Because I was going to say, I, I could do this. This looks nice. This looks very pleasant. Uh, you know, a nice Sunday morning run. But but this, this don't don't get lulled into a false sense of security, hey? Absolutely. And, it, and it's, it's a really lovely, not gentle, but um, in some respects, gentle warm up into the race, but will feel furiously fast for a marathon. One of the challenges, if you look at the picture, you can see the sun just behind. Mm, beautiful setting though, isn't it, here in Chamonix today? Oh, it's, it's incredible and, and the whole course is beautiful. But it, it won't feel too hot for these athletes yet. And, and that's actually quite dangerous because there were huge thunderstorms three nights ago, two nights ago. And that means it's still very, very humid. And so for the first third of the race, they're going to be quite covered, but not realizing the heat is growing. And so they're not likely to be taking on a huge amount of water or liquids. And if they don't fuel the first third correctly, by the time they come off the top down cold to Passet and they hit that sunshine, we've seen in previous years, a lot of the runners have been massively dehydrated by the time they start the second climb and they've completely fallen apart. So it's gonna be important but, but look, they're, they're regrouping already. Yeah, I, I was just looking at that. I mean, this has happened really quite quickly, hasn't it? So obviously, Miao Yao from China did kind of sprint off somewhat at the beginning. Whether it's she slowed down, they've caught up, not too short, but it looks like she has slowed a little and, and they've they've kind of maybe increased their pace a little because we've got about six, six runners there in that leading group. Absolutely. And so if we look at our runners who we've got in this group, we've got Ayana from Spain in the blue. Um, just behind Sofia. We have um, Sylvia Norska from Norway, who's turned professional this year. She's just off camera in the yellow. And we've got Caitlin Fielder at the back in the right. And I'm not quite sure who this runner is on, on the left in the middle. Um, I do recognize her. I think she's a French runner, but I, I can't, I don't know her exact name. And Therese LeBuff at the back here um, with... We've got Mathilde there as well, haven't we? Oh, sorry, is that, sorry yeah. Mathilde, absolutely. Matilda at the back, and we've also got Tabor Henning in there. But Daniela Umas isn't in this league group. Um, I don't think that's a, a sign for concern yet. She wasn't anywhere near the front in Zagama until we started to hit Sancta Spiritus. The, the, uh, the downhill and then Sancta Spiritus is where she kind of kicked into gear. What will be a factor for these runners, though, is that the World Championships was two weeks ago. And so some of these runners will have done a full marathon distance then and that tiredness will still be in their legs. And that is the challenge of running the, the series is not over racing because almost counterintuitively, the more you race, the less fit you become and the less fast you become um, and the tiredness accumulates. So between the world champs and now, it's likely that they would have just recovered had a few shakeout runs, maybe only had one session where they'd have been able to do a bit of speed work and then they'd have had to taper off and relax in anticipation for this race. And so actually they'd have lost some of their fitness and speed by running the world championships. And so we're going to see a mix of runners here who some of them will be trained to perfection for this race, but their legs won't be ready for the quite the battle and the pounding of the downhills versus some races who'll already be tired where their legs are more used to the pounding, but they've got that tiredness coming into the race. So you can see there, um, Sophia was already drinking, which is a really good sign because that's the part she said she was going to struggle with is actually taking on enough fluids and enough nutrition early in the race to ensure that she gets to the finish line. Absolutely. And we, we saw that that was about 16 kilometers per hour, which I think is about 3.4 kilometers, uh, 3.4 um, minutes per kilometre pace, which is very wow, yeah. fast I mean, to start off with, isn't it? That is recklessly fast. I'm going to put it out there. Um, and this, this is why, this is why maturity often wins races. Because if, if that is true, that running at that pace, 
they shouldn't be running that pace <laughs> quite yet. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe they'll surprise us, but if you think that this marathon is going to take them around 4.10 to 4.20 total time, yes, this is the easiest section where they should be moving faster, but they should be running now thinking about pacing themselves for the final climb. And that's maybe why we see we don't see Daniela group Daniela, who who's the, the German who won last the last Golden Trail World Series race in Zagama in Spain. And I just want to talk to you. We've, we can see a couple of runners in the in this first group. Um, we can see uh, we can see Caitlin from New Zealand, and we can see um, Meow from China. That they have put quite a lot of blue tape on their legs mm. and around their knees. Do we do we know why that is? Have we been told about these injuries? So it doesn't necessarily mean there's an injury. A, a lot of the time during the course of the season, you'll have, you'll have imbalances in your muscles, you'll have niggles. And so quite often when they go to a pre-race massage, they'll be taped up just to make sure that the, if there is anything starting to show a, a one muscle is stronger on one side of the leg than the other, it just means that they secure the muscles in the right position so that there'll be more balance when they run. And it means that any needles won't grow, but also they'll actually have a more even strength profile across their legs, which means they'll race better. And so there is a, a, a massa called Arno, who's, who's famous for having his own style of tape that we'll see on a lot of these athletes' le uh, legs. And even if they're feeling absolutely great, they'll go in because he'll be able to not only flush the legs of lactic, and to, to get new blood flow to the legs. But it, it just gives them this a relaxing um, release of new blood flow to then bring in glycogen and, and increase their, their glycogen levels in their blood. And so a lot of athletes will do that, even if they're feeling great. He'll also be able to feed back on which muscles are tight and they'll then be able to hear how their training's been going. And if there are certain stretches or certain exercises they need to be doing more of just to make sure that they don't start to become imbalanced or that some of their muscles don't start to grow too weak. And we can see they've done 3.4 kilometers out of 44.5. And that is quite a fast time, isn't it? Yes. We're, only, that's, we're only just over 12 minutes, so we are looking at sub four minute pace, really. Especially, I mean, we, uh, to give you a reference of like 200 meters of, so it's where Daniela Omas lives. The biggest hill near her is 200 meters of height. No. So when she trains, she has to run up and down that hill unless she goes out to a, a, a she has to travel significant distance to get to a major mountain region, which is incredibly hard when you're, you know, you're trying to juggle a, a full-time family life as well. It's just a stunning background there as well, though, isn't it? But we can see the small figure there of Mathilde Sagnes. She she is from France. Can you tell us a, a bit more about her? She's one of the, the smallest athletes, but she looks to be doing quite well. She's, you know, she's just hanging on the end of that lead pack, looking quite comfortable. Absolutely. And so she has her background. She's never really broken into the top five in these Golden Trail events. And... I, I think today she'll be top 10. She'll be hoping for a top five. Um, but the challenge for her, I, I think, is we, we don't know enough about whether she can, can hold on very powerfully against the fast downhills of people like Caitlin. And because the race finishes on a strong downhill, um, that's where the real challenge for her, I think, will be to, to try and hold on to these, these lead positions. What I find quite interesting here is Caitlin is, is off the back of this race. and. In the press conference yesterday, she she said that she feels that she doesn't start um, too conservatively. She was with Sara Alonso, last year's winner, um, at the bottom of the the first descent. So at halfway, she was she was in the lead pack. The fact that she's not in the lead pack now, um, that to me is a sign that some of these athletes are running too quickly. Yeah, because in the, in the um, in the press conference yesterday, she really did say that you know she'll probably go out quite hard, and she's here to win it. You know, she she doesn't want you know she's been second twice, yeah. I believe. She wants to be first, doesn't she? So so she she wouldn't be hanging back unnecessarily, let's say. Absolutely, and, and she she knows what her form is like. It's, it's very it's very easy for athletes to be able to um, to look at the statistics when they're training, and so she knows how she's feeling. She said. She said off air to me that she feels very good about this race. And the fact that there are seven runners ahead of her um, is really surprising because I would expect if this was being paced to how they'd be finishing at the end, she'd be in second or third right now. Um, probably mm. tucked in behind Sophia 
a meow yow. So, um, and we are at kilometer four now out of 44.5. So we're, we're 10% of the way through this looks like a bit of a climb to me now we feel we feel like we, we've been going up a bit it's getting a bit more trailer you see the pine trees they're maybe getting a bit more dense yeah absolutely and 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 those those little bumps they're quite annoying as a runner because particularly here you can see they're still running at a fast pace and so when you suddenly hit a little steep incline it changes your whole body positioning and it can, if, if, if you've ever done a triathlon, you know how hard it is to jump off a bike and run. You get little moments like that where you suddenly have to unwind again and remind your body, no, we are actually running very fast. And you, you, you can now begin to see mm. this is a climb. It looks like it's, it's a fluid movement, but if you see the way Sophia's slightly hunched at times, um, that's, that's an indication that she's climbing. Yeah, and we can see this shot here. You can definitely see that that is going downhill. Can, we've, got, we've got the men starting in 14 minutes time, but can we just talk about a bit about what they're wearing? We can see a lot of, a lot of people wearing, uh, wearing race vests. Now, some aren't, some are, but, but in that, those race vests, uh, are they going to have liquid? Are they going to have water? Are they going to have gels? What, what's the normal and why are some people wearing them? Maybe some people aren't, David. And this is always the challenge with the race. Is this is part of the pre-race strategy. What, what do you prefer to wear and which is going to work best for you? So there is some mandatory kit that the athletes have to carry for their safety. It's slightly different race to race because uh, the... Depending on how long it is, how... Yeah, because this is a, this is a marathon, but not all Golden Trail... World Series races are marathon distance, are they? Absolutely, and, and not all marathon, not all of the, of the runs will go up to kind of 2,000 meters exposed glaciers where they, there's snow on the top. And if the rain comes in, you need to have these emergency blankets. You need to have the a, a good coat. And so, the choice that a lot of the athletes have is partly whether they they carry water bottles in their hands, if they have a the the little bag you can see um, that Sylvia's wearing here. I think that's Sylvia. Uh, and, um, or a lot of athletes will wear the belts because if you have a, the bag on top of you, it does cause you to sweat where the contact comes directly into the skin. And, and losing water through sweat can be quite annoying, but it also feels a little bit uncomfortable to athletes who aren't used to it. And so I think Sophia is probably wearing, uh, I think this is Sophia. Yeah. I think she's chosen to wear this to wear this bag because it means that she's got her water pouch you can see on her left there and she knows that she needs to be just starting to sip her drink more frequently than she's used to it's not something they do in, in cross-country skiing uh, in the same way and um, to the same extent as running um shorter distances but you, you you're so much faster as well and so i think she's put it there just as a, a way in which she can have hands free but save time whenever she needs to drink whereas some of our athletes we can see this is sylvia here she's got at the back you can see that big pouch where all her kit is mm. she's not got a water bottle in her hand um which she may be used to but it then means she has to reach to get the water out which can be frustrating and also might mean that you don't do it quite as frequently and we can see that the, the leading group is just splitting off a little bit i can't wait but now we are going back to the, the start line and we've got the men lining up for the start of their race in 11 minutes time. Now, talk me through the field then. Oh, I'm so excited for this. We've got some absolutely stellar male athletes coming out. It's going to be a heck of a race, isn't it? And we've just seen, this is, this is Daniel Sands. He's a very good climber. Um, he, he did very well in the world champs in the vertical kilometers. I expect to see him in the front group uh, the top five, particularly in the first half of the race. The first person we saw through in the all blue, that was Anthony Felber, who's from France. He's moved to Chamonix in November to get used to these courses. He's been a top 10 runner, but never a top five runner. But I think that could change today because he says he knows the course so well. He's actually going to be far more aggressive in, in the way he races. He's predicted a time for himself of three hours 40 would actually put him in the top three podium positions from last year's time. Now, this is, a, this is Andre from Poland. He came sixth or seventh last year. He, um, he's run a 2.19 marathon time um, in the last few weeks, and he's now focusing on purely trail from now on. So we expect him to be in the front group. But significantly, the person we saw before was Man, uh, Manuel from, um, from Austria. 
who was a top five in our, our Golden Trail finals um, last year. His brother is an even faster runner than him. He's the indoor champion for 3,000 metres um, for Austria. Wow, so they've got some good genes in their family then. And so that we've got a few very, very fast marathon runners who we think, as you've seen, there's a lot of running that's been done in early miles. Um, and in, is, this, is this Bart coming in, in the red? Um, he looks a bit different today, doesn't he? Very, very stylish. I'm liking that new red top. Um, Bart Podjewski from Poland, he has uh, his top three here. Um, several times. He's won the series before. He's had a bit of bad luck though, hasn't he? La last season wasn't his season, but but we now see Remy Bonnet coming through and he is the Swiss man to beat, isn't he? Absolutely. I mean, his, his climbing recently, he, we'll talk about this a bit later, but in the last couple of weeks, he has run what has been statistically the best trail run but the best trail performance of any individual of all time. All uphill. So you can expect to see that today. John is here. He won last year. He's a bit sheepish today about his his expectations. He knows it's going to hurt. I, I don't think he thinks he's going to win it. He knows there's a chance, but he's a very different runner to, to who started last year. Yeah, and that was John Alberman from the UK. And he's kind of the UK's, you know, best hope, isn't he, in these trail running series. But now it's the man from Morocco. And, and El Elisine, is, he's a fantastic runner. He could be leading out potentially today because he's so fast. But Elisine is a runner who sits on the back of other runners. And the question is, will he be confident enough to break free and actually take the lead early because I believe he needs to be pacing a bit more a bit more consistently from the start. And th this is this is a round one of the Golden Trail World Series winner here, isn't it? Yeah, Man Manu Marias from from Spain. He is he's known for very aggressive downhill trail running. He's great in the wet. He won't be happy that it's so hot. But what people don't remember about him, we see him as this technical runner who on paper shouldn't be doing well at, at Mont Blanc. But last year, he actually won the OCC here, which is the 50K race, which finishes in exactly the same trails as this race finishes. So actually, he's won one of the biggest races in the world. Um, on this course previously. So a lot of people have been discounting him from this race, but towards the end of the race, we're going to be see him, see him catching a huge number of places. And such stunning footage here in Chamonix at the Marathon de Mont Blanc. And we're going to be having a lot of cameras on this race because it's the first live broadcast on TV of the Golden Trail World Series. And shortly, we're going to be going through the potential winners of this race. But we're going to have we're going to have drones. We're going to have people running with cameras. We're going to have, have people on mountain bikes. I think people are always intrigued about how do you actually capture a race like this? Well, the answer is with difficulty. Yeah, and, and that's partly why we didn't bring you Zagama live, because it was just impossible with the... Uh, so you can see Andre here and Danny. They're, they're both looking pretty... Oh, Danny's looking quite nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, I'd say of all the runners here, is the person who probably has na nailed down what his performance is going to be today. He's, he's more confident. Eli Hemming, we didn't mention. He's Where, an American, where's he from? American? American triathlete. Who it, we saw his his uh, his wife, uh, Tabor Hemming, running earlier. Um, he is someone who also could be leading out. He's fairly new to trail, so not quite as good on the technical running. But because of his triathlon background, He's got an incredible gas tank to him. He's very, very fast. He's already won Broken Arrow in America this season. And he's someone who'll be expecting to top three here. Now, we're going to be seeing our potential winners now coming onto the screen so you can get a sense of who to look out for today. Leader of the series so far, Manuel Marias. Elazine from, from Morocco. He was following him all the way through the race. John Albon, he's won here last year. Remy Bonnet, for many people, the race favourite, last year's series winner. Bart Podjeski, <laughs> a kiss back to you, Bart. He's won this series before. Danny Sands, second in um, Pikes Peak, shows his climbing form. Andre came, he was a surprise last year, coming sixth or seventh. 
Manu Innerhofer, him and his identical twin brother are going to be on the course running very similar times as well. Eli Hemming, I think he should be higher up in this ranking. And Anthony Felber, he's looking for his first top five, potentially his first podium. And as he's French, you know, he's going to have the crowds behind him, isn't he? But we saw there on screen, you know, uh, that they all they all run for a team. Can, can you talk us a bit about, about how that works? You've obviously got Salomon, you've, you've got Adidas, Terex, you've, you've got a whole mix of different brands who, who these runners belong to. Absolutely, and, and that will actually come into play. It came into play in Zagama because not all the athletes had the right trainers for running on those courses. Uh, the different brands have very different styles of trainers. So Adidas, Nike, um, known for their running shoes. They've also got trail shoes. But some of the teams are sponsored by trainer companies. But Anthony, who we saw there, he's actually sponsored by uh, Sidas Matrix. And it's almost the, the most the genius team you can join because Potter. they're a French focused team. But their the sponsor the actually so sponsored the souls of up, trainers. So there's more than one trainer company that have their well, race souls. So he can pick and choose a different trainer brand every race, which means in terms of a competitive advantage, he can always have the best trainer for the terrain in every single race, which the other athletes may not necessarily be able to have. Now that is exceptional, isn't it? Because when you think of trail running, one of the most appealing things is the fact that anyone can do it and you don't need anything do you i mean there's so many sports which are inaccessible because you need a lot of kit but all you need for trail running is a good pair of trainers right and actually depending where you are you don't even need a good pair of trainers uh, you'll see you'll see some athletes who are who are turning out will just have fairly aggressive road shoes with a little bit of a bite to them but the great thing about the golden trail is there's two and a half thousand people who are running mont blanc today any one of those runners can win this race and if they win this race and we're back to the the lead of the women's to feel like yeah, she's Moving looking fluidly. strong, isn't she? Sorry, David. Yeah, she's looking, she's looking comfortable. She's got a lovely rhythm going on. We don't quite know how far behind. Oh, yeah. There is how Chinese. Is, Sophia, is that Sophia in the distance? We're leading into our screens now, trying to figure out if she's... Yeah, I don't think she's too far behind there, is she? But the men are going to be getting underway in less than three minutes. And then we will actually see the, the kind of men and women's field combine, won't we, in, in the next couple of hours, which will be really exciting. And usually in the Golden Trail, the men and women actually start on the start line minutes, at the same minutes, time. But I think this is really great that they have that, that separation. And in fact, surely, with the men coming through and catching up with the women, that will push the women on, won't it? That, that will make them get a little bit faster. And, and this is partly why it's a very different race when the women start by themselves, because if you have men around you, it does two things. One of them, it allows you to pace off someone else, where Sophia is having, and you, we saw Miao Yao take it out. You, they could see all their competition, and one of them was having to commit to the pace. But also, in some of the technical races, one of the frustrating elements of, of being a female runner is that you might get trapped behind a group of slower male runners who, aren't, who are faster on the flat, but as soon as you get to that climb, a lot of our female runners will then overtake the males. And so, if you have just been unlucky enough to be behind a group of males on single track, it does affect the race because you're not free to run at your own pace. Yeah, I, I'm loving this setup here in Mont Blanc. And just look at that. We have got thousands of runners here. You can see countless caps, countless sunglasses. You can see the bobbing up and down, the excitement is brewing. Chamonix is alive this weekend with running fever. And of course, the crown jewel in all of that is the Marathon de Mont Blanc. It is going to be a spectacle. It is going to be hot and it yeah. is going to be fast. I mean, we, we don't normally see this many numbers of caps and shades on at the start line, but it's meant to be 30 degrees today. And at the moment, it is... 7, 6.30 local time. 7.30, you've lost an hour, I've David. My, I've got my laptop in English. <laughs> 7.30 local time, and already it's it's fairly warm. Right, it is time to count down to the start of the men's race. And you can just hear the excitement, can't you? Look at that. And we are so close to being... They've got their watches ready to click. They're all looking at their pace. Here we go, William. 
So who do we expect to be seeing leading out? And already, look at Anthony Felber. Love it. Him in the press conference yesterday. He had this kind of quiet confidence, didn't he? Is that the youth in him? But look, we are away here for both races of the Marathon de Montblanc, of the second round of the Golden Trail Series 2023. And just look at that sea of colours. Look at the streets lined with people. It's such a great vibe, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we normally see, and last year we saw a local runner who wanted to get to make a bit of a name for themselves, take off extremely fast. And they were leading for the first two, not quite three kilometers. I expect something similar could happen here today. We'd normally see that someone like um, Robert McKenboy, Petru Mamu um, would be leading out. We're missing our real sprinters. Ah, so here we go, Bart, uh, who... He's in the, on the right-hand side there, isn't he, from Poland? So he's a very confident runner. He always believes he can do well, and he likes to start strongly and take it out. If you remember our video from Zagama, he was leading out Zagama as well. Um, and a lot of the runners like to, to sit in behind for a little bit while they almost have a communication with their muscles and try and figure out how they're feeling. Because it's very hard to actually set your pace with the adrenaline and the noise of the crowds and the start, it's very easy to start these first 500, one kilometer a little bit too quickly before they know what pace they should be running. Yeah, I mean, oh, you can definitely get carried away, can't you, at the start of the race. Anyone out there who's watching, who's even, even done a park run or, or done a local half marathon, the crowd just buoys you and you, you, you know, you, you get your skates on and you, you think you can run maybe a bit faster than your normal time. And that does tend to catch up with you, but it really is brilliant here in Chamonix. It really is. It's it's the place for trail running, isn't it? And we can see so many different colours. We can see so many different groups of runners who are just going to have a spectacular day out today. And we, we've 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 mentioned 10, 11, 12 runners already, but look at the size of this this front pack already. There will be some athletes coming through who haven't been on our radar yet, but will be entering the top 10. We saw that with Andre um, from Poland last year. Suddenly finished sixth, seventh. He's now um, a name on the series who, who traveled to more races along the way. In fact, this is Anders here on the left from Norway. Um, he's someone it, we hope we'll be able to see some of his downhill descents because in the finals, they had separate segments for the fastest uphill, sprint and downhill. And this guy is so fast downhill. He'll be, um, he'll be holding back a little bit because he loves running downhill so far. But we're actually cutting to our female, female leader, still Sophia. Yeah, I've got a good feeling about her today. You know, we'll see how she goes, but she does look quite strong. And there in second, it's Miao Yao from China, who set off very fast. But it does look like those two have maybe broken away slightly. We don't quite know how far behind the rest of the female groups are. And, and the camera footage that is being <laughs> delivered by a mountain biker is having a bit of trouble. You getting see up. the challenge, like these, these routes and these trails, um, this is why we will be switching back and forth between different cameras, but also they will have thought on the course, at what point do we need the runners to be coming in and tagging in for the cyclists? Yeah, so. a, bit of, a bit of a relay race, isn't it? A bit of a tag team situation, some good communication needed between the different camera people out there, some runners, some cyclists and some drone shots. And here we are obviously back with the men on the road part of this first part of the Marathon de Mont Blanc. Do you see the changes there? So Bart was no longer leading. Already there's a group ahead of them. So look, we've got Bart here. And who is this leading out? Who is it? Um, I'm not quite sure from their running gate who this is. This could be one of the, uh, the Hoffman brothers, potentially. Um, it does look quite, quite long and lean, doesn't he? Or could this be a local runner? They, they annoyingly have covered up their number for us, so we have no way of actually being able to recognise them from the back. Um, but who? I am not aware of who this runner is. Um, apologies. They, they appear to be in a hoka top. Um, but if you look at the gap they're putting into the front of the pack, that to me would suggest they're probably not going to be in this position towards the end of the race. Um, well, well, we'll see about that, but he's definitely got some good colours on, hasn't he? It's, it's quite synonymous with trail running, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, like, like a bit of colour in there. A little bit of flair. If you compare it to the road races in particular. But this is what I love. Someone who's come out, they are willing to sacrifice their whole race. This is Craig Hunt from the US. So we're going to get Googling to find out whether we need to be making sure we know more about Craig if he's one to watch because um, you do get athletes who 
they establish themselves on the local scene and it's not until they come to the states it was all come and he's got an itra score of 875 which is good it's good we'd expect someone who's doing well in these races to be in the 900s so yeah. um so we've got confirmation that is craig hunt of the usa uh and yeah he's he's out leading it. he's looking strong isn't he although he's you know he, the, the itra is the the international trade and look they've already they've already caught up with him <laughs> so this is changed but he's uh, he's run he's run the tushars mountains half marathon he's won that with an itra itra score of 921 which is a very good time that a very good score that was back in 2020 so he's clearly got ability um but the fact that they're spreading out so early on, we wouldn't expect them to be necessarily leading towards the end of the race. But what this does for our, our, our favoured athletes is this gives them question marks of whether they are racing the right pace and if this is something to be nervous of. We're now back with... Um, this looks, I think, is this Miao Yao? Yes, yeah, and she's in second. Yeah, Miao Yao from China in this red top and white cap. Tom, and going Tom. through a lovely, lovely trail section there. And now we're back with the men in group one. And they're, they're quite spread out. They're a bit more spread out than the women were at this point. They really are. And I, I think this is because we've got runners who aren't necessarily pacing for the whole race, taking off. Um, behind them, there we go. There's, there's a more packed group of people i think this is quite far behind our lead men now um there's a, a few race tops in there i, I recognize as being kind of english race tops that certainly are not runners good enough to be in our top 10. um prove me wrong people prove me wrong but um they're saying this is our group too so there's a massive gut there and I, what this will be bringing them comfort we can see the yellow of anthony felber there and oh, we've got a different first man now haven't we <laughs> who is this david um with, this is a, another run of I'm, I'm not aware of either. either. And um, if you're Craig and you've been leading out strong and suddenly someone else has now take, overtaken you, you've come here to make a name for yourself at the front of the race and you're not even doing that. That's going to be frustrating. But our, our lead men athletes will be taking some comfort in the fact that there's a group of them together. They'll be looking around and thinking, who's missing here? Who is, who is actually leading this race from people I know? You know what? I love this, though. Like, with, with the women's race, we, we, we kind of expected to see Sophia and Miao Yao out uh, in the front. And, and we knew who they were, you know? This, I love the idea. We could have someone completely unknown be leading this for quite a long time. And that's the magic, isn't it, of the Golden Trail World Series? Is that is that yeah. is the opportunity for some runners to come through who you, who you didn't expect, on, or maybe those runners who have been flirting around professionalism and, and and getting great times? But you just need one great race, don't you? And you you can be a runner who's incredibly good locally, and there are you know there are so many trail races around the world that you can be winning these local races that aren't necessarily known in the ITRA score, and you come to the international races like this. If you come top 10 here today, you were invited, all expenses paid, to the next race, to the Dolomist Run. Really? So if you come top 10 in, in the Marathon de Mont Blanc, which is round two of the Golden Trail World Series, you, you would then automatically get invited to, to the next race, which is in Switzerland uh, in August. Uh, no, actually, so next, next race is July, Dolomist in, in yes. Italy. And, but you'll you'll have free hotel, you'll have your accommodation, you'll have your... Um, and, and here's Sophia. I mean, look at the, the way it's already changed. Oh, you yeah. see the rocks. And you can see her pace. Do you know what I mean? See the bike she, struggling. Yeah, the bike Come on, struggling. Come cameraman. You've got this. <laughs> We're going to enjoy this today, aren't we? Now, do you see how the, there were significant rocks there? And, and this is still a fairly easy trail to run. But what people don't quite understand until they see the pace of this race is even running down this, it, it, feels, it looks like it's quite easy. And if you're running this yourself at home, you might find it relatively okay to run down that. But if you're running at the paces that these athletes are running, they have to be able to process those rocks so fast that a trail that is not that technical becomes technical because of the speed they're doing. And you know what? I think, I think the cameras can be quite unfair to runners at times because these runners are going really fast. They yeah. really are. If you, were, if you were to see them run past you when you're on a street corner, like they are absolutely ripping but it really, aren't the they? The lead that guy has over our, our second runner. This is, so this, this is Cray in second, but he can't, he can't see the number one runner right now. He's got to be at least 80 meters ahead. So um, 
I, I've, I'd love to know what Craig is thinking because he, he must he must be a very fast. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and find his road tires. You find his, his road tires. We're also trying to find out some more details on the front male runner because well he's come out of nowhere and he's surprised us a little bit here. Uh, but this is Craig Hunt from uh, from the USA. Oh, and this <laughs> we're back with our mystery first man. We're just getting the information so on him. We've got a bit more information on Craig. He's been in the US Olympic trials for the marathon. So uh, yes, Craig could run. Um, interestingly, his profile picture is him running with a massive box on his head. So I think he's probably got some world records. He's got a marathon best of 250, um, which it's not too bad. It's not, no, too, it's not shoddy. too shabby. But but that is the that we, we were just looking there on screen at, at our number one man. Whereas we, you know, uh, Craig is actually sitting in number two. And we're back with the women now. And this is Sophia Lackley of USA. And she's looking strong, isn't she? We're 40 minutes in. And and how long are we expecting this to take the female athletes today? Female athletes, depending on the heat, depending on how they're paced, they'll be coming in at anywhere between kind of 4.10 to 4.30, uh, we'd expect our top 10. Um, the extra distance, distance means it might be slightly slower than that. We can't really talk about course records because every year the course changes. And uh, it's, it's unfortunate that because it is running through semi private land um, a lot of this these are now trails that are open to the public but it goes through a lot of farmers fields and so the trail always has to be negotiated and um, it used to be that the the route was actually run the the big hills the, the running up the Col de Passet was done in the reverse because of a different route allowed by different farmers now this is our race leader we're asking our team to be texting us who this is <laughs> we are and, and just for some context um you can see up on the screen sometimes it says the kilometers per hour now that was flirting around the, the 17 kilometers per hour mark and that's about a 332 per k pace now for any of you park runners general runners out there you know that is pretty damn fast to start off a marathon but he was looking comfortable, and, and that's what we're expecting to see here. They they have gone out pretty quick, haven't they? Both the men and the women. And we we, we were wondering who the the female athlete was in that that lead pack. It turns out it's Scarlett Dale, is was the uh, who was it, around, in the female group. Yeah, absolutely around third place. Here. So this is this is now our lead pack of men starting this is group two. Oh, group two. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Um. So actually, we've been following some of the wrong athletes here with a group two oh, so I, I think this is our, our lead group of men um behind the leader so we've got people like bart in there um all tucked up behind craig we're going to do a little bit of research on scarlet dale as well um and this is sophia luckily still out in front and there was about a 17 second gap when we last got the stats through between uh between sophia who we see on the right and miao yao from china on the left there were 17 seconds between them and then there was uh it was 30 seconds between first place and third place uh and oh we have got information through we will share with you soon about our lead man but this at the moment this is china's miao yao who started so strong here. and actually he told me a bit about she started extremely strong in zagama which was was race one of the golden trail series just last month wasn't it yeah and so she she's run some of the the utmb events in the past and and she's shown she can do well in in technical trail but she seems to have been focusing nearly always on on the marathon in lockdown and and as has forgotten what pacing trail is like it seems and so she led out um she was behind blondine for a while uh, for a while took off on the uphills and then really started to struggle as the rain set in now this could be this is either remy or bart they're both in a red vest top today this looks like bart i said so this is like remy from the running style yeah. um which is i'd say a surprise for okay. me why, why is this a surprise because we kind of expect him to do very well here w would you not expect him to be in in this good a position at this point well it's a surprise it's a surprise but it's not a surprise oh, because oh, remy oh, knows oh, how he oh, feels oh, and he knows his shape he was saying that he was going to start relatively conservatively because in previous years and remy is not from uh from america no nope. he's certainly won in america previously but he is from switzerland um I don't believe there's a, a, a Swiss American section. There are different <laughs> different languages in, uh, in in Switzerland, but certainly not American. He um he has said that in previous years he has taken the lead up um, the, the first big climb 
and he's conscious that he needs to pace for the whole race. And so we're expecting him to be taking a little bit back off his typical race start. So the fact that he's already in effect in the lead, he's not in the, the first place, but he's our leading expecting male is surprising. Elisine is really far off the back here, which is very surprising. And, and just speaking about Remy Bonnet there, the, the Swiss man who is sitting in second, um, he's known for his climbing ability, isn't there? Because in trail running, that you, you kind of have, I mean, for, you know, you're the expert in this, David, uh, but you kind of have three different types of runners almost. You have those who are exceptional at the climb, you have those who are exceptional at the, at the technical bits, and you have those who are exceptional at the downhill. Is that, is that, is that a fair assessment or, or, or on the flat as well? Can we add that in there? Okay. And, and the, often the technical means the downhill because that's really where you need the skill. Um, because of the paces you're running uphill, it can be, unless you get to big boulder fields where, yeah, absolutely, climbing those is, is technical. Um, typically, it's more to do with the speed you're flowing through these, these runners. We've got Matt Meow Yow here. We'll be able to, we don't know how good she is actually technically at pace, which we'll be seeing later in the race. Um, Remy is someone who, four years ago, people used to say that he wasn't a very good downhill runner. He wasn't a very good technical runner. Um, we saw that a little bit in Zagama in the wet, but in the dry, he now is, he's got the skills. So we're now coming up to, I believe, it's saying first women on the screen. This is not first women. We're now taking, this is taking us through the female runners. The really surprising, hit, thing about the, the women at this point is the fact there it, there aren't any groups because yeah. normally you'd have a few people running together for comfort um, and that doesn't seem to be the case first lady was Sophia and um, then there's there a 17 gap actually um, between Sophia and Miao Yao at, at kilometer seven um, which is interesting and but where's Caitlin Fielder I kind of expected to see her up there I mean I we saw some tape on her leg I, I hope she's okay I hope that's not a niggle um, I look forward to getting some footage on Caitlin soon hopefully so Kate Caitlin it, she has before this year started often conservatively knowing that of this group she's probably the fastest descender her and Daniela um, and descender or ascender descender. okay okay and so um caitlin will be pacing very sensibly for the whole race and so the fact she's behind sophia and meow yow isn't a huge surprise um i'd i'd expect her to see her kind of fifth sixth place by now which she may well be we're going to try and find the information from the trackers to see whether when they go through the first tracking point we'll actually be able to see who's in exactly what position. Yeah, and I've got a bit of a question on, on the women. Um, we haven't got Sarah Alonso here this year, and, and she's a bit of a fan favorite. I love Sarah, and, and she featured, you know, there was, there's this amazing documentary series. Don't know if people at home have watched it or are aware of it. It's called Chasing Dreams, and it kind of covers everything that's happened in the Golden Trail World Series, and she's such a feature of that. And and, and she, did she win here last year? But she's unfortunately not with us today. Was, so Remy's now coming to second. So she won here um, her first Golden Trail race. And she, I don't think she expected to win. In, in the first climb, um, she was behind MK Sullivan. Um, and Ais was also up there in the mix, who's, who's done incredibly well here in previous years. She's come second two years ago. And it was really on the first descent that Sarah started to attack. And once she got ahead, she never looked back. The trouble is with someone like Sarah, um, she's all or nothing. And that often means she falls over. So um, if you see the trailer, which we'll be, we'll be watching again later um, to this race and the whole series, you can see her falling again and again and again. Unfortunately, she's picked up an injury. Um, she's had an, injury, uh, an issue with her hip, which she, she's now back running from last week, which is good news but might be a little bit too late to see her in the series. We're hoping there's a chance she'll be able to come in a bit later. I, ex I, I expect to be seeing her as a camera runner, actually, um, if she's not going to be racing, because it's a great way to get your fitness up oh. and be part of the series. But look, the men are actually grouping behind Remy. Um, yeah. Which, it shows Remy isn't pushing hard on this hill, because if he went here... No one would be with him. How, how steep are we talking? Actually, before we go into that, though, the, the, the man in the lead who we haven't seen for a little while is Oscar Clayson uh, from Sweden. 
uh, who has got a bit of a lead on Remy Bonnet at the moment. Uh, so it'll be good to see what, what that distance is between them, if he can maintain that. But yeah, this is Group 1 who, who are sitting behind that. But David, how, how steep is this? So this is still not steep for okay. the runners. Um, the men currently are about 5k in. Yeah, and so where are we on the race map? What, what does that mean? Because there's a total elevation gain during this race of 2,610 meters, which is sizable. Yeah, so there, I mean, this is still the gentle climate. There's, there is a little bit of a bite to be fair to them. So they're climbing up to about the, the 200 meter mark, uh, but this still, they won't be expecting this. In our gentle climb, we say the first seven kilometers, um, and indeed the first 12k, there are two sharp little climbs that will just take them out of their rhythm. That was the first one of them. There's a second one at Agentier, uh, but it's not really until the, the kind of 16k mark when they hit uh, Le Chalet that they really kick into gear. So you can see there's, there's a bit of running downhill now for Remy, um, and they're gonna be, have to be constantly changing their pace. And it can be quite tiring because you, you come out of the climb and you remind yourself, you need to make ground on these faster sections. You've got to pick up the pace again. So is this Bart we're seeing from behind um, in the green? No, it's a slightly I, different top. Yeah, we think Bart was in red, don't we? Sorry, like you in said, red. You yes. said he was quite stylish. So I think this is someone else. Stylish man. I've, I've got a lot <laughs> of time for Bart. Um, absolutely. So we're, we're not quite sure who this group is. I don't see anyone in here who we'd expect to see in the, the very front group. Um, from their running group, from their running style. Um, and you can see a big group of runners ahead. So I think we're looking quite far at the back. El Hussein is in here though, five up. And El Hussein is known as a runner who tends to let others dictate the race. I was gonna say, he's a little bit of a dark horse, isn't he? Because he's a little bit unsuspecting and then he kind of sneaks through, doesn't he? But look, this is, this is Anthony Felt. Yeah, the Frenchman. I'm loving this. So Anthony always has a time that he, he, he's been very well coached and he's a fairly young athlete uh, relative to the tour. And so typically he'd come in with a, a time to race so that he's not drawn into these battles. Last year, he ran 3.53 and he said, based off how he was feeling then and how he's changed and how he knows the course, he's cut 13 minutes off his predicted time today. You were talking about Bart. We, we've got the two men in red, and he was just up there with that, the, with 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 Remy and uh, and the Frenchman there. Look at this pace. Yeah. I mean, now let's this talk guy about our leader. It out. Absolutely. This is the Swede. This is Oscar Clayson, who is absolutely smashing it. And that pace he is running at is 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 nothing short of extremely fast. We're talking around. 3.46 per K approximately for, for that pace right there. We're going to do a, a little bit of digging on Oscar's background. Now, whenever, whenever you hear someone's from Scandinavia, the first thing you, you think is, are they an orienteer? They're probably going to be pretty good in the wet. Not great for today, but a lot of, a lot of the Scandinavian runners are very good technically. And so we've seen, we've, we've seen with uh, Sophia, she's actually moved to Norway for the, the Norway, uh, the, the skiing season. But this means he's, she's had the ability to start running some more aggressive trails. So we've, we've now got some more details on Oscar. And he's known as, he's a very good road runner. He's, he's good at these shorter distances. So he has a 5K time of 14.14. That's pretty tidy. <laughs> um, I'm going to put that out there. That's, that's pretty good. We'd expect, it, we'd expect all these runners to be sub-15, um, particularly our top 10 Um if you're not a, a, a sub-15, uh, maybe Manu, Manuel Marias, uh, he'd be a runner who's, who's better at the longer distances rather than these short ones. But um, significantly for, for Oscar, when we check his world ranking times, the longest distance we have down for him is a 10K. It's not to say that he's not run further distances. And we're going to be checking... He's, yeah, he's recently actually been part... I think he was at the World Championships in, in Austria. Uh, and he came... 43rd, I think, if the, these details are correct. So he's obviously, he's a bit more au fait with the shorter distances. Maybe that, that's his preference. That's what he, he's been doing more. But he's obviously, he's obviously upped his distance recently. And he has been, he took part in the World Mountain and Trail Running Championships in Innsbruck. And yeah, he got a time of 4.54 there over that 44 kilometer course. And, and this, is, this is the trap of this course, is 
these we say it's it's an, a, a gradual start and it is hard to pace yourself on these longer runners uh, these longer runs but particularly if, if you're fast this will feel so comfortable to him right now it's not sunny it's it's the the humidity hasn't quite kicked in but actually as you run in those covered areas it's very humid in there because mm. the moisture has been trapped in that soil you can see that there's it's, it's a little bit muddy underground. And that means the water, as the heat rises, starts to come up. And so he's starting to run very quickly, but he'll start to, to tire far quicker than he's now, expecting. Now, let's take a look at where the women are sitting. Now, we have got Sophia, luckily, out in front. Team Salomon from the USA. Then um, 34 seconds behind, we've got Miao Yao of China, also of Team Salomon. And then... In third, is this a bit of a surprise? Ayana, yeah, absolutely. Ayana, she's she's a very experienced runner. She's done very well. She's won the Gamma in the past, but but and she's been running well this season. But she's been someone who I wouldn't be expecting to challenge for the podium, and also she's a runner who I I'd expect to to pace more conservatively. So. Maybe she's just really feeling great today. Maybe. And and we were talking a bit about Sarah Alonso, who won here last year, but also about, about how people are feeling injuries in trail running, David. Now, now let's talk about that. Ankles, knees, stress fractures, they're all kind of part and parcel, unfortunately, of running these distances and across these terrain. Absolutely. And you'll see a lot of athletes with taped up ankles. But um, the, the, the biggest challenge for athletes is actually... Um, getting the right balance of energy um, and enough nutrition through your heavy training. And so we see a lot of athletes who don't quite get that right and stress fractures can be very common, which is, is, is very, it's, it's just heartbreaking to see because they're very hard to, they, they take a, a very long time to come back from. Um, mm. And this is the balance where uh, the lighter you are, it's, uh, for a while you can run faster, but the trap is that you start to lose muscle mass and you start to lose bone density at all as, as well and that can lead to injury so it's it's very hard to get it right um and we we try and encourage runners to to make sure they're really fueling properly throughout their races throughout the whole season now we, he, he does have some very good performances we've, we've checked his itra scores and back in in last year in fact and I will butcher this because this is a Scandinavian, <laughs> this is a Swedish but, race. But yeah, this is this is Oscar Clayson leading the men here at the Marathon de Mont Blanc in the Golden Trail World Series. So he does have quite a lot of ex experience. Uh, last year, he's run um, at least four races marathon distances. He won the full marathon Vecken Aleph Fallen. Um, apologies to anyone uh, from Sweden. Um, you won't be getting an invite there anytime soon. I will not soon. be getting an invite. But he, he, he got an, an, an ITRA score of 909, which is which is good. That's the kind of performance which, if he was performing that level today, we'd, we'd expect to see him in the top 10. Um, and depending on how this race unfolds, could be challenging for a top five. Uh, but I, I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to say he's not going to do that today because he's gone out too fast. Okay. Um, so you, we're expecting to see him maybe taper off a bit in, 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 in maybe five or 10 kilometers time, or what do you think? As, as soon as we hit those those hard climbs. So, okay. um, but it, it could be that he's someone who likes to warm up and, and, and then ease into run and he'll refine his, his flow. So now we are behind, I, this is uh, Mathilde, who they're overtaking here. So you can see the, the cyclist apologizing to Mathilde um, and trying to overtake to catch runners up. And, and what we'll see with actually our, our camera runners and our and our cyclists, as the men and women converge, it's going to become trickier for them as they're trying to capture the front of both races. And at some point, they'll be together. Mm. And so they're going to have to decide which one of us is actually filming who from now on. Yeah, and we can see we're with, with the women here. They are almost an hour in to the Marathon de Mont. It doesn't feel like an hour, does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, we're going to be talking for 5.5 hours, David, and we've got an hour done already. <laughs> it's a walk in a park, isn't it? I don't, I don't know what all the fuss was about. And the, the question is whether they're feeling... So this is like Theresa Booth and Ayana um, are running together here. So I think this is fourth and fifth. Um, Therese Leboeuf, she has been the revelation of this year so far. Okay, yeah, talk to me a, a bit about Therese. 
she did well last year. She's top ten. Um, she has a young family, and so <gasps> does she. So she, you know, she's she's had children, and she was a runner before, but she's come back to the sport professionally. Yeah, and yeah. so she's 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 done a lot of running in Switzerland. Um, so she's a, she's a good all round athlete actually. Um, but what what quite often happens, um, as you'd expect, when someone has a family, they might do the odd big race, but typically they'll just do more local races, and, and particularly for Swiss runners. There's so many runs because of where they are that you can perform at a hugely high level without having to ever leave the country. Um, but she's come to the Golden Trail this year. She came third in, in Zagama. She was another runner like Daniela who, it was a surprise performance and there's an element of doubt of whether that was to do with the, the conditions, to do with how technical it was. But actually, she went to the World Champs two weeks ago and she, in the what they call the short, do the short course, that's misleading. It's still marathon distance, approximately. She that, came third as well. I was going to say, a short course, a, a marathon distance is not a short course in my book. <laughs> yeah, especially, imagine winning, winning the short course, going home and telling people, yeah, I just won, I'm world champion of the short course. Yeah. And having to explain that the marathon isn't long enough for some people. Oh, I'd be giving that a different name for sure. I'd be bigging it up. That is not a short course. But, it's but, a rebranding, right? Yeah, it does, it does. No one wants to be called short, believe me. Um, now, um, but she she came third there as well. And, you know, really good performance on on what was probably a faster, less technical course. Now, can we talk about uh, this lady here, Miao Yao, sitting in second? Oh, just look at that beautiful shot there. We're kind of we're gonna we're, we've left the trees a little bit, and we are heading downhill slightly, just over the hour mark. And this is Miao Yao from China. Now, she wasn't competing in you know a couple of years ago because of of the COVID restrictions, mm. the inability to move between borders. But she, she's come fighting this year, although she went out very fast in Sagama. When we talk about Sagama, that was the first race in the Golden Trail World Series. And it, it's, it's in the Basque country in Spain. And Miao Yao, who, 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 from China, who we just saw there, she went out so fast. And we were thinking, maybe we've got a new winner here. But she absolutely, um, she trailed off towards the end of that race, didn't she? And she lost a good 20 minutes or so on the descent and just found herself down in about 30th position, yeah, I think. And, and it, it's in some ways surprising. In some, we've got Tabor Hemming here, and who's um, racing her first race of the season. Um, wife she of Eli like Hemming, who'll be will be seeing the men. But Miao Yao, the surprising thing about her racing and, and almost falling apart so early, she comes from an ultra background. She's won CCC in these valleys before. That's a hundred kilometer race. And when she won it back in, um, I think, 2018, she smashed the course record by 30 minutes. Um, and so she's someone who we know can last the distance and can run on trail for a huge number of hours. So hopefully today she's pacing a bit mm. more conservatively. And, and, but because of the lockdowns in, in China, she's not really had the ability to focus on trail as much. So the past two years, she has been trying to get her marathon time down she's done that pretty well 230 not too shabby that will be um, one of the fastest times of our of, of, our female athletes here uh, ninka which is 222 um maud's around that time as well previous champion who's won here twice before but um yeah yeah we she she could blow up because she starts fast we know that from zagama but she could far, she could finish incredibly quickly because she's got 100k in her she's got that ability and that is what is going to be great to watch yeah and talking about that i'm i really hope that Miao Yao has got this right today we see an amazing battle between her and sophia all the way through and also with caitlin fielder probably coming through but you know you were saying there that that Miao Yao has got that distance um, in her that is in sharp contrast to sophia lackley who finds herself leading this race because she said last night that this could be the furthest that she's ever run now that is pretty wild going in to the marathon de mont blanc never having really run this distance before she started trail running last year she you know she's she's got the gas tank she's been to the olympics i think she came 15th in the olympics but not not in running we should we should not point in out. Running. She's, she's a she's a skier isn't she she's, she's a long distance oh look at that oh, energy so she is she will be coming through I'm trying to figure out which point of the race this would be oh yeah i mean that that those little boosts there, that was one of the aid stations. Yes. Talk to us about the aid station, David, because me and you sit here, you are David Hellard, you are, you know, you're a trail runner yourself. You you know these athletes, you know how it works. And 
I'm Jess Rogers, and I, I'm here to kind of understand what it's like from from the, from the you know the voice of the people sitting at home because this is the first time that we are broadcasting this properly on TV. And so the A station, how I think we've got three on this course, haven't we? Three, which which isn't a huge amount. Um, it, it's fine for nutrition, but for water, it's not a huge amount. So we saw Miao Yao there was um, she her coach was handing off at the aid station. So there are three aid stations on the course. But they've also turned them into cheer zones where they've got music, all the fans of bus there. And that's the opportunities for the athletes to, to not only dump their existing bottles, but typically they'll have water bottles there, some with electrolyte drink mm. and some with carbohydrate drinks. And speaking about uh, electrolyte drinks, it's, it's important that athletes don't just take a water, isn't it? Because electrolytes actually replace the salt that you lose through sweating um, and, and, and through running. So it's important to actually get other things in you, not just water and what's, not just... What's this selling us here? One kilometre. That can't be right. Whoa. That's, that's huge, isn't it? I'm, I'm doubting that. There's a chart. I mean, I, I, that would mean there's a, a four-minute lead across. Maybe slightly more. At this more. point in the race, when, the, when we've only been going for an hour and I think four minutes, uh, that's that's massive. So we will guide you through this. We will give you our our honest opinions <laughs> when when we feel the stats aren't backing up. But a lot of the runners will come through and they'll have gels taped to their water bottles. Okay. And and we saw with you know John Albert at Zagama, he missed his gel early on. Um, uh, I, I don't think it costs him the race. I, I think that was pre-season. You know what, I, I, we think we were doubting that, but I tell you what, Miao Yao's only just gone through that section where we saw Sophia Lackley, so it, it might not be quite that, but it is a quite a significant gap, I think, between the two. This is a, this is a huge, and who've we got? Uh, uh, <laughs> they're, they're warming up by cheering themselves on. I mean, why not get a bit yeah, of glory for yourself? Yeah, well. now, now, people who are maybe not familiar with trail running or, or mountain sports and mountain biking, these cowbells are synonymous with the Alps, aren't they? And, yeah. and with these types of mountain events to just really make that noise and get behind people. Yeah, it's, it's great when you're on the course. It's terrible at, at times in Zagama because the way you're staying, and you can hear the noise in the background from the cheer zone. It, it gives you so much energy. When, and as these athletes come through, they'll pick up their bottles. Some of them won't even stop. But if they stop for a tiny bit to refuel, with this music and the energy, they then get taken into a different pace. And so mm. there can be a chance with the adrenaline that you lose your rhythm as you come through these, these aid stations. But in, in, um, in the gamut, a lot of the cows have these bells on, so you know they're there. But it can mean if you're trying to sleep the night before, there's these bells ringing the whole time. Absolutely, and we just saw the, the first and second female leaders there. And you can see that the sun is coming out and it is starting to get hot. We are, we are in Chamonix and it's warm, isn't it, David? It really is. I, I think who are we behind it? So this is now our... Uh, we, we don't know if this is the lead male, but this is certainly the lead group. We've got Anthony Felber there yep. pushing the pace. He's looking strong, isn't he, the Frenchman? Looking. The young Frenchman who, in, in the press conference last night, just had a, a quiet confidence about him. Absolutely. He's very relaxed. This, I mean, this is a great sign to see him doing this because he knows this course. He moved here in November and he's been running every single route. Yes, you say that he, he now lives in Chamonix, doesn't he? So he is familiar. He knows what's coming up. He knows how he can run on this trail. And that's only going to serve him well, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and in this group, we've got a lot of people we'd expect to see. You can see Remy there, um, snot rocketing to the side. Uh, <laughs> probably didn't want that on camera. But um, you can see Bart tucked in there as well. I think this is uh, Manuel from, from Austria in this lead group in the, the shades with the red and the white. Um, the, it's the, the camera work, in there, I can't quite pick up. I think that's Eli Hemming in white at the back. Um, but I mean, you, you say this is the lead group, but we still think we've got the Swedish man, Oscar Claesson, uh, out in front, who, who's from Nostro in southern Sweden. And I do apologise for um, the Swedes out there if I've completely butchered the name of that. But he's 28 years old, and we think he's still out there leading the front by, by probably a fair distance. Yeah, it's, it, it seems to be a fair distance um, from what we can see from the race split. And none of these athletes would be that concerned, actually, because... It, 
if we saw how he was running, he was he was running at a pace that didn't suggest he was uh, running marathon pace. So now you can see the change of terrain. Mm. There's a lot of switchbacks. It's um, slightly smoother, but this this is holding moisture. This air. And you can see the sun coming through. But you say switchback there, and, and is that where you mean that you literally you're running one way, then you kind of turn back on yourself and continue to go uphill? Yeah, abs and absolutely, and and particularly on the final downhill. Those switchbacks switch can be quite hard to get a rhythm in because it, as your legs start to hurt because of the pounding they've taken, you then have to break on every corner and then pick up your speed again. And so it is a bit of a talent how to flow through those at a consistent pace. I love the fact our, our, our camera runner here. Yeah. Is, um, you, can, you can see they're really struggling with this. Here, you can hear the, the heavy breathing. And, and here for the Marathon de Mont Blanc uh, in the Golden Trail World Series, we have got various different cameras going on. So you've got, you've got this person here, for example, who is probably holding, holding a GoPro or, or something similar and running behind these runners. Just like you can see the shadow here. And, and to, to, look to the right on his shoulder. They're carrying quite large backpacks, which is live streaming this back to us. So not only are they having to keep the pace, but they're having to do that with a bit of weight on their backs to take their balance off. And, and, and we also have mountain bike runners, but you can see, oh, Meow Yow, she's got a bit of a sitch there. I was just about to say, she's not looking anywhere near as comfortable for Sophia Lackley is she's probably taking on a gel I think maybe she was getting something out uh, she's just she's just slowed to a bit of a hike hasn't she this looks so it's just, it's just <laughs> from 0 0.3 to 0 0.16 this looks more like what we'd expect 160 meters but you can you can compare them side by side um so yeah we're learning about meow meow there you can see she had her hands on her legs so she she maybe isn't feeling like she's as good a climber and and this is what we saw in Stranda last year at the Golden Trail. Um, Sophia took off on the very first uphill. And this is her real strength. She's, she's not bad, technically, downhill for someone who's only in their, their kind of second year of any type of running. But it's really on the uphills that she can use her lungs um, and put those to good effect. The men are still in a big group, though. But they're, they're starting to have a bit of a scent now, aren't they? they they're looking quite comfortable. Uh, they're looking quite chilled, but they're, they're starting to, to get those, <laughs> get those meters cyclists. in, I know. So, um, previously we've had Miguel on bike, his Olympic champion of mountain biking previously. That's the standard of a uh, cyclist we'd need to get on tour to film this. Was he, was he just a bit, a bit of a loose end then, one to say to He's actually, he's on the Tour de France at the moment, doing the hostage there. I think that's, is that Daniel Sands in the red, um, who... From his running style, I, I think that's Daniel Sands at the back. He's also a very good climber. I love being back here with, with uh, leader Sophia Lackley from uh, the USA. The, the heavy breathing and the sun shining through, I think, just says it all. What a beautiful setting. Now, we've got some split times for you at the 40-minute mark. So we're, we're, now already, we're already an hour in, but it's good for you to get a sense of where it was. So in first place was Sophia. We knew that. Um, she came through in 41.24. Miao Yao was in second, 41.58. So already 30 plus second gap. Um, 30 seconds back on her was Ayana Cortazar. Um, really surprised to see her in third at this stage. And Tabor Hemming just off her shoulder in fifth, 42.51. Caitlin Fielder, sorry, in fourth, back in fifth. Caitlin Fielder, where we'd expect actually, um, 43.10. Uh, Matilde Sagnes just off her shoulder mm. so Matilde's up there she's in a good position for fifth behind them we're then seeing Sylvia Nordskar uh, Nordskar from Norway Scarlett Dell from England I do not know Scarlett um, welcome to the Golden Trail Scarlett Ella Davis also from Team GB and rounding off our top 10 uh, Tar Botten of Bianca Tarbotten from ZA. ZA. That's what's We've actually just got some new splits in for the women, and we can see Daniela Umos um, from Germany, who, who was the winner in Zagama for the first race of the Golden World Trail Series, and she was sitting in eighth. Caitlin Fielder is in seventh. Then we've got Sylvia Northgar in sixth. Matilde Sagnes in fifth, doing really well. Tabor Hemming at fourth. And then it's the top three that we were mentioning before. In third, it's Cortazar from Spain and in second is Miao Yao, who you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. And in first place, Sophia Leckley. And she's got about a two-minute, over a two-minute lead at the moment. And that that is significant in, in trail running at this point in the race. Yeah, absolutely. Although, 
on the downhill, we'd expect Caitlin and um, also Daniela to start um, eating up the, the terrain. So is, is Sophia, Sophia like, is she, is she known for her uphill prowess rather than her downhill? Is, is she weak at downhill or um, are the others just really good at it? We, we still aren't 100% sure on her skills because we've only had a few races to really gauge what she's done. We saw when she was running um, in Flagstaff last year, she, she, fell, she fell behind Ali, Ali Mack um, on the downhill. She was running with, um, with Ninka, who's also not known for her technical downhill skills. We know she's good on the smooth downhill because she is fast. Um, but off, uh, when we get to the peak of, uh, the, near the Col de Passet, that is where we see some quite rough terrain. And we'd expect to see her lose a bit of time, not on the up, but on the down to um, particularly Caitlin and, um, and also to Daniela there. And so those two minutes will reduce, uh, sorry, there's, 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 there's time ahead of our kind of fourth and fifth will reduce. We're not quite sure on Miao Yao's ability over technical yet either, because if you're running something like the, um, the CCC, the OCC, so talk to us, what, what are those races then in comparison to the Golden Trail World Series? Where, those those where... are based in Chamonix as well, but they're significantly long. Okay. So you're looking, CCC is um, 100 kilometers. Miao Yao just really struggling here. When we, when we saw Sophia in this section, she was kind of, she was cruising, wasn't she? Miao Yao, I, it's, it's, it's not looking that promising. She's, you know, having to mix between a bit of walking, a bit of running, hands on her knees and things. It's a, it's a little bit yeah. worrying this early on. And, and you can tell that they're starting to, to reach the steep climbs now. Um, it looks like we're back at our, our race yeah. leader. Um, For Oscar, the men's. Oscar from Sweden. He's, he's, taken, he's taken back a little bit of that pace, but he's still looking pretty smooth. Yeah, he is. And we didn't really expect him to be coming up. When he first took the lead, we were like, who is he? You know, when we did our, our top 10 rundown, he he wasn't in it, but he is a very good Swedish runner. And, and David was saying earlier, you were saying to me, weren't you, that that the Swedes, you know, they've got a lot of uh, of amazing races near them. So they can do a lot in, in kind of very close proximity to each other. And we might not know about them so much more on the global scale. And, and particularly if you look at places like Scandinavia and Switzerland, um, where orienteering is a big sport for them. A lot of orienteers, it's, it's quite a closed community. And so they often don't step out into trail running world. Uh, and we've seen people like Judith Weider, who've come across, who's five times world orienteering champion, stepped across and won the gold trail series in her first year. And um, we'll, I expect we'll see him on the down, downhill. Very, very technically gifted because they're typically looking at maps where they don't even acknowledge what's happening underfoot. They're so used to just flowing over whatever's in front of them that when they actually are no longer having to map read at the same time they can just run smoothly and and talking about or orienteering i mean we're, we're this is round two of the golden trail world series and and for those who don't know there, there's seven rounds isn't there this year in 2023 we're in round two of seven but but the seventh is a final so out of the six races it, you have to, you, your best three performances are taken, aren't they? And that would get you a place in the final. Absolutely. So you get 200 points is the maximum score for winning one of the, uh, the six normal races. We then have a prologue, which is a, almost like a 5K warm up sprint, which is worth 100 points. Okay. And then that same weekend in Italy, the final is worth 300 points. So it's, it's, it's worth more than one of these races in the season. But if you come out of the, the first six races with 600 points, you're going to be very hard to catch. And, and, and the whole kind of ethos behind the, the Golden Trail series is to bring together the best trail running races across the globe uh, and, and make a real spectacle of it. And, and also, you know, get the best athletes on it. And I think it's important to point out as well, there's a lot of trail running races out there. But the Golden Trail Series, it's not the ultra distances, is it? The longest distance we have, it's this, it's this race, I think, isn't it? It's 44.6 kilometers, which is just over a regular marathon distance. We, we weren't sure if it was going to be the longest race in the series. And then they added an extra 2K. <laughs> so we're sure for now. And and the whole intent of the Golden Trail is, is to try and create something that inspires. And so, and and look, this, this lead pack has already reduced you can see uh, Remy's gone off the front, I believe in, in ahead. We then have this pack here that's got, um, it looks like Taylor. Um, From America, yeah. So, so Eli Hemming, oh, here we go. There's Eli Hemming with 
Um, Remy ahead, and so they've, it's been reduced down to three now. Um, and I'd expect this is this is battles for the podium mm. right here. Can I ask you a little question as well? Because mm. we're going we're gonna to be talking about obviously the prowess of these athletes, who's in the lead, the split times, but also we want to talk about a bit more about trail running in general. Like, what are they wearing? What you know? How do they use their watches? A bit about nutrition. I've got a, a little question, David. That some of them have these tags hanging out the back. Do you know what they are? Is it a, is it a wardrobe malfunction? Is it to do with their kit? Is it, is it what is it? Talk to me. So uh, it's not that they have uh, they don't have tags from breaking the law. They're not they're not meant to be under house <laughs> arrest. Um, for a lot of them, actually, I, I don't actually know what those tags are. Typically, a tag like that would be to. Um, it could be a, a GPS attaching to the GPS tag, or it could be that they have um, for the bag drop. I'd expect this is linked to the GPS. We've just had an update that Remy is now 25 seconds from the lead. So we can give you the full splits on what's happening. And this is where, if, if he's got a 25 second gap now, he will be leading by the top. Uh, let's have no doubt. So we, we were given the splits 36 minutes into the race. We know Oscar was leading at that point. Um, in second place was Anthony Felber from France, 37.40. So he was approximately a minute down. In that group as well, there was a whole batch of them. So running together, we had Bart Podrieski from Poland, Remy Bonnet from Switzerland. We had Dylan Ribeiro, who we don't know from France. Um, we'll be looking up his details to find out more about him because he's a new name in this group. Eli Hemming from America. Manuel Inhofer, who's not run um, Golden Trail International Series before. He's been in the National Series and he came fifth in the finals. So he's clearly backing himself today. And also Alexander Ricard from France. Just off the back, Craig Hunt looks like he's tiring a little bit. And Peter Eng Endau from Sweden. He's a, uh, he's a very good runner as well. Um, and you can see on the screen now the top 10 at the 9.68 kilometer point four for the men's and yeah do you want to talk us through that i mean for me significantly the big story here is that john album and el hussein are not yeah. in that group it might be because the top 10 are so close together that actually they're just behind um but peter lives very close to um i believe he lives and trains near john and um killian journey they all know that they all train together so they're they're all learning at an incredible rate picking up tips from each other and uh, the, 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 I mean, you can see the split times there, a, ma a maximum of one minute between, you know, runner number one there and runner number 10. And that is very different from what we're seeing in the women. The women did start 30 minutes before the men. And so you are expecting to see those, those distances, those, those time between the runners eke out a little bit. But I think there's a good probably two minutes, over two minutes between mm. um, the lead woman and the second woman at the moment. And, and, and that's, that's quite surprising in comparison. But, you know, we've got more men running here as well, haven't we? I, I think it's partly because if we look at the profile of the male runners, there isn't someone out. Um, it should be El Hussein, who's, if you look at their abilities, who's leading this race out because he's the quick guy on smoother surfaces. But there's no one in there who's prepared to really actually try and blow up this race. And because they haven't hit any steep climbing yet, it's given them the ability to all stay together. So we've got nine people all in that lead group approximately, but there's some runners in there who shouldn't be in that group and are really going to see a challenge. Um, so what we need to start looking out for now is as we see these runners, just trying to see how fluid they look and how comfortable they look, because that gives an, as an indication of whether they're running slightly too fast um, and, and actually are out of their comfort zone because they should at this stage be breathing significantly you know, above a casual level, but actually they should be smooth and they should still be just almost in that, I'm still finding my stride. And Oscar Cleason there, who is leading the men, looking quite comfortable, isn't he? And, and he looks like a, a bit of a bigger guy, actually, for, in terms of trail running physique, a bit more broad shoulders, a bit more height on him than, than for example, some of the runners we see here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, so he'll, he'll be a very powerful runner, which often translates to fast on the downhill because 
you take a huge pounding in your quads as you go down there. Yep. Um, and you've got more mass, haven't you, to kind of like help you down qui... the mountain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it does mean it can be quite hard oh, to, now, to, to climb with that extra Now we're back with weight. the women, and this is interesting, David, isn't it? Because we have got the Chinese um, Ma Miao Yao, who has been in second place basically the whole time. And But who is this in third? Juliana Kutza, who... She, she's not someone we'd expect to be in, in second. I mean, yeah, look at that. She's overtaking to take second. She's really overtaken significantly. Uh, like that, that was a clean overtake, right? And if you look at the, the two different stances they've got, um, they're both hiking. And, and you see, Miao Yao has now changed her. She started to put her hands on her knees. And Ayana is attacking yeah, right, this, this uphill. She might not be running, but she is not reducing the intensity of her effort on there. Prior to being overtaken, Miao Yao was looking like she was a bit defeated and mm. and not actually racing these. But you can see there, she's, she's going back and forth through the, the changing of styles. And, and this is the hard part about running technical trail is some of it's better to walk on and you, you, you lean on your legs to try and push off with your upper body and share the load throughout your whole body. Yeah, because I think it's important to say that because they're, they're, they, they look like this, it doesn't actually mean that they're in a bad way because mm. I think sometimes, you know, if you were to look at a, a traditional road race marathon in the Olympics, for example, if you've got a runner who's leaning on their legs, that is not a good sign. But this is very different. There's so much incline and actually they're preserving energy and sometimes they could be faster doing this than if they were actually running. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but even if it... That there will be, they will have cho constant choices of when to switch their running style. Um, so we still have Oscar leading through the first aid station, the 13.6k. Um, he's gonna, he's gonna be loving yeah. running through this crowd. Um, but they're constantly making choices on, on whether to run or whether to power hike, and it, it's oh, taking, it, taking on pressure. It looks like he's got a lot of, a lot of aids there. He, yeah, he'll be absolutely. have, a, he'll be have a mix of isotonic drinks, gels, and water, won't he, David? Yeah, absolutely. And, and they'll, they'll all have very different strategies. We know with Remy, he's really struggled to take on enough nutrition for the longer races, and so. And, and when you say nutrition, is that a mix of, of food and water and gels? Uh, is, is that all of it? Is, is that what nutrition is grouped as? Yeah, it's it's yeah, absolutely. Any anything that's not water, we'd say is nutrition, and we we see a start a, 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 a steep learning curve a lot of, a lot of the time for these athletes. So El Hussein, he comes from Morocco. He's a Berber. He was discovered as a runner because he was running to get water for his camels in the desert and European people saw how fluid oh. he ran. So wow. he normally likes to have mint tea when, like genuinely mint tea. Like, mint tea, as in like peppermint tea. Yeah, so that's, that's what he'd want to have if he was here. And so these past three years, we've seen him He's done very well at shorter races, like the Dolomis run, where he came second. Badly parked car, we can see there, just Thanks. right in the middle of our, our right course. <laughs> um, and you can see Remy is already closing in on first place here. Um, and this is before the significant climbs. There's been a, sh a few sharp climbs. Um, uh, yeah, look, look at this now, Remy Bonnet from Switzerland, who is a bit of the favourite here, you know, and he is, he's, he's, client, he's, he's closing in on the, on the, on the sweeps. look at their gate, like Oscar looks like he's, he is looking more tired to me here. Mm. Um, He's not quite living, lifting his feet as high as Remy is. Yeah, and, um, and the, the pace that he's moving his legs. He's obviously got longer legs, so he doesn't need to need to to match him in terms of stride. But yeah, look, you can see that this this back group has really they've got the beans they really have yeah. at the moment. Whereas Oscar, ah, oh, you can just feel like maybe he's, the gas isn't there at the moment. You've just got to hope that Oscar can now settle into a new rhythm to not let this get to him too much and just to try and start pacing for the end of the race. Because so much of this, I mean, we've spoken a lot about legs uh, and pace, but so much of it is a mental battle. I mean, Oscar there, he's been leading for almost an hour, right? Mm. Been feeling probably pretty, pretty great about it. And then he, he probably knew that he wasn't going to lead the whole way. Um, but then you have to shift your thinking, don't you? You'll be disappointed. Then you're like, okay, what, what's my new aim? What's my new feeling? And I just see these people go past you. Packed oh, together. Love to Five see it. Five runners, six runners, all in one massive group. Cameraman group. absolutely streaking after them. It feels like they put their foot on the gas, doesn't it? That, that yeah. aid station's giving them all such a boost. The cowbells are going. Nutrition's being taken on. And uh, I love, I love the two red vests we've got here. We've got the pole in bar, and we've got Remy Bonnet, the, the, the Swiss up front. And that's it's great. Everyone's from a different country. Absolutely. 
absolutely fantastic to see. Um, and, and a real mix of varieties of, of running styles as well. And so what I'd expect to see in this, this hill, because what I don't know well enough about um, Manuel Innerhofer is where his strengths lie, because we've never really focused on him in Golden Trail before. So um, we know he's a very good all-round runner, but I don't know whether he's picked up his places up the hills or down the hills. So we'd expect um, Eli to be close to Remy, but, but it's not quite as strong a climber as he is a defender. So I'd expect him to drop off a bit. Anthony can certainly climb, um, but is a more of an all-rounder. Um, so I'd expect coming up this hill, Remy to really lead out and Danny Sands will start to pick up places as well. He's an incredibly good... Oh, that was John Albans There was John Albans. Yeah. The, the, the Brit... There's El Hussein. Yeah, they are, they're a bit back, but probably, what, 30 seconds or so was yeah, that? which is actually, for this stage of the race, um, absolutely perfect place. Okay, yeah. great. And, and for, I, I'm, what excites me about seeing that, I've never seen El Hussein this far back in a race, ever before. Ever. So, so what does that mean then? He's learning. So the golden trail, and we're, we're back to Miao Yao, who's now dropped out to third. You can see she's, she's falling away a bit from Ayana. So in the golden trail finals, last season there were five races, back to back, five days in a row. It was absolutely brutal. And Remy came into those in the best form I've ever seen him in. Um, El Hussein typically likes to just sit on the shoulder of whoever is there. Um, he doesn't like to make decisions. It's very clever as well in some respects because it's so annoying if you are having to choose the pace. Mm. You're having to pick the lines of where you're running. And we saw it's a gamma. Uh, El Hussein is someone who we consider to be an incredibly you know, technical downhill runner. But he just locked in behind Manu Marias, who is, and just went wherever he went. So Manu's doing all the work and El Hussein is just there loving it. Now, last year, Remy was getting quite annoyed on this. And so on the second day, he intentionally hit the hill and blew El Hussein up. Mm. He went faster than he should have done, and El Hussein couldn't handle it and just dropped down the field. And he's now learned to actually pace according to the race, and not just follow the person in front of him. So this is a really good sign that he's so far back, because hopefully it means he's pacing for the whole race. Oh, but we're, we're now with the women, and... What what a view that is um, of Chamonix. We've got Miao Yao sitting in third here, who it's, it's a bit of a shame to see because I, di I didn't want to see this. After the first Golden uh, golden um, World Trail Series in Sagama in Spain last month, she started so strong again and then dropped back. And we just really hope that she she can hold on. I mean, she's a very good marathon runner, as we've mentioned, yeah. isn't she? Um, and, and here comes, I, well, I believe this is fourth place, actually. Yeah. Tab Tabor Hemming coming through. This is a great performance by Tabor, actually. She's, she's been in around the top 10, um, but she's never broken top five. But this is her, her first race golden trail of the series. Um, and as with Eli, she's fairly new to trail running as well. Um, so they both, they're both, they actually live in a ranch. Um, live in a ranch together. Okay. That's where they train. You, you say that they're new to trail running. I mean, they're kind of just, you know, decided one day, let's go do this and, and amazing at it. What was their background? That, that's, it's, it's crazy how many people find the sport from other sports. So Eli Hemming is actually, he's won one of the gold cups in um, triathlon. He's beaten the brown lead runners. He's beaten the best triathletes on earth. Um, but it was 30 to 35 hours a week of training. He said that when he finished training, he'd be so tired that he then just wouldn't socialize. And he wouldn't even be great company for his mm. wife, uh, Tabor. And so he just had enough. And they, they did a trail race. They loved it. And they decided, well, let's give this a go. Um, but these two, they were the surprise on the series last year. They both came to... Um, Sierras are now. They did okay in their first trail race in, in Golden Trail. They then got married and they used the final as their honeymoon. No because way. It was all expenses paid because of their. <laughs> and so they went, they went to Madeira. That was their honeymoon. Well, I they tell you what, Madeira is such a beautiful spot. And we're, we're not racing there this year as part of the Golden Trail World Series. In fact, we're, you know, our first race was in Zagama uh, in, in the Basque Country in Spain. We are, are now in France in Chamonix for the Marathon de Mont Blanc next. You can, you can we'll, we'll be going to the Donomis run next, but 
look at this. Uh, can you hear the wind here? Yeah. They'll actually be wanting some wind because the sun is really coming up now. It's 8.30 in the morning, but already they'll be feeling that heat. And uh, we get a, we, this gives you an opportunity to really get a sense of the distances between the runners now. And so this is like Sophia coming through. There's no one in eyesight yet. And you try and keep the athlete in vision wherever you can, because that, that keeps hope. If you overtake someone, they always try and you always try and get out of their sight because that almost causes the athlete to give up on catching. Yeah, because you kind of need that target, don't you? And then yeah. like, as long as I can see them, then I'll, I'll keep my pace up. But if you can't see them, then you're just, I suppose you're just like, well, is there any point, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, and mentally, if, if you're just sat on someone's shoulder, um, they talk about this elastic band effect. And so we'll see this with a few runners where they're just sat behind someone else. They're out of the wind, but they're not having to make decisions. They can just concentrate on their breathing and feeling like they've got a, a fluid running gait. Yeah, and I do just want to compare. I mean, I know we, we haven't seen Sophia Lackley close up for a while, but she looked so comfortable on all of this and she was actually still running all of it. She she wasn't putting her hands on her knees. And although we can say that is sometimes actually very sensible and it conserves energy, it doesn't look comfortable at this point in the race. And if you can run it like she was in comparison to those who are who are sat in second and third in this women's race, then then you kind of know that, that she's in a bit of a good headspace and that she's feeling quite strong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's a very good way to, to judge how people are feeling. The question will be whether she knows where she is, because when you go into the aid stations, it's also an opportunity for the person handing you your um, your nutrition to tell you what's happening on the course. A lot of these athletes, someone like Anthony Felber, as so we've got Ayana here, who's currently in second. She's back to run. She's looking great, actually. This is this is a great performance, but we've not seen her at this level for a few years. Tabor Hemming in third or fourth place. Um, but they'll have their own spies and if you're a french runner or if you're a runner who lives in chamonix having more people on the course is a huge benefit yeah because because, because people shout at you your position don't they however i mean you have to take it all with a pinch of salt don't you i mean yeah. you, you don't know they might be shouting a number of you they might not be right they, they might they might be misleading you but who knows you might your ears might be playing tricks on you anyway we know that yeah Daniela, who won Sagama, the, the first round of the Golden Trail series in 2023, just last month, she thought she was in fourth, didn't she? Yeah, and, and because of because it was so wet in Sagama, the runners were having, they put coats on during the race as the rain came in. And so the athletes who you recognize from behind suddenly look like the back of ET with these peaked rain jackets that you didn't know who which, who, which athlete was. So she was overtaking runners without realizing. Now, is this, that Sophia? The, I don't. Th it doesn't look like Sophia's running style, but they're running incredibly well. Whoever this is, um, so maybe this is Ayana, our second place runner. Um, we'll be able to tell as soon as they, they've cut. They've cut the angle, but uh, they cut the camera. But Anthony's family have actually come up um, from Annecy to cheer him on the course today, and so he'll be getting his race splits. It won't matter at this stage because he's in a big group. But Sophia. She's fairly new to trail running. There aren't a huge number of American athletes support network here, so she won't necessarily know her lead. So I do want to ask you, we we are, I think we're at almost the highest point, aren't we, um, of, of the race. Can you talk to us a bit about about the, the elevation and, and where we're at? So we, they are, they're For coming the up to about 2,200 metres. So they've done 1,000 metres of climbing. Um, that is higher than the tallest building in the world. If you imagine the, the Burj... Al-Kharif in, um, in, in Dubai. Yeah, um, and we have a South African runner we weren't expecting, doing incredibly well. Um, we believe Bianca's her first name, they've, they've put it as her surname, um, but we, we've seen some fantastic South African trail runners come on this series in the past. So um, she's sat in around fifth or sixth at the moment. In fact, we've just received an update as well. Yeah, and, and this is Sophia Lackley here, and she is looking so strong. So the men, the men have peak. come through the second checkpoint, the second timing mat. So they're at 55 minutes at Latour. And um, Oscar was leading at that stage by only seven seconds on Remy. So we've all, uh, so on, on Anthony Filber. So the update we've been given is significantly behind what we're seeing on the cameras because we 
I think we already saw Remy overtake Oscar, didn't we, some time ago. But to, to give you a recap on the positions, they've changed slightly um, and we're seeing significantly Sam Hendry is now up in fifth. He's another American runner. He came top three out in Flagstaff, did a great race on the Golden Trail last, last year. So our current top 10 in the men, um, about 15 minutes ago, in first place, Oscar. In second place, Anthony Felber, a big tight pack with Remy Bonnet, Bart Projeski, um, Sam Hendry up in there. And now we hadn't spotted him before. Eli Hemming, um, slightly back was Manuel Innerhofer. Then with him, Kane Riley from South Africa, another South African runner, having a great um, number of runners together now. Get great performance here. Elusine was now close, closing on an eighth. Um, and Peter Engdahl from Sweden rounding off our top 10. That this scenery here in the Alps is nothing short of breathtaking. And this is one of the things I absolutely adore as, as kind of like a, a mountain fan, a, a trail running fan, just an outdoor sports fan. This is Sylvia we've now got on screen. But when it pans to the right, you can see Mont Blanc, uh, you know, the highest mountain in the Alps, just just overlooking this incredible race course and, and Chabonix. And this is Sylvia catching up on Tabor. And just what footage we've got. And here ahead, the camera person, you can see see the photographer trying to catch up with Sophia Lackley. And she, I don't think she's missed a beat, really. She has kept running the whole way through. And she just looks so strong. She looks like she is out for a morning stroll. And I really do hope she can keep this up. It is so yeah. impressive so far. And, and just for those um, who are wondering how we do film all this, well, it's a mixture, isn't it, David? It's the first time the Golden Trail World Series is on TV. And we this this is all being live streamed. And then we've got a show which is going live shortly. And we've got a mix of drones. We've got a mix of GoPros. We've got a mix of, of run. I think this is a runner here, you know, holding a GoPro camera. You can just see the shadow on the left hand. And then we've also got mountain bikers. And these are all incredible athletes in their own right. I mean, you could only have incredible athletes doing this and following the the runners couldn't you yeah absolutely and, and so they're now reaching the this is the highest point of the race so significantly for ayana and for sophia both of them live at sea level or close to sea level um, sophia's been in norway for the for the winter ayana lives um in the bass region of spade um close to zagama as well and so they're now reaching and this is our, our male leader men. as we expected remy bonnet um, they're now coming up to the peak. Remy's still some, they're, they're half an hour behind, but it's 2,200 meters, which is when elevation and altitude starts to bite. And so it's not quite as overwhelming. 3,000 meters is where you can start to get really significant sickness. But the longer they are up above 1,500 meters, it will start to have an effect on their breathing. And the trouble is, if you're at altitudes and you, you gas yourself, you just can't get your breath back because you're having to work too hard just to get enough oxygen in at a normal level that if you're also running, you fall into deficit. And so it's so important that they, they pace these upper meters a little bit more conservatively. So this is our peak here. This is approximately three times the height of the Tour de Eiffel, uh, the Eiffel Tower. Um, in France, if you want to get a sense of how far they've climbed so far, but they'll be doing 2,600 meters total. So while they've climbed 1,000 meters to get here, they're not even halfway through the mm, climbing of the day. It's, there's a lot going on, there really is, but you can hear the support even on the this part of the mountain. And you know, she, she's going solidly, isn't she, the Spaniard here? And and I think, you know, she's looked like she's got more in the tank. She's taking her time slightly on this. She's not gassing it entirely. And and talking about about altitude and talking about Remy Bonnet, um, what, why, why is he such a good climber? What makes someone so good at the uphill? I mean, Rem, Remy started off as an incredibly good, good climber. He, um, but it seems to have been his focus. Um, and... This has been the challenge for him. I think he's been drawn into the allure of being the, the fastest climber on earth. And actually, he's learned for the Golden Trail, he's needed to really improve on his, um, his downhills and his, his flat speed as well. And so he's, he's increased his strength, but that hasn't stopped him improving in his climbing. Now, a couple, in the last couple of weeks, he's actually set the highest ever ITRA, a Trail Ranking Association score 
ever run by an individual. So um, they, they, there's a score for each different race where independent of who's running, your finishing time gives you a calculation out of a thousand points of how well an individual has run. And it, it's a really good way for us to be able to compare individuals from different races um, and to get a sense of how good runners are. Just look at that view. And I think it's Mont Blanc there on the right hand side. So majestic, this setting, looking over an incredible course that the Marathon de Mont Blanc has put on. It's actually the 20th year of this marathon. Uh, and it, this race in total, it's a bit longer than a marathon. I mean, you're, you're being a bit hard done by, to be honest. You're, you're having to run an extra couple of kilometers at 44.6 kilometers in total. And it's important to note that this is a, it is a slightly different course from last year. So when we're comparing course times, it's, it's not accurate because it will be a slower course time overall this year. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we can, we could give some splits in comparison to last year quite soon um, for Remy in particular, but we, we've seen Remy lead over the top of, um, of Algier de Posset before. Last year, he was in a great position like this and he had stomach issues and um, just completely fell away in the race. He's led this race three times in the past and he's never been on the podium. And so he's said to us before that even though he look he looks like he's running incredibly fast on the uphill, he's actually consciously trying to hold back a bit because partly the more intense you're running, the less blood flow there is to your stomach. And so the more likely it is that you're going to get stomach issues because um, your, your muscles need that blood. So he's taking a little bit off his pace, partly for his pacing to ensure that he can actually keep his strength and his stamina and his energy to the end of the race. But he, he's, he's very nervous about taking on a lot of fuel. And he's always struggled at longer races um, because he's never been able to master his nutrition. He doesn't sit well with gels. He's trying to take on as many calories and water as possible. So is this our second run? Is this Eli Helling coming through, potentially? I think it could be. We're just waiting for the stats to come through, but he's looking strong. Yeah, this is the second man. And, and the men, it's important to note, if you're just joining us, that they started 30 minutes after the women, which doesn't usually happen in the Golden Trail series, but, but it's a really good way of, of them both fields coming together and also us giving separate time to be able to talk fully about the women's field and the men's field. And also something really great about the Golden Trail World Series is that men and women are equal in this. They get equal points, and they get equal prize money, which is so important as the rise of women's sport continues to get bigger and bigger. And there should be gender parity across these sports. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've, the reason they've separated the starts is so that we can fully show the, the front of the, the women's race. They've timed it, hopefully, so that we can then show the men all coming in and have full finish line presentation with a tape for the women as well and see them all on on this show we we knew eli was going to be good at, at climbing he's he's got so much experience in um endurance sports coming from triathlon does he okay he's a gold cup winner and we saw at pikes peak he was just off the podium there um that he's he's very very good at climbing he, he won um broken arrow sky race in america which is in the golden trail national series a few weeks ago that's a half marathon so the um Within that lead group, it's no surprise that he's he's coming over the top in second. From the chasing pack, we'd expect Bart to be the person who, when they hit that peak, is going to be picking up places and time on the downhill. I'm excited about Bart today. I'm a fan of Bart. He had a, he had, a, he had an unlucky season uh, back in 2022, and I just feel like this year I want it to be his year. You know, I want him to yeah. come through. And, and for Bart, it's. He, he almost followed what is an unfortunate pattern with, with, with trail runners. A lot of these, a lot of, we're still seeing Remy here, um, looking very sharp. A lot of these runners aren't professional athletes. And so they're having to train. Bart was a fireman on mm. the side. And particularly someone like Bart, he doesn't live near any mountains. So if he's doing shift work as a fireman, it's very hard for him to get exposure to, to good trail when you're short on time. Yeah. He turned pro and often what we see when someone turns pro they suddenly have all this time on their hands and they overtrain. And so he was hoping to come into the, this is Meow Yow 
Still in second, it seems. No, I think she's definitely in third. And unless we, unless she overtook. I said, well, of course, we, we saw Ayana overtake her earlier. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if she's close to fourth now. The way, if we looked at the difference between how Tabor was, was running and how fluid she looked in comparison. But um, and, and one of the traps of for these athletes, when they turn pro, they suddenly have so much more time and they're drawn into overtraining and, and, and that leads to burnout, which happened to Bart. And, and when, you, when you say turned pro, I mean, what, what do we mean? Do we mean that they are signed by a team and that they're getting paid to do this and they give up their other job? Talk, talk us through that, that process. So all the athletes are paid. Um, top 10 receive money from the gold trail. They'll receive their expenses as well. Um, and we've just had an update. Anthony Felber's in third. Um, no surprises there. He's, he's a, a great all-round athlete. Um, but they'll, they'll have sponsorship contracts. Um, so not all of the athletes, though. And so um, the Hemmings had no sponsors at the end of last season. Um, so they'll get some money from their sponsors. They'll have performance um, rewards where if they achieve certain key targets at races, Oh, so, that, so that, and they'll get that from their sponsor. So say uh, Remy Bonnet, he yeah. is sponsored by Red Bull, right? Yeah. He's he's been professional for quite a long time, and now if he, for example, won the Golden Trail Series, he'll well he'll probably get a bit of a salary anyway from Red Bull, won't he? Almost. So then yeah. if he wins big events, he'll get a bit more of a payout. Yeah. So Remy's got Salomon. Remy's got um, Red Bull. And, and Red Bull's almost the one you want because they, they, they want you to look cool and wear their hat. And, um, and in some ways, performance isn't quite as important as Column Inches uh, for them because they're, they're a media company, really. Yeah. Um, so he'll get performance bonuses from Red Bull. He'll have the same from Salomon. He'll also have the prize money that he wins from things like the Golden Trail. And, but there's also races like the World Championships where... Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about this. Obviously, we are here. It is the Golden Trail World Series, and this is round two of it. And it's epic. It brings together, you know, some of the best, if not the best, trail running events in the world and, and making it accessible and interesting for those at home as well. And, and that none of them are over this distance either. There's a bit of a variety, in, uh, mostly in Europe, but then two in America. But what other races are these athletes doing? So the world, there'll be world championships, there'll be European championships, and those have very different emotional and significance um, for the runners. So some athletes like Elisine and Ninka Brinkman, there are no trail running associations in their countries, the Netherlands and Morocco. So they can't even take part in the world championships. For some athletes, going to the world championships is an opportunity to, to win sponsorship. And it's a lot easier to tell someone I'm the world champion than to say I'm the winner of the, the dollar miss run. Um, because if you're from outside the sport, you don't necessarily know. And, and we've just got, Ayana is, uh, we've just got some splits at the top, we believe. Um, Ayana's just passed the top, um, has reached the peak. We were watching Anthony Felber in third. And so um, for some athletes, they'll, the Golden Trail is, is that, that the highest exposure in terms of media television you can see being live on on these channels but having a world championship tag to your name yeah. can, can bring in new sponsors I mean, being being world champion of anything sounds pretty great doesn't it and, and this looks like this is bart here here he's, he is it's the man from poland the ex-fireman in his looking snazzy as you say he's in his visor he's in his red vest and so he's just off the back of anthony um and he'll be he'll be very comfortable in that position. Miao is now in third crossing the peak. We think about three and a half minutes down. Um, but we're hoping the camera runners will be able to run the downhill or the cyclists with these runners. It's incredibly challenging because it is quite technical for a part and they're so fast on the down that we might not necessarily be able to bring you exactly what that looks like if it, if we do it's gonna be, it's gonna be from behind because um, that's the easier place to film from however it's worth saying that this is some of the most exceptional camera footage of a trail running event race out there isn't it i mean look at all these different camera shots we i don't actually know i'd love to know how many camera people we have got on the ground today because it's up there isn't it i have not seen footage like this ever of a trail running event it is absolutely exceptional we've got drones we've got trail runners we've got gopros we've got mountain bikers covering all of this 44.6 kilometers of terrain and it's just amazing and a lot of these camera runners will be um they could be racing these races and coming in kind of top top 30 position. We, we, we've seen that before when they've 
They've filmed for us one year, they've switched I the next know, year. I, I, I mean, oh, uh, look at this. And there's, so actually the chasing pack is close together. We've got Ellicene in there. Um, who else did we and, see? And I think that's see Sam, now. Sam Hendry at the back from America. Um, it's his first trail, golden trail of the season. Um, he he trained, he grew up with Sophia. They went to university together. They're both on the American um, ski yeah. ski team together. Yeah, we um, met yesterday. He's a very nice guy, isn't he? Oh, he's a lo really yeah. lovely guy. They, they both are in, in Salt Lake City in Utah is where they train at significantly 2,000 metres mm. of altitude. So Sam will be eating up this height. You know what's really interesting, David? You've been involved in trail running for, for, a, lo for a long time. I, I'm, I'm relatively new to all this, and I have to say the community surrounding it, the, not just the, the, the runners, but, but the team, uh, the volunteers. I mean, always a big shout out to the volunteers. I think we've got over 200 volunteers here today, but everyone's so friendly. Everyone, mm. everyone loves being here. Everyone loves the outdoors. Everyone loves running. And you know what I love about some of these shots? We've, we've just gone to, to a, a runner shot here, but, but that, that more panoramic view, you can see the sun beating down, but you can also see the snow-capped mountains in the mm. distance. I mean, what a place to be. Mont Blanc is, is just looking over this course. So, but the running community, the trail running community, I've, I've rarely been involved in an event with such beautiful people um, who are so welcoming. Uh, and it's just a, it's a great place to be. The, the Golden Trail World Series has really made a great atmosphere. Uh, and I, I can't wait to see it unfold and grow even more. So this looks like Remy. Is, there, is this Remy? Yes, that's his running style. He's coming up to, we can see there, Aguilera de Poisset, which is the, the, the highest point in our race. Um, and I mean, he's looking fluid there. He's just just striding out straight away. It would be but what we want to do at the peak is to clock his time and to see how much that changes from the top to the bottom. Because there will be some runners. We'd expect El Hussein, John Album. Ma we haven't seen Manu Marias yet at all in this race. Yeah, he is someone who we will see start to come into contention towards the end. Um, when he was running Zagama two years ago, he was down in 19th place at about a third of the way in. And he came through the whole field to take third place overall. Wow. I mean, it, it really is. It's, it's quite funny because because Remy Bonnet, who is who is out, he looks really strong. He's a good climber. We expect he's been there, but he's almost he needs to get a certain amount of a lead because they will catch him. So it's kind of like how much of a lead can Remy Bonnet get to maintain that first place position? And then Anthony Felber, I mean, he's having a great race, isn't he? He looks quite strong. He looks quite happy. Uh, we, we said earlier, he actually lives here now. He lives in Chamonix. He knows this route. And significantly between, there's two big climbs, one small climb, and two big descents and one small descent. This first descent is the more technical descent. So this is where we're going to see more of an advantage to our, our downhill runners. And so Remy knows that they, they're likely to, to put some time into him, him here. The descent to the finish actually is more runnable. It looks steeper if you look at it on a map, but actually it's lots of cutbacks and the trail isn't quite as rocky. And so over that terrain, I'd expect Remy to be running equally as fast as the other runners just because of his raw pace at that stage. And at that stage, it comes down to more how tired are your legs because it starts to be painful to hammer into your quads with speed. And so it's going to be more to do with their endurance, with their pacing, their nutrition, and whether they have actually done enough training on downhill in mm. the pre-season. And, and that's where having some races under your belt actually helps strengthen your legs. And if, a lot of these athletes, Remy is schema world champion. He demolished the schema field this year. He was schema world champion two years ago as well. But differently, he's decided this year to keep up his trail running in the winter so he could actually come out with strong legs to be able to punish himself on these downhills. You know what I love about the Golden Trail series? We see it here. We see the men and women, uh, um, 
with each other. You see Remy just overtaking several of the women there. The women did set off 30 minutes earlier. And actually, David, in, in answer to your, your, your point earlier, Manu, who, who won the first Golden Trail well, um, race of the season in Sagama in Spain last month, he was actually at, sitting in 14th at Point Latour. Now, that was, that was quite a few minutes ago. Uh, but, you know, he is sat back quite far. And the other thing I just want to highlight about the mm. Golden Trail World Series is that Sagama was so wet mm. and they're so different, these courses, aren't mm. they? So you're not... You, you're not going to have the same winner for, for every race. Yeah, absolutely not. And and actually, 14th for Manu Maria is pretty good because we've, we've already seen how tight the men's group is, where there was a huge pack of seven of them together. So we sat back in 14th. We'll check those split times quite soon. But that's actually quite a good position to him to be in. If you're wondering how high they've climbed, this, the climb they've done so far is the height of a hundred ostriches. Can you imagine a hundred ostriches stacked top, top to tail, end to end. Ostriches. They've already cleaned off a hundred of those over three Eiffel Towers. Um, they're now he hitting the highest point in the, in the race, over 2,000 meters, so altitude, you'll, you'll hear their breathing. This will start to feel heavy on your lungs. And when you're at altitude, it just feels as if someone's slightly sat on your chest and every breath gives you slightly less oxygen and is slightly shorter. And so if you don't adjust your pace, you fall into a deficit and it's very hard to pull out of that. We're now starting to see Remy go down the hills. You can see him there, his, his arms have gone from position to his side, slightly wider for balance. And this is Manu Maria, yeah. that's the first time we've seen him. And he's, he's sitting in eighth at the moment, I think, actually. So he's made up some time from when we were at Latour. And and he's, uh, he's with Daniel Sands. He's in, uh, Daniel Sands came third in Pikes Peak. He's an incredible climber. So for Manu to be up with him at this stage, Manu has gone out hard for himself. And that Manu is sensible enough that if he's going out hard, he knows he is in a good shape to do that. So it would not surprise me if by the end of this downhill, Manu is in the top five positions. But look at Remy go. I mean, he is not looking slow. People, people have said for years he's not quite as good in the down. That is no longer the case when it's dry. And these are quite runnable conditions. You'll see it's, he'll be picking smooth paths. He'll be jumping from time to time. And, and we've gone to the drone shot because it's, it's too hard to try and film and pick a line while you're trying to get a good shot of Remy behind as well. It's dangerous, isn't it? But look, Remy looks like he's having an absolute blast going down that. He is having fun. He's enjoying we, that. We can gauge the... There's, there's one of the female athletes who's um, kind of mid-pack, and you can see just how quickly he's closing on her. But try and gauge where she's running, because he won't necessarily run the exact same route. And this is part of the skill. Someone like Anthony Felbert would have run this track again. And see, Remy overtook on the yeah. left. And look, and look, you know what's really interesting about this track is that it maybe looks quite simple from here, but you've got a mix of grass, of trail and snow up there, haven't you? And rocks. So it really is quite complex. And Anthony Felber, and he is sitting in third, I think about three and a half minutes behind the leader. I mean, that's a big lead, three and a half minutes. And we'll, we'll clock what that is at the bottom. But one of the reasons why Anthony has moved here and one of the reasons why Manu destroyed the field at Zagama is when you know a route like this, you actually know where the rocks are. You know which route to carve through. And part of the challenge of moving at pace through these terrains is you're having to make decisions. And if you don't know what the turn is, and if you don't know what rocks are gonna come, you cannot go at the pace you want to be running because you could be suddenly hit by a massive surprise and you have to change directions. The fact that, um, the fact that he's come out in advance and since November he has been running those trails means he will in his head already have a, a subconscious map of the route he is going to be running down these trails. And while, um, while we wouldn't say that he's one of our, our top descenders, actually, because of his local knowledge, He's Anthony no, 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 Felber is going to be able to run um, at full gas down the whole of this terrain. And we're going to see him being significantly better on these downhills than in any other race this season. But we're tucked in behind Manny Marias. He's, he's not even in the top five yet, but the cameras have clearly chosen to pick him out as someone we need to be paying attention to. And rightly so. We'll start to, to look at Anthony here. He knows this trail and he is just scything through it. 
this here isn't that technical. But as you see, those little bits there, these are fairly rocky and it's very easy to turn an ankle. We've just got an update from, uh, from our spies on the course and we're starting to see, is this running here? Um, this is Eli Hemming at the front. No, maybe not. Um, we're just trying to figure out who this is. This, this potentially could be Manu. Nice little overtake there. Um, yeah, that was Manu Marias overtaking Danny Sands. Um, and you can see the difference already. He's, he's building a gap there. We've now received a bit of information from our spies on the course. Um, we're just going to find out what updates they're giving us on the split times. Because Remy knows he's... Uh, Bart is in fourth, two minutes 30 down, um, coming up towards the peak. So at the moment, we've got Remy leading out. Eli Hemming is two minutes 50 seconds behind in second place. One minute 30 behind in third is Anthony Felber. We've then just seen Bart is in fourth in 2.30. And then there's a group of four of them in 2.45 um, behind. Manu and Danny were running together, though. And Manu has started to make a move. Even in those 10 seconds, we saw he put two, three meters on Danny. But we're coming back to our race leader. This is Sophia Lockley. She's looking incredibly smooth at the moment. The split time, the split times seem very, very significant. Um, and these will be accurate. She's come through one hour 50, um, the one hour 50 mark approximately. She's, she's leading by eight, seven, eight minutes. She came through um, the Col de Passet, eight, um, one hour, 47 minutes, 38. In second is Ayana Cortazar in one hour, 55. That is a massive lead, um, far more than we were expecting. I hope that that doesn't mean that she's gone out too quick. In third place, we have Miao Yao holding on. Um, in 156, so a minute down on Ayana now. A minute behind her, we have Tabor Hemming closing in and Sylvia Nordskar in fifth. Sixth place was Daniela Omus. She's in 158, but we will see her catch up these places on the downhill. Oh, Therese God, LeBeuf God. just behind her in seventh, 159.56. Anastina uh, Ikila, she's done incredibly well. She's from Scandinavia. She's now in the top eight. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if she ends up close to top five. 159.57. Mathilde in ninth, two hours 26. And Caitlin Fielder has dropped back to two hours 40. I think the steepness of that climb, she'd have paced herself and just taken the edge off. She'll be picking up places on this downhill. But um, significantly, Sophia has a seven minute lead at the front of this race. Um, she... We could see that in the way she was going up the trails. The other runners were putting their, their hands on their knees. They were having to choose between running and hiking, different sections. Sophia blasted, ran because of her strength all the way up. And in some ways, that makes it easier for her because she's not having to change gear. She's not having to make those decisions. But one of the challenges is, if you're running the whole way up, you're using exactly the same muscles the whole route. So she hasn't changed the muscle she's using at any point in the race. Whereas our runners who've actually stopped and power hiked, they're engaging their glutes in a slightly different way. And when it comes to a race, it's as long as this. It means when they get closer to the end of the race, they've actually spread the workload across different muscle groups. And so they, they do, it does mean that the glycogen stores are used in a slightly different way, but also they're not tiring out their muscles to the full extent that Sophia is. Um, but she's now coming down. She's coming actually to... Um, she's at the 24.3 kilometer. Yeah, yeah. And another aid station on, on this route. We have got three aid stations. And let's see if she's going to pick up anything here. I tell you what, she just looks so comfortable. I know she had a bit of an injury at, at, in the final last year in 2022 she her leg was hurting a bit she was limping towards the end of some of those races but she looks so strong now we're and um we're she... going to try and find out what her time is coming through velocine because the, the first start of the race has been almost exactly the same as um as, as as last year and so we'll get a sense of just quite how fast she's moving because it wouldn't surprise me if if she is blowing away the time of last year um which i'm just going to try and see if we've got those details for us um 
And, and you know what? So Sophia kind of came in as a little bit of a favourite. There was a press conference yesterday with with three of the the kind of the most suspecting top women, and we had Sophia there. We had Caitlin Fielder from New Zealand, and we had Daniela from Germany, who who won in Zagama uh, just a few weeks ago. And um, you know what? Hearing from Sophia was so interesting. Not only has she never really run this far before. And here you can see the cameraman who's on a bike. You can't quite make it through he's that not style. For that. He's not practiced no. that one, has he? So we've, we've... We were hoping for a sliding <laughs> Matrix style oh, underneath. Oh, like James Bond style, yeah. Well, now he's catching up, but we can see a lovely drone shot here and look at that in the distance. And and Sophia will probably be a bit grateful for just a bit of flat, just a bit of calm before, you know, a bit more undulating. But she's looking so... She's over the halfway mark now. But yeah, yesterday, Sophia was saying, you know, she hasn't really run during the winter. She is a dual athlete. She skis uh, for uh, in, in for the Olympic for the USA Olympic team as well, and she's extremely strong in that discipline. And and she just says that you know she maybe only only runs once a week during the winter. I mean. That is just sensational, how, how she can keep this muscle memory there and she can still perform like this. She does run a bit more in the spring, but still her, her load isn't that much. She maybe only runs three times a week during the spring. Yeah, and, and, and that's the challenge. She's, she's only really started running since April and her experience previously has been in America. And American trails tend to be a lot smoother, less rocks, a lot wider. Um, and so... Coming out to a race like this, it's it's a completely different way of running. And she said at the press conference she's finally had an opportunity to spend some time in Norway. So she's actually beginning to learn what it's like to run on tighter trail where you're av you're having to choose your route. Now, we I've looked at the the times through the record times through Velocine um, that we have on our list here. I'm questioning the ones in front of us because it said the women came through the record time for Velocine is 2:12. That surely can't be right given that. We've come through our second aid station in um, 140. <laughs> so there's something wrong in our data here. Um, but Velocine, there's only three points at which they can. And, and here we go. We've oh, got our, look at that. Seven, mi seven minute and a half lead that Sophia Lackley, Team Salomon, has on Cortazar from Spain. That is just huge. And Meow Yao, actually, she's less than a minute behind the Spaniard, which I'm actually really impressed with because she did look like she was fa like flailing, didn't she? Yeah, and, and it, it could be that she's just not used to doing these trails. And she's she, she we don't know enough about the, the, the routes where she lives in China. You know, someone who we haven't spoken about much is, is who's sitting in eight there, um, Anna Stina from Finland. Yeah, so An Anna Stina, um, she was top three in the, the, the National Series qualifiers last season. Um, and... She's someone who, she's a great all-rounder. She, she's very good technically. Um, she, she's, gift, she's good in the, the wet, but also on trails like this, she'll start eating up some distance on the downs. She's one of the downhill hill runners. She, she's also quite experienced as well. So we'd expect her to be pacing sensibly. Um, and we, I think this top 10 at the moment, probably eight of these will stay the same. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, you've got Caitlin there in 10th. We do it, we, we, you know, we expect a top five from her, don't we? Do you think being 13 minutes behind that at the 20K mark, which is, you know, just under halfway that was taken from, do you think she's still going to make that top five? Do you think she's in a good position? I mean, a lot of people were talking about her being race favourite before, um, potentially her and Sophia. Last year, she wasn't in the lead group at the top, but by the, the bottom when she was at uh, Valacine, she was with... Um, Sara Alonso. So she was clearly pacing it perfectly to, for her second place. To be intent at this stage is pretty far back. Um, we know she's a good downhill runner, um, but the women are fairly tightly packed. So I think we're going to know by the time we beat Valacina if she's pacing that well. Just in comparison there, you saw there was only one minute and 45 between uh, number one and two men compared to over seven minutes between yeah. the women. I mean, that is, I mean, I don't know if that's, <laughs> if that's saying the men are just being more competitive and, and, and you know, they're, they're more sticking together or if Sophia Lackley is just having the absolute race of her life or has she, has she you know, has she misjudged this? Has she gone out too hard? And, and, and that's the big question because a lot of the men, it's their second race of the season, and 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 the same with the women. But we're seeing with uh, Therese LeBeouf, with Daniela Omus, with Caitlin Fielder, they've been at the World Championships two weeks ago. So th this is the third 
marathon distance race of the season. So it's they're going to be tired. Um, Sophia's coming in fresh. She's been her her lungs will be in tip top shape from um, the ski season. And so the fact that it's all been uphill so far, and this is her first race, she's been fresh and she's blasted out. Um, so I, that. That's what's going to be so exciting about the second half of the race, because the second climb really marks Mont Blanc out versus a lot of the other trail races in our series, where you tend to have one big up, one big down. But the fact that there's two of them, where you, you've had the pounding in your legs of that descent, and it's really hot when you do that second climb and you suddenly see the paces really change. Oh, look, look at, that, Mont Blanc. at that. that. Another Mont Blanc in the distance. Oh, they, these views, I mean, that looks like a screensaver, doesn't it, David? I'd have that as my screensaver anyway. Yeah, absolutely. If you're watching at home, do a, do a print screen for that and uh, <laughs> put it up. And, and if you are watching at home, do make sure you are you are following the Golden Trail series across social media as well, at the Golden Trail series and, and using the hashtag to find all the latest posts and everything that's going on. Now, this is the lovely part of coming downhill. This isn't particularly technical here, but it's all covered and so... You're out of the sun and you don't realize that you're starting to heat up. But if you look around, there's so much greenery and that all holds moisture. And two nights ago, we had incredible thunderstorms and torrential rain. And that moisture will be in that air. And so the, the temp they'll, they'll feel nice as they come down, but they'll, the, suddenly their sweat will not be leaving their skin and their temperature will be increasing, increasing, increasing. So when they, they go through Velocine and they suddenly hit that massive climb, they start again and the heat hits them. It is horrible because you realize you're only halfway through the race and suddenly you've overcooked. And so if they haven't been drinking enough at this stage, they'll go through their second aid station here. If they haven't taken enough, enough water, they've only got one more aid station to stop, to stop at. And it wouldn't surprise me if we see some athletes not flow through the third aid station, but stop and be pouring water over themselves be grabbing any bottle they can see because they've got it wrong. And that is a sign they're in trouble. Yeah, um, it's important to note that we are in the heart of Chamonix. We're sitting in our commentary box now and, and it's hot outside. It's local time is 9.15. And when you're in that sun, I tell you what, you can really feel the heat. And, and David, I want to ask you, what do these athletes eat, you know, ahead of this race? They, the women had to be down there around... 6.30 this morning, didn't they? Uh, with them setting off at 7. So when would they have eaten? Would they have done a warm-up run? Talk me through it. I mean, and, and it's everyone's slightly different. And this is the, as an athlete, this is the frustrating thing of such early races. They're starting at 6.30. And so they, they'll they take on up to around 160 um, grams of, of, of carbs okay. in the morning to top up their What, what does that look like to, to, a, to a person who doesn't know about, you know, the grams of carbs? Are we talking a piece of toast? What are we talking? We're talking like two, two good bagels, probably smothered in honey with bananas. But because you really want the, when, when you take on carbohydrates, your, um, your insulin levels spike, it then changes your blood sugar levels and your blood sugar levels actually dip. And so you want to be starting this race without a huge amount of insulin in your blood. So typically what they'll do is they'll eat two to two and a, two and a half hours before they race. So you think it's, you're racing at 6.30, so your alarm goes off at 6. I used to go to bed with a bag of bagels next to my bed. I'd wake up, I'd eat two dry cinnamon bagels. And what, what time are we talking? Mid Four in the morning. Okay, you, you'd you have, set an alarm? Yeah, you'd set an alarm and then you'd, you'd try and go back to sleep if you can, pretty hard when you've just had a whole amount of, of carbohydrates. But then it allows that to, to go through your blood system, to go through your, your, your bloodstream, to replenish the glycogen stores you've used up in the night to make sure you're fully topped up. And typically they'll then come to the start of the race. And depending on their strategy, a lot of them now will have um, blood markers that they use to see what their blood sugar levels are like. Some people might start to sip just before the race. Um, some people will take a gel just as they start. Some people will start, um, will wait for the 10, 15 minutes before taking on nutrition. But um, when, you, when you're running at a fast pace as they start off here, it's easy to forget about your nutrition. Um, mm. And so often it's not until they reach the steeper climbs where they're starting to hike and they suddenly then think, oh yeah, I, or that you come into your aid station and you'll see people suddenly glugging 
all of their liquid because they've calculated how much they need to be drinking and consuming for the whole race. And so they, they know they can't go in with an empty water bottle. They need to go in with an empty water bottle. So you suddenly see them glugging as they panic and realize they've not actually, they're not on their nutrition strategy. Someone like Caitlin Fielder, though, she'll know mile by mile, minute by minute, exactly what she's taking. And some of them will even have alarms on their watches, which when the alarm goes off, it means you're taking another block. You're, um, you're taking another sip. And they'll have their, um, their electrolytes in there because sweat becomes a factor in these longer hosser runs. We're now seeing first man and first woman. Very contrasting styles, partly because Remy's running on a slightly um, steeper downhill, steeper descent. But yeah, I mean, they're both looking so smooth right now. Um, we'd expect that at this stage of, of the race. Remy's been down some yes, of the sharper super. incline. So they're not going to be catching him much from this point on. Just into Valacine, there's a very technical bit um, with quite steep, steep uh, switchbacks. I don't expect we'll be able to see the, the cameras, uh, camera runners get through that. But um, that's a point at which they'll be catching Remy. Having, having filmed Remy over these, these types of terrain previously in the finals, they won't be catching him there. Okay. Absolutely so, not. So have you yourself, David, have you been out there filming some of these runners before? Yeah, for, so for the finals, um, because we weren't doing the live in the same way, we'd be presenting at the beginning. We'd then go onto the course and we'd, most of the people involved in the series have run themselves. So we'd then be filled with them. And it's incredibly hard as a camera runner. If you imagine someone running at, at Remy's pace and he wasn't really giving it full gas there um, compared to some of the steeper t downhills. But on the switchbacks, you've got to try and jump in at his pace without cramping his style. And I hate to interrupt you, David, but we've got some news. We've got Daniela Umos from Germany who won in Zagama. She is now sitting in fourth. She's been very quiet so far this race. And so it's great to see her back up there. I mean, that... That is a big jump already, isn't it? She was back in eighth just a few minutes ago when we spoke about her. They've just come through uh, the Boys Flag Nolette um, and she's now two minutes down on Miao Yao. No, I think that's, uh, is that two minutes? Oh yeah, 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 two minutes down. She won't be by the time they yeah. get to the bottom of that hill, believe me. Um, she is making moves there and um, she wasn't even in the top 10 at one point, which shows how well she's pacing this because she's she's probably going to be in the top three by the halfway stage. And her against Diana, I'd expect her to to start to take time off Diana as well. So if Sophia hasn't got this right, she's got a massive lead, which suggests maybe she has gone out too hard. Yeah. The, tr the trouble is when you bonk, you don't start to slow down a bit. What, you talk, drop like a stone. What, what do you mean by bonk? So bonking is when you've, you've used up all your glycogen stores. So your body holds um, carbohydrates in the form of glycogen in your muscles. You typically have around 75 minutes um, of, of glycogen stores in your, in, your, in your muscles that can be used while you're racing. This is why they're topping up with gels and drinks. This is Elucine coming through... Um, I'll see now. We'll be able to check his times quite soon. The record time coming through at this stage was 1.52. I, I mark this as 1.51, according to my clock. Yeah. He's ahead of the record. Yeah, Remy Bonnet there, everyone behind him. The Swissman really showing his strength, and he's looking very comfortable as well. I also want to pick your brains a bit mm. on, on what they're wearing. You know, trail runners are synonymous with wearing bright colors. Remy, Remy today has, has chosen, he's got, he's got a white cap on, he's got a red vest, and he's got shorts and, of course, trail shoes. Now, some people, um, they, they, you know, most trail runners do run in shorts, for example, but some have a visor, some don't have a cap, some just have sunglasses. Is it just personal preference? Yeah, a lot of it's personal preference. A lot of it is, is partly what you're used to in terms of the weather. So Remy will have the cap partly for sponsors. Um, and this is Meow Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at this. Eliana. So... So meow, meow, meow is catching up again. This is, we weren't expecting this. So um, she, she looked like she was falling away, but clearly was just, has an unusual running style um, when it comes to heavy climbing. And uh, 
she's back in her stride again. So the race is back on. This is great to see. This is so great. She just, she was so strong to begin with. Then she started to falter a bit on that climb. But we have just had some really disappointing news from the men's race. Unfortunately, John yeah, Album from the UK is, is down in 50th position. And, and it looks like he might drop out. It seems like he's definitely, you know, he did, he did, he did race just a couple of days ago and he was racing in the worlds as well. And, oh, it's, it's yeah. such a shame to see that from John Albin. We had kind of such high expectations of him for this race. He knew it was going to be hard today. He, at the world championships before, we've talked about massages already. He had a massage um, as a, a pre-race massage. Unfortunately, something happened in his lymph, glo uh, his, his, his lymph glands were then blocked. He, had massive spots all down his legs. He had to take antibiotics. He's not been able to train properly since. Um, to get a qualifying stone for the, uh, the OCC CCC, he's, he's run a, a, a 26 kilometer race um, on Thursday, just so he can qualify. So uh, he came into this knowing he wasn't in race condition and, and clearly he's, yeah. he's it's, it's been too much from today. Now uh, we're here with Sophia Lockley, first leader, but significantly when Remy came through Valacine, he was under course record, which really surprised me because that time was set last year where you had Petro Mamu, who is a sub 210 marathon runner. You had Robert Pekemboy, you had Al Hussein, and you, you had John Album all together. Remy wasn't even in that group last year. So Remy is significantly faster than he was last year at this stage, even though he said he was going to take it easier in the first half because he's nervous about his nutrition. So it just shows you the form he's in at the moment, the confidence he's got. He finished last season almost untouchable. His preseason in Schemo, he was winning short races by 20 to 30 seconds. He's just set the best trail running point score of all time within the last two weeks. So the fact that he's broken the record here in a conservative pace for him, it seems, for how he's feeling, this is bad news for everyone else. But we do have some more times back in and the pole, Bart is in second and then just behind him, basically with him, is Eli Hemming. And behind that, we've got Maximilian Drion. Now, can you tell me a bit about him? Where's I he could, come from? I could not say. He wasn't even in our top 10. So what I can tell you about him is this guy must be good at running downhills. <laughs> on, on your screens right now, it's, it's just worth saying that that is, that is second and third place. That is, that is Bart and that is Eli, respectively. And now we're back with the women. But yeah, tell me a bit more about Maximilian Drion, who's sitting um, in fourth. I believe, it, is he Belgium? He is. And, and we've not seen him um, challenge for top 10 in Golden Shell before. But the fact that he's come from outside the top 10 rankings and... Um, he, he's overtaken Manu Marias, it seems, that unless the trackers have been wrong previously, this guy must be an incredible descender because Manu we were expecting to be um, using his skills. Some, him and Bart are, are the two we'd look out for. He's overtaken Manu. So does this, does this mean that Maximilian is, is the best downhill runner in the race at the moment? It could be. We're going we're gonna to wait for double confirmation on what's happening just because sometimes the trackers do give us some, uh, yeah. some ghosts in the system. But um, wow, this this is why we love Golden Chuck, because people just turn up who we, we, we're not looking out for, and okay. suddenly, you're on the global stage. Absolutely. Now, now this, this race of the Golden Trails, it's number two in in the season. And uh, I want to ask you about socks, David. <laughs> right, this, this, is an, oh, this is more than a marathon, right? This is 44.6 kilometers. Now, ballistas can be a right nuisance, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. What, what socks do you wear? And you, have, you, have you obviously, you'd think you'd test them out and obviously your shoes before all this, but I see some people wearing trainer socks, some people wearing very thin, slightly longer socks, and some wearing some thick socks. Give me some insight. And, and true, blisters can be a factor, but probably not for these athletes because the number of, and maybe for Sophia, to be fair, because she's changing from skiing to running. And so a lot of the time you get calluses building up, you get thicker skin. And a lot of these people will moisturize their feet to make sure that you don't get that dry skin that can break apart. But because they run so many miles, their feet just take on a new look to them and so almost um, like a second skin like it's, it's like thicker around it yeah yeah absolutely and so you wouldn't expect to see any of these runners having issues with blisters unless they're suddenly new to it people like john coming out of schemo sophia coming out of her ski season would potentially have challenges but 
a race like today does offer challenges because it is humid in these areas. It's longer than they're used to. And also the heat and the humidity does mean the sweat builds up in your shoe. And we see Remy Bonnet here, just, just you know, looking very comfortable in this lovely grass, not too technical downhill section. Now he's holding a water bottle. Would it be water in there? Or do you think it would be electrolytes? What do you think? A lot of runners will have water and they use gels. Remy will be using electrolytes because he's, his stomach has struggled with being able to take on the thicker oh, yeah, gels yeah. Um, because his, his blood is all in his muscles. And so he's at the moment trying to figure out a way in which he can use drinking to actually um, take on his fuel because as we know our glycogen stores are only enough for your 90 minutes or so and he said previously when he's raced he won the gamma when he was young and he said he was racing on fumes Sophia in fact after the, the story of both of these runners is whether either of them can get to the finish without bonking without having to slow their pace um, and we're going to be giving you a full recap of the, of the Golden Trail shortly. Just for anyone who's joined us at this stage, we, we've crossed the halfway stage. And um, we do know a little bit more about um, Maximilian Drion. He was at the World Champs, he DNF'd, but he's had some, he's had some good performances in the past. And he's, he's got a, a very good Wikipedia page, thankfully. Um, <laughs> well, we can always rely on wi Wikipedia. So we might take this for a little pinch of salt, but we've got some actual stats coming in. And on your screen right now, we are the 24.8 kilometre mark. Sophia Lackley of Team Salomon from the USA out in front. And she's maintained that lead. It's still a seven and a half minute lead. Wow. Um, between her and the Spaniard. And then just behind that, Miao Yao, who's actually putting in such a good performance um, yeah. in third. And then Daniela Emus from Germany, who was that winner. She, she's a good another two or so minutes behind. She won the Gamma, uh, which was the first one. But you join us... You join us now at the Golden Trail World Series. Uh, if you've only just, we're, we're halfway through the race at this stage. We're here in Chamonix, Mont Blanc, live on television for the first time with Golden Trail. My name's David Hellard, and we're going to take you through what's happened in the race so far before we see the second half of this race. And boy, is there a battle. And I am Jess Rogers, and we are absolutely stoked to be here, bringing you all the action of the Golden Trail World Series. This is race two in the season. As you can see there, back in May was round one at Zagama in Spain. This is the Marathon de Mont Blanc, and it's a 44.6 kilometer marathon. So it's even a bit longer than a marathon, and it's the 20th anniversary of this epic race. We are here in Chamonix. It is hot and it is great. Now, next on the list of the Golden Trail World Series is the Dolomites Run in Italy. Then it's Sierra Zanau. And then we've got Pikes Peak in America. We've then got another race in America before the final goes to Italy. And the Golden Trail Series, it's unique. It's incredible. It brings together the best races from around the world and the best athletes. And we can't wait to tell you what has been going on in this race so far. We're at the two hour mark and let's take a look about what's been happening. It's been great, hasn't it, David? Yeah, it's been fantastic. And the idea behind Golden Trail is it brings the best trail races in the world from half marathon to marathon distance. And it finds out across different terrains who the best is, but we're gonna show you the highlights of what's happened so far today. So the women set off first and they set off at 7 a.m. local time here in Chamonix, France. And, and you can see it was a nice fast start. Already by... there in red, Miao Yao from China. She's got a 2.30 marathon time. She took out hard and within meters was already breaking up the field. Uh, there was a close bunch behind her. And this is where Sophia Lockley, though, the Olympic skier, took control. Yeah, she, she actually took control pretty early on after a very fast start for, from the Chinese lady. And she looks so comfortable all the way. Sophia Lockley literally hasn't missed a beat. She's been running the whole time. And the first seven kilometers were very fast. They only do about 200 meters of climbing. But going up to uh, Col de Passet, there's a thousand meters of climbing. And Sophia um, is known for her climbing skills. She took off. Miao Yao, though, who had been leading, 
started to struggle. Yeah, you can see it here on this uphill bet. We thought she was fading. She had her hands on her legs. She was reaching for her stomach a bit. And the so this Spaniards... is Yana Cortazar from Spain who um, overtook her here. And, and we worried like in Zagamba last season, uh, last race, Yao Yao completely fell off. But this hasn't been happening here. We've got Tabor Hemming coming in fourth um, from America. Sophia reaching the peak. And behind her, we've got some very strong runners like Daniela Omus, who won the Gamma, um, the first trail race of the season, who's starting to pick up places. They did a thousand meters of climbing, and this is coming through the halfway stage in Valocene. Sophia had a seven minute lead over the chasing pack. Yeah, and the last we heard, she was still at about seven and a half minutes ahead. And look at this lovely leafy downhill after that really big climb. It's a quite a nice relief. It's a bit cooler down in that area. And second and third women are still together at this point, about seven and a half minutes behind the American leader. The big news was Adela, Adela Omus, who wasn't even the top 10 for the first 20% of this race. On that downhill, she's a very good technical runner, started to eat up the turf and she's now in the top four, looking in prime position to be able to attack. And now we are live with our race leader. It is Sophia Lackley from Team Salomon of the USAA. Um, USA, and we're at two and a half hours in. And we, we expect this race to take, I mean, what are we expecting, David? About three, three hours, 30, three hours, 40, or? So the, the men will come in three hours, uh, three hours, 40, approximately. Um, this race is slightly longer than previous years. So actually the course records always change, but we'd expect Sophia to be um, past the four hour mark, probably around 4.10, 4.15 time. Now, if you've, just, if you've just tuned in, the big question mark though about Sophia is she's come off the back of a ski season and this is only her second year in trail running. It's the longest she's ever run today. And she's not experienced at taking on nutrition for these longer races. And so, She's only bonked in a race once before, which is a Strander, her first race to Golden Trail she was leading. And, and just to pick up on that, David, for, for those who might be new to trail running, when you say uh, she bonked, what does that mean? That means she, you know, she, she wasn't in a good place, was she? So we only have so much glycogen source. And this is Eli Hemming, who's in second place in, in the men's race. Um, and we're going to do a review of the men's house, uh, the men's race now, to show you how their start went. They started half an hour later after the women's and they've now reached the point of overtaking them. But here we go, this was the start for the men's and the question really was who was gonna take this out because they were all quite nervous of the distance. And you can see how many thousands of people are taking part in this incredible marathon de Mont Blanc. It was such a sensational start. Two and a half thousand runners and um, there was Oscar Klaassen's, um, this, in fact, this was an American runner who took to the front, but Oscar Klaassen's from Sweden then took the lead surprised runners who are very good at 5k distances and it took a while before Remy Bonnet, one of the pre-race favourites, the best climber in the world, um, started to make moves. So this is... Um, this is a Frenchman we see here um, who is doing quite well and basically what the, the big thing is is that in the men's race it was all quite close wasn't it for the first 10-15 kilometres the, the lead pack really did stay tightly together. And what, we're, what we've been expecting is as soon as they hit the steep climbs that Remy would take off. And Eli Hebbing is here in the, another very good climb, climber. But behind them, Manny Marias, um, who won the Gamma, he's known as a very good downhiller. Mark Projewski from Poland, um, also a very good downhiller. They have been biding their time and they've just crossed the halfway mark where Remy is leading, but not with a massive lead. Um, yeah. And, and, and it's just incredible to see. He, he is a climber, that is what he's known for. But these other athletes have been kept keeping in quite close with it. Anthony Felber here, local, he actually moved to Chamonix recently, so he knows these trails well. He, he's expecting to do quite well here. He's got a really nice, quiet competence in him. This is the pole, this, this is, is Bart. Bart. And so um, Bart has, he's podiumed here before. He's won races in the series before, but last year he didn't have his form. So the big question mark is, how is he going to be able to deliver this season? You can see now Remy is pulling away from them, but Remy has been running knowing that on the technical downs, that lead is going to close. And what makes Mont Blanc so exciting is that there are two big climbs, two big descents, and that's unusual for trail racing. So they're only at the halfway, but they know that the toughest climbs are still coming. Hello. 
This is the Golden Trail World Series, and this is the first television broadcast of its kind of the Golden Trail World Series, and, and it's the second race in the season, and we are just absolutely stoked. We are now two hours, seven in for the minutes, and this is our leader. This is Remy Bonnet, and you're going to see so many different camera angles of this, and the reason why it's it, this is so special, this race, is because we have, are being met, basically able to cover every angle. We have got such a mix of cameras. Right now, you can probably, I think this is a runner who is running with a GoPro, and we have several of these runners out there with cameras. We've also got mountain bikers. We can see that behind us, someone also following Sophia. Then we have loads of drone shots as well. And this hasn't really been done before in this way, has it? Not on, not on international television. There's been live YouTubes and, we, and part of the challenge is with these mountains, they don't always have the best phone signal. Um, and so we've, it, we've brought together a team of elite cyclists and runners. Um, we've had Olympic mountain bike cyclists being camera uh, cyclists before. That's the level they have to be to keep up with them. Um, but this is the first time we've really been able to show you the, the level of skill that's on display here. And so this sport has brought together athletes from many different disciplines. We're seeing Eli Hemming here. He's won a gold cup triathlon before. He's beaten people like the Brownleys in um, international competition. <laughs> Sophia is an Olympic skier. Remy Bonet is the reigning schemo world champion. And they have come from um, different disciplines and been training in different ways through the winter. And so the fact it's a marathon now, they, some of them will be able to run to the finish. Some of them will be having challenges with transitioning to actually taking the pounding that these trails are given. Yeah, so this is the Marathon de Mont Blanc, and this is actually the longest race in the Golden Trail series in 2023. It's just over a marathon. It's at 44.6 kilometers in total. And in terms of elevation, it's 2,610. And, and, you know, the altitude really does play a point um, uh, uh, you know, within this, and it, it's quite tricky. Uh, they really will be struggling when they're at the top there, and it feels like someone's sitting on your chest. Now, we spoke to Sophia yesterday, and there was a, a press conference where we got to find out a little bit more about the athletes. Sophia was very nervous about the distance because not only has she not been running much during the winter, focusing on skiing, but this is only her second series, her second year of trail running. And she's used to very different trails to this, but also having not run this far before, in her previous races, she survived. She's done well, but she said by the end, she's really struggled to keep moving. And I just want to explain to people what they're seeing on their screen at the moment. So we're going to be flicking between the male and the female races. They, they did start off at 30 minutes different, so they will all come together soon. But on the left-hand side, you'll see at the top left what position the, the, the runner is in. Below that, you'll see what kilometre they're at out of the out of the 44.5 kilometres in total. So it's like they've, the men are at 28 points out of the 45. And now we're looking at the women, and you can see this, this is that China's Miao Yao and she is at 28.7 kilometers out of the 45 and on the right hand side you can see the elapsed time so she's been running for two hours and 41 minutes and, and she went out so strong today she's dropped back a little bit she was very close um, to the Spaniard in second and now, and now she's sitting in third but um, I, I want to talk about uh, Miao Yao because uh, she, she was, we haven't really seen her that much in the Golden Trail Series. The Golden Trail World Series started in 2018, but she wasn't able to compete, uh, you know, for a couple of seasons because of COVID, because of the restrictions in place. But she came out powering in the mm. first race of the season in Zagama just last month. But unfortunately, she paced it all wrong, didn't she, David? And she ended up actually, after leading the race, she, she was back in about 30th, I think. Yeah, and, and we thought that was going to happen today when... Her, her running style changed and she was caught by Ayana. But she's responded and actually she, she was back on Ayana's heels. So she's clearly adapting and we're not sure how, she, she's run massive distances before. Um, in her past, she's won 100 kilometer races, 100 mile races. And so she's clearly got the ability to, to run 45K, but whether she went out at the wrong pace will be the challenge because if you start too fast you burn too much fuel and it's very hard to recover talking about running 45k that was sophia luckily our, our women's leader at the moment but she'd actually never run 
a marathon distance, she said in the press conference last night. She thinks this might be the longest she's ever run. And I have to say, she was looking a bit tired there. It's the, it's the most tired we've seen her. But we're back with the men. We, we haven't had eyes on Remy Bonet, who's in first place. But but this is, this is the second. This is the American Eli Hemming, isn't it? It is. And, and Eli was... He was in second near Anthony Felber and Bart was catching. But clearly, Eli's starting to press the pace a bit more on this uphill. So this is a very long drag that they're going to be doing. Um, there is a, a, a steep climb, a steep descent, and a steep descent, and then they have douche grade drag all the way up to Le Flecheur, which is just soul destroying as a runner. You'll see that the trails change as they go around the course. So Remy is now on some smoother running trail, and this is um, where the athletes get to show their skills. Some of our runners will be very good at, at climbing. Some of them are far better at downhill. Remy is the best climber in the world, unquestionably right now. And the last two seasons, he's been working at getting smoother and, and flowing faster on, on technical downhills. Um, Sophia, though, has never done technical terrain until last season. And so you can see here, she, she's still learning as she's going. Yeah, and she does look to be struggling a bit. And, and you know, trail running and this Golden Trail World Series, it's all about bringing, and bringing the, the masses, you know, the people into this beautiful sport. And the Golden Trail World Series, this, this is the longest of the races. They all vary a little bit, don't they, in length and type of terrain. Back in Sagama, it was very wet, it was very muddy, it was more technical. This, this has got a, a, a bigger climb and it's obviously got a lot, a lot of a... Um, um, a lot of altitude, but what you know, what they're wearing at the moment really makes a difference. Sophia's gone for black shorts, black socks. Is that gonna, is that gonna, you know, make it worse for her because it, because it's dark colours? Good question. Um, let's hope not, um, because most running clothes tends to be black. But um, what she'll be worried about now is there's three edge stations on this course, and they've been through two of them, and that's the only chance they get to refuel. So. If someone's dehydrated at this stage and it's going to be 30 degrees today, they've only got one more water stop. And so we'll see at that stage whether or not they've, they've got their nutrition right. And we saw last year El Hussein diving into, lake, uh, into to, to, to streams to get the water to actually be able to drink because they'd run out. But we're going to find out why people are here in Chamonix and why it's such a great place to go hiking. The Chamonix Valley, with its hundreds of well-maintained trails, is a real goldmine for hiking enthusiasts. Many alpine lakes in the valley are accessible via these trails, making it possible to enjoy beautiful outings with groups, family or friends. With breathtaking views of their impressive Chamonix Needles, the Tacona, Bosson, Argentier and Tour Glaciers, the Mont Blanc towering over all of these places, the valley really offers a variety of stunning landscapes. And whether it's ibex, chamois, marmot, or an array of colorful flowers, the valley also boasts rich biodiversity. Even in the height of summer, certain places above 2,000 meters in altitude are still covered in snow, as you can see. And this can be quite different for those not accustomed to high altitude trails. And you can see Sophia there and the first man, well, that's actually the second woman, I think, that we see on the screen that's on the right-hand side. It? Yeah. So um, she's clearly managed to hold off from, um, from Yao Yao. She's, uh, she's putting some distance in there, we suspect. We were, um, we were wondering about our, a surprise athlete who's in fourth um, from, from Belgium. Um, this is in the men's race, isn't it? Absolutely. Maximilian Drion from Belgium. Um, he's, He's known as a schemo athlete, same as Remy, which we suspect means he's very good at climbing. But uh, he did win the European Championships two years ago, apparently, which, um, which is a, it's a good level. Um, not necessarily everyone takes part in the Europeans, but it shows that he's a good racer as well and, and clearly used to, to taking people of, of, of different abilities and, and, and winning and being able to lead a race. Um, but here we see Sophia, she had a seven minute lead at halfway. Um, yeah. And the question is whether she's going to be able to keep that up. She's very good at climbing, so this should feel more normal to her. And, and just look at how, this is Eli Hebbing now, our second place male, how relaxed yeah, he is. Yeah, doesn't he look like that? Sophia, you can see she's definitely getting tired now. And I, I do wonder, I mean, nutrition we speak about. And, and when, when we mention nutrition, David, we, we, we don't just mean food. We mean anything that's not water, don't we? So we mean like yeah, gels, uh, isotonic drinks, and that's all to kind of 
give them a, a boost of energy, boost of sugar, boost of, of glucose, and also replace some of those salts that they've lost. And you'll, you'll see that Remy and Sophia are having different strategies. As Remy went through halfway, he now has a bottle in his hand. Yeah, I want to ask you about that because when, when I go for a casual 5 or 10k, I would never take a water bottle, right? It's a bit cumbersome. I yeah. don't, don't need it. But he obviously, he, he, he knows that he needs to hydrate. He's, he's not done this in many previous races, and he's clearly forcing himself, reminding himself that he needs to be taking on nutrition because if he loses today, that is going to be one of the main reasons why is because he hasn't got his nutrition right. And we can see Eli here. He's grasping two different bottles in his hands. What do you think they've got in them? So Eli, Eli has got um, electrolytes and he's got some carbohydrates in there. Um, okay. He, and, and why is it important that they have the electrolytes and the carbohydrates? So electrolytes isn't always important in every race. Um, in fact, we've just found out Eli has just overtaken his wife. Um, it didn't look like they said many words to each other. <laughs> not, um, not the time or the breath for it, I don't think, David, on this one. But there's that for, for both of them, that would be a, a, a wonderful moment because Tabor and Eli are both racing f far better than they have in previous races. Um, Eli's has got a second in um, Flagstaff, but to come to Mont Blanc and be in second place, she wouldn't necessarily be expecting that. And she's in the top five, he wouldn't be expecting that. So they'll both be lifted to see each other's performances. Um, but yeah, Eli, will, will, he, he had in, intentionally went out with two 250 milliliter bottles so that he could ensure that he was drinking enough liquid so important stage and uh, what I, I love seeing this shot and you can really see that we're, we're in the last kind of third of this race now and and both the male the male leader here remy bonnet from switzerland and and sophia from america um they're both looking quite good but the sun is coming out it's getting hot and they need to keep this pace up uh but they're, they're looking comfortable it's a beautiful and setting and we hope they can downhill coming So we can see here, Sophia is now flying down and look at these rocks here on the up. This is what they're going to have to run down, a similar type of technical terrain. Um, and it's very hard to actually pick your route when you're tired. And when you're tired, your feet start to lag a little bit. And that's when you can suddenly lose concentration and you start to fall. We saw last year, Sara Alonso was leading, um, but she was... She lost concentration for a second and just fell flat on her face. And quite often, um, that completely undermines your confidence. And that could have changed the race. She could have potentially lost that. We've got a surprise coming for you, though. In the next few minutes, we will be joined by someone, hopefully, that uh, you, you may know from the tour. Um, but this is the point at which the pain starts to hit. You can see how bright the sunshine is. And... Ayana is a very experienced runner. She's currently in second. She's won the gamma twice before, um, and she she knows about climbing. We're going to look up her Mont Blanc times to see how she's done previously because she's a surprise person to be in second place um, at this stage of the race. She went out a lot harder than we were expecting as well. We we thought people like Daniela Omus and Caitlin Fielder would be further up the the positions by now but she's clearly very confident and as you can see from this course profile look how sharp that little climb is there yeah i mean the marathon de mont blanc is known as the roller coaster isn't it that, that's what we call it in the golden trail world series lingo and as you can see from that little map there that it, there is a lot of up and a lot of down and sophia's just done an up but i want to ask you like what's going on in, in sophia's head right now she's been ahead for so long she's been on her own for so long we'll probably see the men start to pass her soon right she will but actually that's going to help her because as soon as the men pass her i'm pretty sure remy will say you're this far ahead they're going to be communicating about the distances they know each other a little bit um but also she's going to be able to potentially follow them a little bit and have people to chase down um at the moment, she'll be fully focusing just on what's happening in front of her. Because when you're running downhill, all you do is try and keep up um, and, and try and make sure you're not going to fall over in some capacity. And you can see how difficult this is. 
Um, we've, we've spoken about Anthony Felber before. He moved here in November so he could get used to these routes. And the advantage is that he will know where these rocks are. And you see her pulling left there. He would have taken a different path there, actually. He'd have cut in slightly tighter. And so he's not going to have to slow down at all on his downhills because his subconscious is already aware of what's coming. And so he can just push the whole way down. She was running quite heavily there. You could hear the noise of her feet as she was jumping. And that pounding in your quads really starts to take its toll. There's this steep downhill at La Besha that she's going through currently, but then the race ends in Chamonix with a nearly thousand meter descent, three Eiffel Towers of running. And if you've taken too much of a pounding down this, um, and you can see she's having to jump a lot, and that is all forced through the legs, it then becomes very painful to actually run smoothly. And that is a massive challenge um, because it stops you wanting to run at the pace that your lungs might be able to. And Sophia just still looking really quite strong on this downhill. You know, she is quite new to trail running. So going on the downhill, it's been a bit of a question mark about how good a technical runner she is. But, but I'd love to ask you, David, we're in the last third of this race. Uh, the women set off at 7 a.m. Mm. What do they eat before they come out here? What do they fuel themselves with? How early do they have to get up? So S Sophia would have been up probably around four o'clock. She'd have had a breakfast, uh, a, a good sized breakfast, I'd imagine porridge, your toast, your honey, your bananas. Um, tried to have gone back to sleep. I don't know if she'd have managed that. She's fortunate being in, she's dual nationality, so she actually lives in Norway as well. So she won't have the issues of some of our Eli Hemming will be having of the, the time difference. Because if you ah. think, he's, uh, Tabor and Eli are racing at seven o'clock in the morning. Where they're from, I think they're in the Midwest is where they live on a ranch. They're six hours behind. So they're starting to race at one o'clock in the morning of what their body's used that, to. That is not optimal racing time, is it? No, so maybe the European athletes and they really do have an advantage when it comes to the time difference and, and being familiar. And, and that's where being professional or not, it makes a huge difference as well. Because if you're professional, you can move out to have altitude training, to check the course, but to change, um, change your time zone. And, and it's not just starting at early, Hour. It's the fact that you can't go to bed at, n at 10 o'clock at night when all the athletes are, other athletes, because you're still in your afternoon time. And so um, that's one of the, one of the big question marks for athletes is whether they come early so that they can um, try and acclimatize or whether they just fly in last minute. And so they don't have as many nights of a bad sleep beforehand and, and that accumulated tiredness. Now, professionalism. Now, that is kind of a, one, of, one of the, the aims behind the Golden Trail World Series, isn't it? It's trying to help these athletes and the whole sport. Oh, I'm going to cut in here. Oh, yeah. Did you see Miao Yao is on the back of, um, I think it's, we just saw behind the camera runner, Oh, Yana, so they're still together. Oh, this is amazing to see. She was really like fading in those early stages. So it's great that she's hanging on there. And, and, and if, if this, if I was a Yana, I would be nervous because mm. she knows that they're just coming up to the one of the peaks, La Becha, 1,700 meters. So this has been a 500 meter climb. One and a half uh, Eiffel Towers, 50 ostriches. 50 back ostriches. Back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is a lot of ostrich climbing. Um, but. She'll be aware of Meow Yao from having seen her as a gamma, how far she is she, that when she takes off. She'll probably also know that she's won um, some of the ultra UTMB events in the past as well. And that is when it starts to get in your mind, like, how am I going to shake off this person? Ayana's doing most of the work. She's picking out the route, she's setting the pace, and that becomes draining and also frustrating for a runner. So Ayana will suddenly, suddenly start to think, I'm going to need to make a move at some point to try and win this race and lose Meow Yao because I know how far she is and coming into the town, she's going to have the raw pace. So Speaking of that, yeah, I think y Yao Mao has just overtaken. Well, they're just switching positions here, aren't they? Back and forth. Yeah, and, and I mean, look at the difference. Of <laughs> Meow Yao looks like she's just hanging on here, clearly um, struggling to take on enough nutrition and, and, and over overheating potentially. You've got to think at this point in the race, this, this is the toughest point, right? We're coming to around two thirds in. It's it's been a grind. There's been a lot of climbing. You need to get to that point, don't you? Almost the 34k mark. We've only got 10k left because then you're like, 
home straight, I can hang on for 10K. So it's just this next 4K, which is really gonna maybe maybe see how these athletes are doing. But just wanna go back to the professionalism and, and, and sponsors and things. Now, when we see um, runners' names come up, they often have a team associated with them. For example, um, Re Re Remy Bonnet, he is with Salomon. Uh, and we've also got so many other other teams as, as part of this. What does that mean? Does that mean they, they get paid by that team to, to run? Absolutely. So a lot of them will have contracts um, with their, their headquarters. So, um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if they're sponsored, but Remy Bonet, for example, is also Red Bull. Um, and they'll receive contracts which will give them a base salary um, and that will cover them if they're injured as well. But if they do well at races like this, they'll get performance bonuses. And so not only do the top 10 receive money here, they also receive their expenses. So yeah, so the top 10 in the Golden Trail World Series, they get paid, they get they get money from the Golden Trail World Series for, for, for placing. But also if you're, you're in the top 10, your then expenses get paid to go to the next race, don't they? Which is amazing. So we, we've already spoken about a, a few of the runners we weren't expecting to see. So Oscar Klaassens, who, who took off incredibly fast at the beginning, but also um, sat back and forth uh, recently Maximilian Drion from, from Belgium, he's not been on the Golden Trail Series tour in these, these levels. Um, and so he'll come here and if he, if he holds on to that top 10 position, the next race, he'll actually be all expenses paid to come on the Golden Trail Series. It happened to Ninka Binkman in the past. She won last year's series. Her first race was as she was a complete surprise athlete. But look at this, Miao Yao's overtaken. I know, I know. You know what? I think she's going to get a second wind. I really do. And I mean, we are in the beautiful area of Chamonix. Let's take a look at just why so many people love it here. Seeing the Aguirre the Agui de Midi reaching 3,800 meters is a once in a lifetime experience. For skiers and their guides, it's the starting point for the legendary Valley Blanche, which leads to Montanvers and Chamonix via Le Mer de Glace. Discover the mountains in complete safety thanks to the secure cable cars, which reach an altitude of 3,700 meters in only 20 minutes. The Mont Blanc stands a thousand meters above you, the Grandeurs Jurassic, the Matterhorn in Switzerland, and also the Puente Hellbrunner on the Italian border. Don't miss the highest attraction in Europe. Step into the void with its glass cage at 3,800 meters, a thousand meters of empty space beneath your feet, a thrilling experience guaranteed. The Montanvers train since 1910, a true institution. The five kilometer journey takes you from Chamonix Mont Blanc to the Montanvers site, involving a 20 meter ascent of 1,900 meters. The view of the murder glass, the Druze and the Grande Jurassic is breathtaking. But we've got a little bit of a surprise for you, viewers at home. We're joined by last year's series champion, European, second in the marathon, third, oh no, we've third, third, next time, next time. Nika Brinkman, welcome. So um, we were hoping you were gonna be racing today. Um, what's, what's happened? <laughs> And, and you had such a strong season last year, didn't you? So I, are you just, is it, is it an overriding feeling of just slightly disappointment of not being able to, to race here today? So will we be seeing you back at Dolomish, Sierra's and now? Like, will this injury affect your, your future runs? We, uh, in fact, Nick, uh, we uh, we didn't have the microphone turned on there. So, uh, just to recap, she has a, a, a. Tell us about your injury. Uh, yes, I have minor injury. And I think we're still having a couple of microphone issues here. We have got it on, but we're we're just we're just. But what we are seeing on screen is second and third women. And we're going to go for third time lucky. So we are joined by last we, year's... We hear you've got an injury, yeah. uh, Nick. Yeah. Oh, do I? <laughs> it's getting worse as it goes. It should be a broken leg by now, surely. Yeah, so it's a little hamstring issue. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's pretty good, manageable. But I didn't want to risk a rupture during... 
And what does manager win for you? Are, are you training through this? Will you, when will you be back racing? And Oh, so I, uh, I'm going for shares now, for sure. Uh, at the moment I can train, but now um, as this race, I can do it, so now I take a little bit, um, you know, um, to really heal it, then go back. Now, we, we've already talked a little bit about how the tactics change from uh, race to race, because the athletes are, have different skills, have different abilities over different distances. Like, which races would you say are the best for you? This is a very good race for me, I think. Oh, so that's why you're so disappointed. And the weather, you quite like it yeah, quite sunny, I love it. don't you? Yeah, <laughs> yes. But also Sherzina is a, a really nice course for me. I think I'm a pretty good climber. Uh, so yeah, that, that suits me. And here I think the technical parts are not as technical and mm. quite runnable. And I like that a lot. And this is actually going to be, Sierra's now with the first race you've returned to, I believe. Got In the track. Golden Trail, yes, this year, yeah. Yeah. Now we, we may be uh, we may be going to an interview with Sophia, Sophia Lockley soon, or we might be holding on to Ninka. Fingers crossed. Yeah. We're just about to find out. Um, I want to ask that. What what do you think of this race so far? Were you expecting Sophia to be this far ahead? What what do you think? Yeah, I, I think I expected a bit. She's a very strong runner, uh, also uphill, and I think she can run uh, run both parts very well as well. So yeah, and she's still running really strong. So yeah. And with you being here and seeing this, and obviously you're so disappointed not to be running, but surely that's giving you more fire in your belly to, to get back yeah, out sure. there. Yeah, I think, of course, it gives you motivation yeah, as well. Now, Sophia, before the race, said she was very nervous because she's never run this distance before. And she's also not used to getting nutrition right. You've come onto trail running relatively new. Like, how did you learn to, to, to work with gels, to work with energy drinks? Like, is, is, is there a lot to get right? Uh, yeah, I think the, when I was the first time in shares, you know, I did it really wrong. Uh, but then I did it in training very well. And in Kingao, that was, well, I think, 44 uh, The drinking and the nutrition was, uh, yeah, I practiced a lot and it makes the uh, And are you having to tell yourself um, specific time checks where you're, I need to have taken this by this stage? Or how do you make sure that you don't get distracted by the race? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, actually, I think in the race, I'm really conscious about about that, about the time. You no, know, I want to every 20 minutes. Like in the road marathon, it's more like 5K. And in the in the third runs, you don't really know 5K can be very long. Short, so it's more now, a race like this, the heat really becomes a factor. We saw that at Sierra's and now. Um, you're, the first year you raced that as well. Um, how does how does that change your racing when you start in the shade, it's early morning, and then you suddenly hit that wall of heat? Uh, I I really like the heat. I think uh, for me it's not that big of a problem, but I do think that it's good if you train, train uh, quite a while in the heat beforehand so that you adapt to it. Take it a while as well. So it's good if you have. Similar climb. We've actually got a, a question in um, from from the live. So we want to ask you: Have you improved your downhill running? Um, I would say a little bit. Um, I think maybe in Madeira was so good training for me. <laughs> we lo we loved you see seeing you uh, race every stage in that, and obviously this year the finals a bit different. Yes, but I think in Madeira it was actually good um, so the main focus is from also my strength and um, bit by bit learning the the technical part. But with with Madeira, I know a, there was a frustration in your part that some of the runners didn't race every day because they then could perform better on the day. But actually, that meant that you were following runners who were better at downhills, which if they hadn't done that, you wouldn't have had that lesson. But do you feel being behind someone? is a, a better way to learn running downhill than just running it by yourself. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Because you can do how, what they choose for lines and stuff. And yeah, I think it's, it's, it's in running, it's in cycling. I think in many sports, it's good to see techniques uh, in front of you. And do you, do you think now that you've had this exposure coming into Sierra's now, 
out of the top runners, well, we'll see a lot of road runners coming. We'll see a lot of, of very fast um, runners who aren't who, on the first uphill and across the top will be pushing the pace. Would you now back yourself in the slightly more um, steep descent against them? Uh, against the road runner? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, some people have talents in going downhill, right? Yeah. It's. I don't really think I would say during the race, well, let's try to beat that person. I think it's more for me to focus on, my, on myself in downhill. I, I've got a question for you as well. We can see Sophia Lackley on, on the screen right now. It's hot. We're in the last almost like 10k of the race. You've been in this position before, right? What is going through her mind and, and what, 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 what's going on in there? Well, I think if you're in the last 10k, it can feel like, well, you're almost there in such a long race. So it's like, yeah, just push it through now the final part. And I think it can maybe even feel almost like a relief that it's maybe, the, is it the last climb? That you know it's the, like the last climb of the day and you're like, yeah, well then... The worst is go. over. Yeah, yeah sort of. <laughs> and we, we've had a question from, uh, from the live team. Are you going to win it? Sorry, what? Are you going to win it? Seriously, no. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, I, I really don't like to talk about winning and stuff. I, I think I got the question before as well, but I really would like to beat my previous self. I mean, I, I'm going to call that out. If you don't beat your previous self, then what have you been doing yeah, these last uh, two years? True. Come on, that's okay, a low bar. Okay, I think I, I find it uh, very hard to say uh, I want to win, win this race because... Um, I think I just want to go in there with the feeling I always have. Just go and, and just go and not think about uh, I need to do this position to make the race a successful race. And in, and in terms of your, if you track your progress, you've been doing your splits, you know how you've been running in training. Um, the second season, you came back so fluid, so fast. Do you feel you've stepped it up a gear again since last year? Well, yeah, I, I think I was. Uh, I, 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 I was ready also for racing again oh, and uh, yeah I think uh, there is still some room for some improvements yeah I would say <laughs> well we are um, we, we at the three quarters point of this race and we're going to be seeing the last big uphill coming soon where we get a, a clearer understanding of exactly the positions of the men's and the women's it's all up for up for taking. Um, Sophia looks like she's got a strong lead, but the question is, can Bart and Manu chase down Remy? Because it's pretty close and they could get him. So we still have Ninka Brinkman here with us um, for, for another few minutes. Um, very, very good for you to join us. Um, could you see yourself doing, like, are you here because you'd already booked your flights and you wanted to, to be involved in the, in the feel of it? Or was the injury quite a last minute thing? Yeah, injury was quite last minute, but I, I also, I came by car. Wow. Zurich, I live in Zurich, it's very close. And I took my bike, it's beautiful here. Oh, so, so you can enjoy it from a different perspective. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and, and of course, I, I like to see the, uh, the runners. They're, you know, they're also my friends, uh, but also because I could, yeah, you are in the mountains, it's a nice sort of downtime and, and for people who are watching dog trail and trail running for the first time um what would your advice be for how to quickly make improvements how to quickly uh, make gains how do you approach trail running if you've not done it yeah i i think it really depends on what you want from it i guess for like performance it's also good to do some in, intense work i think if you and otherwise just being out on the course a lot a lot to practice yeah, the technique. That's I think crucial. Um, and yeah, for me, I think it, it works a lot that I, that you boost a bit the, the intensity. And do you think it's possible to? Because you transitioned from hockey, where you almost emerged a fully formed, fantastic runner from just <laughs> running in lockdown against uh, against your watch. Um, how? M what would you say the difference between? being a fast runner and being a good trail runner, it's like, how big a gap is that to try and pick up? Mm, I think there is some trade-off, yeah. So I, I think because uh, it's a, um, I, I think I always lose a little bit of the 
I, I don't know if I can call it like view too much, like the view intensity for the uphill when I am in marathon training and the other way around, like uh, I lose a little bit of speed when I am full in the um, trail running, but I always com still have the base trainings uh, combined, so road and trail. And in, in terms of your road ambitions this year, mm -hmm. is, is it a time you're hunting for? Are there yeah. which championships are the ones you want? <laughs> Uh, I I want to qualify for the Olympics, which you need. Then you need to run a 2:26:50 in 2023, so uh, or 2024. So I've done it before, but uh, did, this doesn't count for the qualifier. And uh, but surely that's not your uh, your ultimate goal. Like a 2:26, if you did that in the next years, you wouldn't be that happy, right? Is there? Are you trying to push 221s now, 220s? Oh, I would love to beat my personal best, yeah, for sure. And w what is your personal best for people at home who, who don't know? Like, you're such a good road runner as well. And you're one of these unique athletes who manages to do both. And I, and I loved what you said in the docu series about, you know, road running and trail running <laughs> to you is it's like the gin and the tonic, <laughs> right? You don't want one without the other. Yeah, I kind of. I think, yeah, and when you go... And when you combine it, it's just uh, the, for the mental space, it's nice, for physical, yeah, it's always a challenge. And is that why uh, Sierra Zanau is such a, a good race for you? Uh, 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 because of your mix of kind of road running and trail running? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, you have a really fast part there as well. Yeah, no, uh, Sierra Zanau is a good, good fit. And so Olympics 2024, that would be pretty special being part of the Dutch team for that. Yeah. That's at the moment my main goal. I really would like to make the team. Yeah, well, we're going to be watching you eagerly, not only on trail, but also on road this season. And hopefully you can stay injury free and you can absolutely do both. Thank you for joining us, Nika, and good luck with the rest of the season. Thanks a lot and good luck. So Sophia, Sophia now is, is really pushing the pace still. The big news, though, is that Miao Yao has overtaken Ayana Kortazar and has built about a 12-second gap over her, which, given that they're climbing and given we're expecting Miao Yao to be slightly better on the, the tops and the downhills, um, this could be a significant gap for that podium place. Yeah, and for people who are, who are maybe just joining the race, this is Sophia Lackley. She is from Team Solomon from the USA. And this is the first time we've kind of seen her not running, to be honest. She has been absolutely phenom f phenomenal. She has been out in front for all of this. Look and, at and Remy. I know, look, look at him that. go. He's still running. This is incredible. Um, he was worried that by this stage of the race, he's now in the final nice climb point. up to uh, Le, Le, Le Fleger. And um, he was nervous that he wasn't going to be able to hold, hold on. Um, but he's got one more aid station when he reaches that point. Um, and this is a great sign, the fact that he's moving so fluidly. Eli's trying to chase him down, but I can't see Eli moving at that speed on that terrain. We weren't expecting this from Eli necessarily, were we? We know he's such a strong runner, but we didn't know that, that he would be kind of in this position at this point in the race. And, and, and the Marathon de Montblanc is the longest of the, of the races here. So we are going to see different winners. And I, I suppose what's, what would be good to, to discuss, Dave, is were, were both these leaders racing in, in Zagama last month for the Golden Trail? Because not all runners are going to race at every single uh, race in the Golden Trail series. Absolutely not. And, and so Remy did. He was leading up um, to the final climb at the peak, but was struggling with his nutrition. And also his, he, he basically made a bit of a tactical error on his trainers. But the, the real big news here is, is who's tracking him down. Not all of our trackers are, are working ready? at the moment, but... It looks as if um, behind Eli, we have uh, Maximilian Drion in third place. Bart is in fourth from Poland and Manu Marias is in fifth. Both Bart and Manu, we know are very powerful descenders, but Manu Marias has, he's won here the OCC, a 50K race on these trails. So he has been pacing it from the start to finish very quickly. So we'd be expecting him to be the person challenging for the podiums. And in the back of his mind, he's the one that Remy's fearing right now. And we've spoken a lot of kind of about the top five, the top 10 athletes. But how do you even, how do you qualify for a Golden, a golden Trail Series event? I mean, now the Marathon de Mont Blanc, th this existed already. This is actually the 20th year of it. Anyone can kind of enter that, can't you? But 
like how 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 do you get involved and how are you part of the Golden Trail series? The great thing with Mont Blanc is two and a half thousand people run this. So if you sign up quick enough, you're part of the Golden Trail series. If you come top ten as an as an outsider, someone who's never even run before, you get the prize money. You get the invitation to the next race, all expenses paid, and you're suddenly on the tour. And we're going to see some of the runners today. Exactly that will happen. And Delia, Daniela Omus, who um, she's currently in fourth place, who won Zagama, um, she wasn't expected to be top 10. She wasn't announced as a favorite prior to that race. And because of her win, she's now on the tour. And I imagine we'll be seeing her throughout the rest of the tour. Now, an update on, on what's happening in the women. Sophia, luckily, she had a seven minute lead at one point. Has now gone to 12 minutes. Wow, she really is putting in such an impressive performance, isn't she? Even if she blows now, I think she could she can hold on. She could walk a mile, shake it off, and, and kind of pick it up. Can we? Can we just remind viewers at home? And she's that, walking a mile. <laughs> she's, uh, she's doing that. Sophia, luckily, last night in the press conference, she said she's never run this far. This is a woman who's never run a marathon distance. She's here leading the marathon de Mont Blanc, looking comfortable. And and if she wins this, she gets a very important 200 points in the Golden Trail World Series. Now we, we our last splits were from um, the climb of Leger. We have uh, in second place Miao Yao, 12 minutes behind her. Um, in terms of the split between her and and, and it. Ayana's, in fact, Ayana's not currently. Wow. We're not sure what's happened to Ayana. We're hoping the tracker's wrong because currently on our live tracker, it's saying that she hasn't reached that checkpoint yet. I think that's probably wrong. Behind them, though, is Sylvia Nordska. She's never podium before. She is only three minutes behind. She's a very fast sprinter. I'd expect her to be good on the downhills. And uh, Daniela Omus is um, on her shoulder, eating up the ground as well. On our screen at the moment, you've got Remy Bonnet in first, and there's okay, almost yeah. half, a, well, just over half a kilometre between him and Eli Hemming from the USA sitting in second. Now, it does seem like Remy is, is quite strong and he should be maintaining that, but I'm intrigued about who's behind them. And what I also want to talk about, you were talking about split times there. So, does each athlete have a transponder or is it is it done by the bibs? Talk me through that process. Uh, it will have a GPS tracker, uh, typically, but, um, and I think that's what that's, that's, that tag. that tag is, it's part of that. But it's when they cross the timing mats there, that gives you a more accurate um, time because the trackers themselves are so dependent on the, the satellite. Whereas actually going through that bat, you know that they've got their code that's going through there. Interestingly enough, we've just found out that the um, Remy is being filmed by Benjamin uh, Rubio, who is the long distance world champion. I mean, that's how good the quality of the cameramen are. Wow. We've got the world champion for Remy. Um, he's probably finding it quite hard because Remy's a better climber than anyone. Um, <laughs> and yeah, ju ju just for everyone's info, we've got so many different camera people uh, taking part in this. We've got mountain bikers, runners, drones, and it's just absolutely sensational. But we, um, we're at Eli Hemmings doing incredibly well to be in second place here. He's only recently switched from, um, from triathlon. But we're going to tell you now about why Chamonix is the home of mountaineering and so many people come here to climb. Chamonix is the birthplace and world capital of mountaineering. It is from here that Jacques Balmont and Dr. Michael Packard made the first ascent of Mont Blanc in 1782. With 20 peaks over 4,000 meters, the Mont Blanc Massif is the ideal playground for mountaineering enthusiasts. For hundreds of years, these peaks have captured the imagination with epic challenges surrounded by the immensity of the mountains. The streets of Chamonix bear the names of individuals who have left their mark on the history of mountaineering. Michael Crowes, Edward Wimper, Marie Paradis, and many more. For 200 years, the Chamonix Guides Company have offered guidance across medium and high mountains. And whether you are a beginner climber, want to improve your bouldering, tackle big mountains routes, or dream of taking part in its annual stage in the Climbing World Cup, the Chamonix Mont Blanc Valley is absolutely the ideal climbing destination for you. Some of those runners, they'd want to be seeing those icy conditions right now, right? <laughs> Wouldn't they? It is hot here in Chamonix, isn't it, David? Look at on Sophia's back. Oh. Oh, she is going to be feeling that climb. Let, let's talk about um, sunscreen and, and, and other provisions. Like Sophia, she's not wearing a cap. Now, personally, I definitely want a visor or a cap on. Sunglasses are well and good, but it's almost like stopping that heat gets to your face, isn't it? And actually, 
one of the reasons why caps are so great is because you can dip them in water and you can just completely cover them. And it means that you, you have the evaporation coolness that isn't just your sweat that you're losing. The trouble is you start this race at seven in the morning and you're, you're packing at night. And Sophia wouldn't have raced something as long in the heat like this. And, and it might be that it's a, a preference that she's chosen, but it, it could be oh, just God, that oh, her inexperience oh, showing it's only her second year of trail running. And also, it is just personal preference, isn't it? Like, some people hate wearing a cap. Some people don't like sunglasses. Like, it really is personal preference. Also, it depends on your sponsor, depends what your team has got. All, all of that plays a part. Um, what I do want to talk about is, is the bibs. Now, there's obviously quite a few rules, as with any major uh, world event. Now, the bibs, I am, they have to be wearing that bib throughout the race, don't they? They're not allowed to take it off. If it comes off, do they have to put it back on? Absolutely. I mean, we, if, you, if you watch for the next Golden Trail, watch the intro, and you'll see Sarah Alonso not only falling on her face. face. We love you, Sarah. She was safe. She was OK for that. Uh, but at one point, her bib flies off, and she has to run back and get it, because your bib often has your timing tracker on it. And so if you come through without your timing tracker, um, unfortunately, rules are rules, and it could mean that you're out of the race. Um, luckily, it looks like all of our runners have their, their bibs on, but some people will attach them to their bags, which can be a, a bit of a risky decision because you don't notice it if you've lost it. But if you look at, look at the two different styles, you can see the different terrains, um, and it's very, very varied. So Eli is going through the incredibly steep climb, quite rocky, whereas... Um, Remy is now coming into the top of La Flagere, the final climb. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we, uh, we've got some noise background, shall we say. We're not quite sure what, what's been going on for the viewer at home because we had some lovely music blaring out. <laughs> we weren't sure whether you were seeing a lovely clip. We should be talking. So apologies if it seems like there's some dead air there. There's, uh, there's certainly not some dead runners out there, which is what they were fearing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can see this mid well, it's not even midday, here, local time in France. It's 10.24, but that heat is really picking up. I think we're expecting it to be about 30 degrees, and I think it's going to feel hotter than that for some of them today. And, and Remy, he's, he's got his water bottles on. Do you think he's consumed all that? You say that it's definitely electrolytes for Remy. Yeah, and he'll be having carbohydrates, well, but just look at this pace. You can't quite... Can't you can't appreciate how it, can you? Steep this is. Um, but if you look at how hunched they are um, and the different styles between them, look at the stride length of Remy. He's running up Le Flagier. Like this is this is the the, the the Alps that he's managing to get up. He's now on a smooth a bit of running, but he's got such a light, strong um, stride length. It's incredible. But apparently, we've just been told that the battle for third place is really on. We knew that our, um, our Belgian runner, Maximilian, was in, in third place, but it seems like El Hussein and Manu are now closing the gap. And that is not good news really for anyone ahead of them because both of those two are incredibly fast downhill. El Hussein will run at the pace of whoever's in front of him. And if Manu's in front of him, that means even if it becomes technical, El Hussein will be able to just glide behind him without having to make the difficult decisions of which route to take and so if you're Eli that is going to be the the, the big challenge for him to stay ahead of him. What uh, is also really interesting to note is that Remy and Eli that there's they're quite different body types aren't they like Remy is kind of more of your traditional uh, trail runner he's slim he's slight he's, he's relatively short whereas Eli is, is a much bigger frame now now how does that impact them on, on running? Well, actually, uh, Remy is, is surprisingly tall, um, more than you'd imagine. But um, a lot of it comes down to Remy, is, is, he loves climbing. And so he, he's built himself to be the lightest climber possible. Um, Eli's come from a triathlon background. So he's, he's won um, gold, gold cup races before. And um, he, he's a bit more of an but actually both of those are climbers, as we can see. Now, this is Sophia coming into the, the aid station at Le Flagier. What will be interesting, and we should all look out for viewers at home, is 
how she deals with this um, aid station. If she stops the extra water, if she is disorientated at all, picking up the um, her liquids, and indeed whether they start chugging their drink ahead of time, because often people only realize they haven't been taking on enough nutrition when they see that, uh, actually this is the point I should have an empty bottle. I mean, that looks smooth. She just, yeah. it looked like an empty bottle of air. She's clearly on her nutrition plan for sure. Uh, we, we've always got people asking like, how do we film this? And, and this is the first TV showing of the Golden Trail World Series. And it's absolutely epic. We've got mountain bikers behind, we've got runners behind, and we've got drone shots. We have got everything. And it is such a unique first experience to be able to televise the Golden Trail Series in this way. Look, look how close they are. They are within a hundred meters of each other now. Look at that, so Remy kept his bottle on the left. He, he, so he, he must have his electrolytes and his um, carbohydrates in his, in his hand because he took a bottle that I assume was just water, he drunk some, he, he poured some down his back and he carried on running. So clearly he's got a different strategy for his water to his electrolytes and carbohydrates. Now, Sophia, we're seeing a run well here. She's going to have Remy come in soon. Yeah, um, and that's what I love about this. With, with the women, in this race, um, the, the women started 30 minutes before at 7 a.m. local time, and the men started 30 minutes behind. So it's now amazing at this really key point when there's, when there's less than 10 kilometers left of the whole race. We're, we're seeing them overtake each other and the, ma the male and female female runner being close. And look, I think Sophia's starting to enjoy this now. It's the home straight, right? I hope so. She's got a big, big lead. And this is where they, they say the roller coaster. This can be difficult if you're feeling, um, if, you, if you're mentally down, because you've just done the biggest climb and you now feel like this is your reward. You're running to the finish. But actually, there's quite a long drag along the top, um, which is up and down. And you can see here, you're still having to work quite hard. And she's, she's not run this race before. So she may be expecting to just be able to flow down to the finish now. And so that can suddenly jolt your expectations and, and, and really get you, in a, get you in a negative spiral if you're feeling tired. Now, I've got a bit of an out there question, David. I don't know if this is, this is usually discussed, but obviously we know that, they, that runners have to wear these bibs, right? Men, would they be allowed to um, or, like, run topless if they're bibbed somewhere else? They're that hot, you know? Is that an option? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you, do, you do see some topless runners at times, um, but not typically with elite men because they've got sponsors for one, but also it's very easy to get burned. And we'll see some of our runners who haven't realized this morning how hot it's going to get who are getting burned. And it just gives you that extra cover. But also um, you can pour water on it and it sticks the water for you. But this downhill is going to be incredible. We've got Manu, we've got El Hussein, we've got Bart chasing and it still could all change. Still working hard here, isn't she? She's looking great. She really is, and you can't help but think, oh, and here he is. Is. Uh, The interesting thing is, the camera runners, wait, there you go. <laughs> camera runner one has overtaken camera runner two. So we're probably, we're hopefully gonna switch cameras now, um, if the, which would be useful. Um, this is absolutely amazing. I mean, those camera runners, I think they deserve a medal themselves. So they must be putting in some absolutely decent split times, no? And, and Fleury, one of the camera runners, he did the vertical K just uh, yesterday. So yeah, it's worth us saying that this, this is the Marathon de Mont Blanc, but this whole yeah, weekend... How difficult this is, though. This yeah. is, it's got, like, trying to flow through this when you're tired is super... You could see the cameraman just gave up. Yeah, I mean, there's no flow through that. But as we're saying, there's, there's been so many different events across this weekend. This is the crown jewel. This is the Marathon de Mont Blanc. But we've, we've had the vertical K race, which is a brutal 1K kind of ascent straight up. And then we've had a 90 kilometer race. We've had all sorts. And it's absolutely exceptional to see the whole town in Chamonix buzzing with the delight of trail running and being outdoors. Most people maybe only go to the Alps in winter. You can see there's still snow in the mountains in the background. But this is our second man. This is Eli Hemming and he is still plowing away you know so he's just he's he's just coming up to the aid station quite soon so he he's about 1800 meters and he knows he's then got another three kilometers across the top um before he finally hits his descent so he'll be feeling quite tight but getting to that aid station is almost the, the checkpoint when you go this is the beginning of the end of the race but 
if you've got tired legs, the descent is from 1800 meters all the way into Chamonix. So you're talking 800 meters of descending oh, that's all what in you water. Want, isn't that's what you want at the end of this? It's <laughs> absolutely brutal. You're talking about 50 giraffes all stacked on top of each other. Sorry, um, David just said 50 giraffes. We're talking about the, zoo, the, the animal here. Uh, he's been, he's been measuring how tall these are and how many he needs. But, yeah, but three, um, imagine running down three Eiffel Towers as fast as you can. That's what they're just about to do. Um, but Remy, I think Remy at this stage probably knows he's got it. Do you um, think so? Because there isn't very, the, the downhill after the, the, the top isn't very technical. He, He's a, a French speaker. He knows the camera runners. He'll have many fans on the course. They'll be telling him. But this is interesting. He's pulling off the track. It's, that's Manu there, I believe. Manu yeah, Maria. Yeah, yeah. And he, he won in Instagram. So he's actually leading the Golden golden Trail Series in terms of standings at the moment. And I, that's what's something I want to pick up on. Like you, For a win here, you get 200 points. And both men and women are kind of in separate separate entities. Uh, then you get 188 points for second, 176 for third. Um, Remy Bonnet actually is in fourth at the moment. So if he comes in and gets gets 200 points for first, that could really, that could frog frog leap him up to the maybe second or first, depending on where Manny, who we're not really sure how he's doing, where he's going to come at the moment. And, and the next race is the Dolomis Run, which is only a half marathon, very short, very sharp. And it's, it's a technical route where if you're good, you don't have to follow the path. You just run through the rocks, down the mountain. And that is the type of terrain that Manny could do very well in, that Remy will be cautious of. So uh, we can see we can see Eli coming in now. He's picked up his pace. You see the energy there. Yeah. He's having instructions on, on what's going on. You can see that. His, um, yeah, his coach is telling him where he is, maybe a bit of tactics for the last bit, maybe just a bit of encouragement. And at this stage, Re the question is, is, oh, is Eli thinking, where is Remy or where is Manu and El Hussein? Because the battle is coming. <laughs> we're, just seeing Eli we're just seeing Eli Hemming come through the last aid station, wait, the top wait. of the Fajr, that's the, the, the last final climb in second place. Remy has taken the lead, uh, is in the lead. He's overtaken the first lady. And this is Miao Yao in second place. Yeah, Sophia Luckley of America, of the USA Team Silent. She is really streaking ahead. She is having the race of her life. And I tell you what, th that is the woman that has never run a marathon before. But here it is China's Miao Yao, who we were a bit worried about to begin with. But she has really put in such a good performance. I think she's, yep, she's back running again. I think if she can just continue, she is going to nail that second place. And what a start to her season that would be and did you see she was looking back there and she's she's changing this this should be runnable for her if we saw when she was overtaking a um a Yana, she was the one doing the running and she's clearly feeling a little bit more tired and is concerned about the person behind because the fact she was looking back but this is this is our race leader remy bonnet and I, I can't see anyone stopping him when he's flowing so smoothly. No, there. and that is definitely a bit of technical down there. That just one foot wrong and you really you really could stack it and, and do yourself a serious injury. But what's interesting is that tiredness is really creeping in for this at this point. And it's really important that runners do do try and find out where they are and how close other people are behind them, isn't it? And and how do they do that? It's often the camera people, can they can they give them intel? But sometimes they don't speak the same language. Yeah, and, and the camera people typically won't know because they're, they're, they've just got their camera and their job is just to run back to the next person. But you'll see the aid stations is, is the point at which they're handed their, their drink. And being a local or having a team with you really helps because your coach will then run with you and say, they're there, they're there, they're at this point, they're at that point. You need to start um, racing. So it, the news is that Peter is starting to come back. He was way down in 10th the last time we saw yeah. him. And Manny is in third at the moment. So if Manny comes third and Remy comes first, that still means that Manny is leading the Golden Trail World Series overall rankings. So we, we're not quite sure what's happened to El Hussein then, because El Hussein was meant to be on Manu's shoulder. This time last year, El Hussein was in the lead pack until the halfway point, Valacine, and he just overcooked himself and got his nutrition wrong and was having to walk and to drink from the streams. He was so tired. The fact that he's not with Manu anymore, we'd expect El Hussein to be a better climber, um, even at this stage, if he's getting his nutrition right, but he's dropping back. So Manu here in, th in third place, if he gets to the A station in third, he's going to be a firm favorite to catch Eli Hemming in second because of his downhill speed. 
We don't know much about Peter's um, downhill speed. I mean, he's he's uh, from Scandinavia. We know he trains with John Albon and, um, and with Killian. So you'd, so you'd expect him to be good technically. Um, him against Manu would be quite a battle. We just got to hope that the cameramen aren't too tired. But we can see now, Ayana, third woman. She's looking fairly similar pace to um, to Miao Yao at this stage, I'd say. This is more of her style. She's been hands on legs the whole way um, from the start at the steeper clyde. So we can't read too much into her position there on her Gosh. on her tide. And we've only got about six kilometers left. Wow, Remy Bonnet really giving a master class in trail running here in Chamonix. And uh, we've just heard that Peter has overtaken Manu. Um, and it's, it's looking like a very exciting finish to this race, a fight right until the end. And look at those shots. This is obviously one of our drone shots uh, taking in the incredible view surrounding Chamonix, Mont Blanc. And you can just feel the heat coming off that to be running up some very big hills. Um, and Manu, I don't think he'd be expecting someone to, to, to necessarily pass him. At least it's on the climb. And he knows that his, uh, his, his absolute go-to weapon is still in the bag. But Remy has never won here before. Remy has led this race three times. He's, this is the furthest he's been in the race, in the lead. Um, he's been on the, the beginning climb to Le Flageur previously, was overtaken by Davide Magnini and ended up in fourth place. Um, he was leading at the top of Colpa Sets two years ago and Stian took the lead and won that. And so this will be playing in his mind a little bit. Like, don't mess this up. We've been here before. And um, he, he knows well enough the, the, run, the downhill running speed of Manu, of Manu Marias from Spain, to know that it's not over until he crosses that line, unless he's getting updates from people of the exact time splits. Because someone like Manu, I think, could take 90 seconds, maybe two minutes out of Remy. I mean, look at his work right here. This is the switch back we were talking about. Yeah, so when it's a switchback, it means that you're, you're kind of running in one direction and then you kind of turn back on yourself either up or downhill, doesn't it? It's kind of, there's, there's quite a lot of terms in trail running that maybe aren't familiar in, in other sports, right? But those switchbacks can feel brutal if you've got tired legs because you're having to break on every corner. If you're someone like Anthony Felber, though, who knows these routes, you'll be able to flow through it. And this is Manny Maria. <laughs> Look at him hunched over there. God, we really haven't seen much of him, have we? I mean, he's obviously just been plowing away, just quietly doing his job. And now he's coming through. And he's, he's still, you can see here, he's just, he's still jogging. He's not, he's not opened his stride. And typically what we'd see with runners, when they get to the, the, the crest and the peak of a, a trail, is try to do slightly long, longer strides to open up the legs and to get them ready for this. So you can, you can now see he's starting to stride out. This still isn't his attack. This is him unwinding a little bit, but we're going to start to see him actually aggressively running. And we can see there, he's look there already. He's taken a cut. Yeah. So is that allowed then? Do they have to follow like, like the exact path or just between certain markers? It depends on race to race. Um, but the, it, in America in particular, you have to stick on the path because their paths are far more create, uh, curated. In Europe, it really depends on the rules of the course, but you can see how close he was there yeah. to, to Peter. Yeah. And um, these two runners probably won't know each other that well because yeah. they've been running slightly different circuits um, in the past. But um, I, this is game over for Peter, I'm afraid. Um, I'm putting it out there. Although, look at Peter, looks like he's flowing well. Um, I know. I mean, however, there, there's no chance that Manny can catch Remy Bonnet now, is there, really? There shouldn't be. There, sh there shouldn't but be. Never say never in trail running. And the trouble with the trouble with marathon distance is that when you start to tire, if you run out of glycogen, if you bonk, yeah, suddenly you're not losing seconds per mile. You're losing minutes per while. You can be forced to walk. And because they've come through three aid stations already, a lot of these athletes will have used all their nutrition already, and they might not have anything in their pockets. And so if you haven't got some caffeine, if you haven't got a gel, once you're in that hole, it's extremely hard to get out of because your body's transferring to just burning fat. And it's far harder for your body to actually burn fat. And the gap between the time it takes, the carbs you've run out of and the fat you're now fueling, that is the wall, that is your bunk. And that is when you're forced to almost walk. 
I mean, what sensational images we're seeing. I mean, David, we've been sat here for, for three and a half hours. You know, we are spoiled by these incredible images. And this is Yael Mao coming through. Oh, she does look like she's struggling, doesn't she? But she's going to take on some more fluids, hopefully. Uh, she's been in this red top, this white cap, just hoping that she can hang on in there and look, take seconds. Look, look at the conversation they're having there. Um, part of that might be her unloading some of her emotional kind of weight and be like, I feel terrible. I've got to push. That's the moment the, the coach will then have to really come back and G her up as much as possible. And he's just flying down this section, isn't he? He's enjoying this, surely. Oh, he will like... be absolutely loving this. He'll know how far he is ahead. Yeah. And... And... And, and he, I mean, he, he, I say he only came fourth in the last Golden Chess series, but he would have been disappointed with that. Oh, he, he, he was leading. I, the question with Remy has always been, can he race well early in the season? He does schemo where there's no impact on your legs. And so we know he's got the lungs. And just see the way the speed changes on that switchback. Mm. It, it, you're having to break. And the better you are at those, you can just maintain your momentum without damaging your legs, hurting your legs. Contrast Sophia. She's still looking good, actually, but she's not got the stride length we'd expect for her at this stage. So w would you expect it to be a bit longer then? Or? Yeah, absolutely. The, the way to run a fast downhill is just to try and relax, to try and be light on your feet, to not put any impact into your legs. And, and uh, is that being on the balls of your feet? Do you want to be on the balls of your feet? On, on, actually, on the toes of your feet, yeah. ideally. Uh, just dancing down where you're not putting it. You see, Ayana's clearly... Oh stopping to take on fuel here. She's Come looking on, tired. Yeah. Um, she's got some, some men in front of her, actually, which will help her because she'll be able to try and pick them off. But yeah. um, if we compare the two of them, Yao Yao was still moving, I think, with a bit more purpose at that stage. Yeah. Um, I, it, it feels like the Spaniard has kind of resigned herself that she's going to try and hang on to third instead of trying to go after second. That's what it and, looks like. And Daniela Omas, who won the gamma, who's a very good downhill runner, she's behind her. Interesting. And, so then we might have a bit of a close one on our hands between third and fourth. Yeah, neither podium is decided yet, but look at Remy. Um, I, I know from the way Remy runs, he is feeling just magnificent right now. He... There is no tiredness in those legs. He is flowing fully, but look at this shot. Um, it's not particularly useful for finding out <laughs> who it is, but it says that this is Le Flagere. So I'm expecting this is probably Daniela Omas coming up. Um, this will be fourth and fifth woman approaching, but it gives you an indication. The fact if this is Le Flagere, we haven't seen the aid station yet. So there's still quite a bit of climbing there, which means the Yadda does have a decent lead over fourth yeah. place. And um, I'd expect Daniela to be able, be able to make up a minute or so, and maybe 90 seconds on the final descent. So yeah. it's going to be super tight yeah, for that I mean, third podium. Just just for the drama of it, we would, we'd love to see that fight, wouldn't we? Oh, and we've heard that Bart is coming back in fifth place. Uh, the man from Poland, Bart, is hopefully catching up to make and this. We, we haven't really spoken about Bart yet because Bart is another very, very powerful descender. Before, with, with Manu... There was a question, who's better? In the wet, I'd, I'd definitely back Manu Marias. But we saw at Stranda, they were neck and neck all the way down the mountain. Um, and so now it's actually going to be not just their technical skill, but also who's been pacing this race better. Yeah, I mean, Remy Bonnet just looks like he's having the time of his life. And we have seen... Uh... We've seen, obviously, quite a lot of different terrain, especially from those images there. From uh, What type of trainers would you wear on this? Like, how big... Like, trail running shoes, they traditionally have quite large uh, bits un underneath the sole, like uh, lugs, they're Talk called. Talk about the lugs. And so, with these lugs, because it, there's, not, there's not a lot of mud, so you could go with... You're going to be running on some rock, but probably not, actually. So, you wouldn't have to have too aggressive lugs here. They'll be going for, a, ideally, quite a light trainer with a little bit of bite, but... They wouldn't be expecting to slip. And the fact it's dry means the, the surface would have dried off. But we want to tell you about Chamonix as well and why it's such a wonderful place. And Chamonix has been the mecca for sport for many, many years. And we're going to find out shortly why people have come here to do with the Olympics oh, yeah. that took here in 1924. And the fact they're coming up to centenary means that they're having a huge number of celebrations to pay dues to those days.
Back in 1924, Chamonix Mont Blanc hosted the first Winter Olympic Games. And 100 years later, the city will once again embrace the Olympic spirit for the centennial celebrations. And these began on February the 3rd. Olympic and Paralympic week took place in April, including 400 students trialing paratriathlon and curling using a stone from the 1924 Chamonix Olympics. To celebrate the centennial, a reference book of the 1924 Olympic Games will be released in November, ready for an exhibition of the Games history at the Maison de la Memoire et de Patrimoine from December. And in February 2024, the Alpine Skiing World Cup will take place in Kandahar an official anniversary of the Games in March. Lastly, Chamonix Mont Blanc will welcome the Olympic flame on June the 23rd, 2024. All of these celebrations will be leading, of course, to the Summer Paris 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And we cannot wait for those, can we? Absolutely not. And we're, we're getting an update on our men's positions. Because they've gone through... Uh, Le we've we've actually got the split times. Remy has a six minute lead on Eli Hemming. Uh, that's got to be safe by now, surely. But behind him, um, at the last checkpoint, it looked like Manu and Peter were about six minutes back on Eli. So it looks like first and second are tied up. In terms of the women though, it's a far tighter race. Yeah, and this is an exciting. You can just see how technical. Oh, the, this is going to be so hard on the legs right now. You can just see, you know, the Spaniard. She's thinking, do I run this? Do I walk? Do I climb? What do I do? Sophia has a significant lead. She came through the last checkpoint in 3.27, 15 minutes ahead um, oh. of Miao Yao. I mean, she just hasn't taken a foot off the gas. That, to me, suggests that she doesn't know how far the lead is. But behind her, um, only a minute down on Miao Yao was Ayana Cortazar from Spain. Um, and behind her, almost on her, uh, two, two minutes down, sorry, Therese Leboeuf, who came third in the World Champs, who came third in Zagama. She is now challenging for that, um, for that podium position. But uh, we talked about Bart running through. He said, he said for Zagama, if he, uh, if he came top five, Oh, if he won, he'd get a tattoo of Zagama. <laughs> we haven't asked him what he'd do if he does well here today at Mont Blanc. He's podiumed here before, so we know he's got the... But look at this. So Eli's running with someone ahead of him. Do we think that's... Oh, no, it's I think that's a woman, athletes. yeah. Okay. So we've had, we've had a further update on the split. Eli's six, minute downs on, six minutes on Remy. Um, and then now taking the final descent all the way into Chamonix. So uh, yeah. he's going to be feeling pretty good right now. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Peter Engdahl and then Manny Meros behind in third and fourth. Now they're super close, aren't they? But tell me a bit about Peter Engdahl. We didn't expect him to be here at this point. No, I mean, P Peter is known as a, a very good trail runner, but he's not actually taken part that much in the Golden Trail series before. Um, he trains a lot in Norway um, and He's been sharing tips with um, with Kylian Jornet and John Album for quite a lot of time. Um, and so he's been picking up tips on how the Golden Shell works. But we don't know enough about his downhill skills. The, the, when Manu changed his gear, uh, you could see in the dis distance, Peter was running actually pretty quick. Um, which, this could be bad news for Eli. He's, he's got a, a significant lead over the two of them. But if both of them are chasing each other, they're going to be moving at a faster rate because it means Manu and behind won't have to concentrate quite as much to take that fast route. Um, the question will be, if they're both fast runners, will Peter allow Manu to overtake or will he force him to have to go round? Well, we can see on the screen now, Sophia Luckley, wow, 14, almost 15 minutes ahead of second place, Miao Yao from China. And in third, we've got Cortazar, who's just like two minutes, less than two minutes behind Miao Yao. And then a further two minutes back is Therese Leboeuf. And we, I think we're just going to wait and see. It's, it's whether the Spaniard can hold on to that third place because she was looking like she was struggling. If Therese Leboeuf has got more in the tank, we could see her overtake. And to the men's. I mean, and she was looking tired. But Therese has, has, has run um, the World Championships two weeks ago. So she's going to be tired as well. But in the men's, the significant ones are what the, the, the positions we haven't talked about. I mean, Maximilian Drion, this is fantastic. Top five. He's never been in the top 10 of the Golden Trail before. 
Um, we, he's got Bart on his shoulder, though, tracking him down, who's a very powerful descender. Um, Anthony Felber, he's in seventh. Uh, he was an outside shot of a podium. He started off very aggressively. I think he'll be a bit disappointed, actually, with, with how it's going so far. Um, but we can start to hear the noise outside of the finish line because they can sense the victory is coming. But um, Daniel Sands also in eighth place. Good, good run for him. And, and Sam Hendry challenging for 10th from, uh, from America. Also looking good. Uh, in fact, from Canada. But we're back now with Oyana. And this is, this is the, the real battle, I think, for a podium place that's mm. still on, on the table. Her and Miao Yao, who's ahead. And wow, well, you can see obviously the first woman, Sophia Lackley, on our left hand side screen. And on the right, are we going to be able to see Remy Bonnet? I mean, look at that. Absolutely epic finish line. This is so exciting for the Swiss man. He might be coming through to take his first win and his first top three finish, it would be, of the season so far. Yeah, I mean, he's, he won the Gamma in 2018, super young. And since that, he's never won a Golden Trail race in the first half of the season because he's not been able to transition from schemo to trail running. Golden Trail has been this focus this year. He really wants to win Cesare as an hour and he's changed his preseason and it's made, it, it's made such a difference. But um, did you see the, the skill there? Yeah. I mean, and so they've not reached their final descent. They're still running across the top now. Um, this is Manu Marias and, uh, but you can see now, Remy's he's tiring a little bit. Yeah. I, can I can I ask you in terms of the age of these athletes? And you said Remy back in 2018 was quite young. What what are we looking at for the average age? Because kind of the theory is that as, as you get older, maybe into your 30s, you become a bit better at endurance. Uh, but we see a mix here, don't we, of people in their 20s and their 30s? Yeah, and it, it really varies because you can be um, you can be a, a very fast runner when you're young, and and we're now seeing almost the rules are changing as young athletes are coming up. Um, I mean, Sophia's still super young. I think she's 22. Um, she's had that experience of through skiing, of, of building up the endurance. Endurance, but to get to, to a really aggressive downhill runner, you need to have that trail experience under your belt. And we saw with Remy, he emerged on the scene winning Zagama um, five years ago, and then suddenly was injured. He has struggled to master the downhill. He's really struggled to get his nutrition right. And this is probably the first race we've seen of this distance where he's managed to do both. Like this is a real significant win for him because it gives him confidence to be able to attack a race like Sierra's are now. When he was younger, he had a list of things on his, um, on his wall that he said he wanted to achieve. The first one was the Gamma. He crossed that off. He wanted to win the Golden Trail Series. He won that last year. Sierra Zanau has always been the one, but he's never admitted that's the last on his list publicly. But believe you and me, he's from Switzerland. It's a Swiss race. It's the biggest race in this series. And it's the race that his skills are not suited to because it's super good for road runners. These past five years, he's known he needs to get better at his downhill, at his nutrition, and he's done that today. And this is this Marathon de Mont Blanc, oh, second round of the Golden Trail World Series. It's the first television broadcast of the series. And we keep talking here about Sierra now, and that yeah. is going to be the next one that is broadcast on okay. TV. And we can't wait to bring you that one. And I can't okay. wait to see Remy at that okay. as well. But in, in terms of in terms of music, okay, we are uh, right at the end of, you know, the last oh. few kilometers. Sometimes, you know, if you're, if you're in your own training, you want a really great banger to come on to get yeah. you through it. I'm assuming they're not allowed any music in these races, are they? I mean, I, I've not actually checked the rules on that, but they wouldn't take music anyway, because you need so much focus running down these trails. And it's, as we've seen, you'll see throughout the course of this series, there will be falls. Hopefully not now. If someone falls now, it's through lack of concentration rather than um, technical ability. But as you get tired, you really need the feedback of, of, um, of being able to hear what's around you and also to be able to focus solely. And so these athletes wouldn't want music um, in their ears 
And also, it's very hard to come up with a playlist that doesn't so suddenly throw you in a Cliff Richard that you're not expecting. <laughs> Just move you out of your game. And so... Um, is Cliff Richard on your running playlist? I mean, he, he really... It's my first concert I ever went to. We, we, haven't, we haven't got time enough to we go digress. into Cliff. Um, one of the greatest British recording artists. Only second to Elvis Presley in British number one. <laughs> anyway, David, anyway, I, anyway. I, hate, I hate to cut you off, but we're just two kilometres from René Bonnet coming from outside our window here and crossing over that absolutely infamous finish line here in the centre of Chamonix. He'll probably be able to start to hear, you know, the town below him. He'll be, he'll be going to the road soon. He'll be feeling that nervous is, anticipation. Is this, is this uphill? Is this, that, I, this is so hard with the camera <laughs> angle. It looks like he's having to do a little bit of uphill. He looks, yeah. He knows the course, but when you're at this stage of the race and you get another uphill, there's an element of just like, really, guys, come on. We, he's going to be feeling like he's won already. His muscles are saying, please stop. And when you get that uphill, it's just so strong. But he, is this Eli Hemming? Or is this Peter? This is third male. Um, so this looks like this is Peter. Yeah, um, I think so. So Manu Marius has not caught him. So clearly Peter is at a very high level of skill and on downhill. Um, so the question is, can he hold off Manu? Manu? Um, my, my, I would expect once they get out of this trail and there's road running at the end, Peter will have the advantage against Manu. I think Manu will know that. So at some point, if he wants that podium, Manu is going to have to try and overtake. And how do you overtake on trail that is as tight as this? Yeah, and Joanna is actually looking really quite strong in third here coming down this. Is she known for being a good technical runner? She, I mean, she, she's won the gamma before. So she's won it twice in her past. And um, she's now 30, I believe, an incredibly experienced runner. And so she'll feel absolutely at home on these. She's got the stamina and she knows how to race these. Um, she'll now be thinking, what? can I get Meow Yow? Because as soon as she's out of that heat and actually back into her home turf, that's when you, you need to be attacking to not be defending. And so you can see she was moving so much more fluidly than she was at that aid station, than she was at the, the top of La Flegeur. But um, I mean, Peter is now looking sensational. This, was, this is faster than Remy at this point, yeah. significantly faster. But look at the way he's, he's running this. His hands are to the side, sometimes going up. He's getting that balance. And you, you just let the legs flow through and your arms just slightly adjust to each step. But um, Eli is actually, he's just two, uh, he's, he's, he's just six minutes and 50 seconds behind Remy. So, so the gap in the men's is not as big as the women's, uh, but that's still a sizable, you know, it's a seven minute in difference and that is sizable. The frustrating thing is we're seeing Peter, he's running gloriously. We want the cameraman to just flip reverse it and just so we can see where Manu is, because there's a chance Manu is right on his shoulder. Um, I suspect so, but we just can't tell until they go through a timing map and we're not going to get that to the finish. So it's not going to be until um, Manu potentially overtakes or not that we know how close that battle is. But it was seconds between them at the peak and I can't see Peter breaking Manu by that much unless Manu has got his nutrition wrong. And in terms of prize money, we'll go into that very shortly. But we're back here with Remy. And, and he is going to be really keen to get these 200 points on the board and get himself up that leaderboard in terms of the standards of the Golden Trail World Series. He, he did want, he wants to, you know, he wants to carry on where he left off from last season, really, and, and maintain some really good performances. And in terms of prize money, it's equal for men and women in the Golden Trail series which is just uh, just exactly how it should be and we love to see it it increases the professionalism of the sport and the gender parity and yeah uh, also the race is exactly the same for the men and the women they usually start the same this was a bit different they started 30 minutes different but it's given us a really exciting end Absolutely. and that that little downer that little slightly more technical bit that uh, the rebbe is on that is the very last part of the course before you emerge onto the road and when you're on road you've just got a little glory lap through the crowds so Remy is less than a kilometre, I suspect, from the finish. This win today, unless uh, and if, if, if it stays in the same positions they're in, they will be tied on first joint. Here, Manny Marias from Spain and Remy Bonnet, which means that it, it'll be really exciting for this season because we have the Dolomis run coming up. 
probably favoring Manu. Sierras are now after that, favoring Remy. Yeah. And these athletes will want to choose their best three races. And so tactically, they're going to want to rest as much as they can um, later on in the season to save themselves to the final. So the better they do earlier on this season, gives them more cards to play later on. Would there be any runners uh, that do all the races? Because I know it's your, it's your it's your top three races within within the, the six races of the Golden Trust that, that count and then get you into the final. But is there anyone that wants to run them all? Absolutely. So because each race is a month apart, you do have a bit of time to recover. And the fact some of the races are slightly shorter, you've got Dolomis Run, Half Marathon, you have... Um, oh, and I think he and, almost oh, went, went the we wrong have, way there. We have Remy emerging. <laughs> So he's now, he's coming into the town. You'll see how close this is now. And he must know that he's got this one. Um, we'll be able to see the back of the finish line fairly soon. And you might even hear the noise in the background. He's raced here four times before, at least. He has led this race three times and never podium before. So this is a significant step up for Remy in terms of performance this early on in the season, but in, in terms of longer races, getting the downhill right, getting the strategy right, this to him is gonna give him so much confidence and he came into this flowing with confidence already. Absolutely. I mean, what what a time to be Remy Bonnet right now. He looks like he's enjoyed it the whole time. This will just be a beautiful finish for him. He's had such a good race. We weren't sure at the beginning, well, we had a couple of different leaders going mm. on. It was a really interesting start. But I tell you what, from, from not many kilometers in, it was like, this is Remy's day. I want to see these Strava segments afterwards, like the, the climbs he was doing. I want to be, I'd love to see how they compare with previous years because he came through the halfway point in a record time, um, which is very unexpected given that he was pacing for the whole race. And typically at that stage, you see the faster road, more road suited runners being ahead. Um, but Sophia Lockley as well. I mean, these two, this, this is a real learning experience for her. She's never run as far as she is right now in this race. So every step is a new distance for her. I mean, that's absolutely wild that she's managed to do that. It really is. And look at sunny Chamonix. What a place to be. I've never been here in the summer before. And it is beautiful. It's been absolutely alive with trail runners this weekend. Look at that finish line. You can just see the back of the finish line there. And we're going to start to see the bells. You can see here as Remy runs in here, he's going to loop round past those buildings and he's basically in the final U-turn. He, he is high-fiving people as he goes. He's got the cameraman behind him. We've got the drone shot here. Chamonix is coming alive to welcome Romy, Remy Bonet home to take his first podium and his first first place of the Golden Trail Series this year. And you can hear the noise in the background. Uh, Remy's from France, but he is so popular on this tour. This will feel like a home crowd to him. And they will absolutely erupt as soon as they see him. But um, yeah, he's, ne he's never won in Mont Blanc before. Um, he, he was potentially pre-race favorite, but there were so many question marks about this performance. And here we see the Swissman just about coming through and you can see how excited the crowd are to welcome him home. It's a hot day here and he has absolutely got the gas. You see his white cap coming through, arms are open and he is loving this moment as he takes his first win of the Golden Trail World Series 2023. It's the first time we've been live on television. We thought Remy could do this. He's now coming into the final straight a name we suspected, but those question marks were there and they've been blown away. Look at the smile on the face. Not only is he taking the win of Mont Blanc Marathon, but he takes the lead in the Golden Trail Series. He won last year. He's now in prime position to win again. Look at that. He's burnt. He's knackered. He's delighted. Absolutely. That is one tired, warm man taking a well-deserved break. And look at that smile. Truth, he looks quite fresh. He looks quite happy. He's going to be welcoming home. Who else is there? Maybe just doing a bit of a victory lap, going to see some friends, going to see some family, high-fiving. When, when there's cheers like that for you, you want to get involved as much as possible. He's got six minutes of this to be doing. Yeah, I know. Soaking it up. Why we've not? We've got to fill up the time, Remy. This is so <laughs> Come on. But, um, he will be absolutely loving this right now. And it's amazing how tired legs disappear 
as soon as you're feeling that victory, you've crossed that line and um, it's just got his nutrition absolutely perfect. And this is a, if you're watching this at home, you're going to be nervous about this result. Back with the women then, Sophia Luckley, who has led this basically from the out. She's almost home. Look, look at the way she's running now, though. You can sense the pain in that. She's not striding out in the same way. And she clearly, it's, it's not a very fluid gait that she's got currently. And that means every step and every stride is hurting her. She is going to be screaming out for that finish. Hopefully by now she knows she's got a significant lead. Um, that sometimes can actually um, lead to more pain because you slow down. And if anything, you just want to get it done. But she came here off the back of a ski season. She's an Olympic skier. There were question marks about her, whether she could run something so far. She came to Stranda last year, her first Golden Trail race. And she said even at the end of that, a 30K race, um, a, a slightly under 30K, by the end, she was running on fumes. She had no energy left. So I suspect that's the same as today. Well, but look at that shot coming in to the home straight. It's the second man. Eli Hemming, he's, 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 he's been a professional triathlete. He changed because he wanted to, to do a sport where he could actually have more of a social life and, and not just spend all of his time on a bike. This is only his second season in it. We knew he could be good on the ups, but he's learned so quickly to run the downs. He's never good. He's had a second place before in Flagstaff, but this is a far more significant win for him. It's a longer race distance. It's a more crowded field with far more competition, and he'll be absolutely delighted with this performance. He's never finished at this finish. For many, the best finish line in the world, the home of trail running. So Eli is going to be absolutely delighted. But oh, here so, we are, Sophia. Sophia. Was it Sophia. Who's coming in? Who's going to win out of Sophia or Eli? It's going to be neck and neck for the finish. This is fantastic. And Sophia has been absolutely exceptional in this race. This is the woman who has never run a marathon before. And well, I think she'll be running a few more, don't you, David? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. And um, if you're Ninka Brinkman, we spoke to her earlier, you're watching this. She knows that Sophia's good. But they'd have had a very different winter training, and this will make you nervous. She's put down a marker, a hugely impressive time. Early in the season, though, and Sophia is learning trail. She's living in Norway, and her sole focus for this summer is the trail. So she's going to get better at those downhills. But if she's turning out performances like this, off the back of only three runs a week since April, come the end of the season, she is going to be the one to watch and if anyone can stop Ninka this season it's going to be Sophia Lockley. Absolutely and what a view it is to come home to isn't it? I mean it's beautiful I mean all these cars in the way but I mean that view <laughs> coming down so just some absolute flat tarmac to finish on as well after all that trail. I hope she knows how far ahead she is and that she can just enjoy this. Yeah I, I, she'll start to hear the cheers down and actually she'd have heard the cheers of Remy and that would Bring a big smile to her face. But we're here now with, is this, is this, is, is this, this Bart? Yeah, this must be Bart. This surely. Where does he come from? Come <laughs> I, I, he was in sixth the last time we knew. The, either there's a trouble with the tracker or something. Um, that, that That's Manny Bart. in this fourth. Is Manu. But if we think looking at how Peter was flowing and how um, Eli was flowing, these two are now on an uphill. So. I suspect this is wrong. I suspect Bart and Manu in fourth or fifth. But here comes Eli. Hopefully he knows he's got second place and can really enjoy it. Because they've got this U-turn, they can look back and see if they can be caught. Last year, Anais lost her place to Danny on the line, the third place. So you've got to be careful coming around here. But Eli is coming in to his first podium in Europe. Wow, and what a moment for him. He wasn't necessarily tipped to be on the podium here, but he's going to soak this up all he can. You can hear the cowbells, you can hear the crowd, and they are loving it, and he is loving it too. He turned up at Golden Show last year. He didn't have a sponsor even at the end of the season, but his performances in the second half of the race of the season at Flagstaff, at Pikes Peak, they got him back on the tour. So to come here now with a sponsor, him and his wife 
professional trail athletes, a second place at Mont Blanc, the most famous finish in trail running is magnificent. And if he can do this now in his second season of trail running, just like Sophia, he's gonna be, get, be getting better throughout this season. He's gonna be learning how to run technically and he is one to watch for the future. And here we are, here is the golden girl. What a performance from Sophia. She has put in, the, the lady from the USA, from Team Salomon. She has been absolutely exceptional. She is gonna soak this up. She is gonna smack the hands of everyone she can see and she is gonna love this end too. What a race for her. I, I've never seen a winner with so many doubts the day before the race. Last night, this morning, she was so pale, so nervous. She didn't think she could do this, and yet she attacked early in the race. She trusted how she felt, and she backed herself, and it worked so well. She had a 15-minute gap at one point, maybe longer, and this is a new marker in trail running. We've had Maud, we've had Ninka, we've had Judith. They've all been European runners. But now, for the first time, we have an American runner coming onto the scene that everyone is going to fear. And you can see it. The crowd is going wild for Sophia Lackley as she takes first place here at the Marathon de Mont Blanc, the second round of the Golden Trail World Series. And she has been absolutely phenomenal. The American has looked so strong throughout and she absolutely deserves this. Yeah, and, and, and this is going to completely change her season. The confidence she's going to get from this, she'll choose different. And for some reason, we've chosen not to show the finish line. Please get back to Sophia as soon as we can to see her cross that finish. This is looking like it's our, our third place runner. No, th yeah, this is Peter in third. He's, I mean, he's, he's looking significantly better than, than Barton and Manu. Um, and, and this is a really great step up for him as well. Um, He's been known around the circuit for some time, but it, it has been wondered whether he can turn up to a golden trail and perform on, um, on this big world stage. And he's clearly shown he's got the skills to do that. He's going to be delighted with this performance. And, um, but behind him, there's, it, it's still going to be quite tight. He'll still be looking back to see if, uh, if Manu or Bart are closing in. Um, we're seeing some other shots that, that Manu is still in the woods. So it looks like this third place is, is... way out of reach. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, he's looking back now. He'll have his spies as well who are there for him. Manu is in fourth place indeed. So what does that mean for the overall standings then? Remy came fourth in Zagama, the first race of the season. Uh, and and, and Man, Manny, he won that. And now he's likely to come fourth. Does that mean they're equal on points? Yeah, absolutely. These two are now tied. Um, if it stays which, like this, yeah. Yeah, we're... And it, it, it looks like Bart and Manu are going to have a bit of a tussle. But at the moment, if Manu comes in fourth, it means they're on equal points in the season. Um, Sophia, it's her first race, so she will not be leading. And depending on how the race unfolds behind her, it could be Therese Leboeuf, it could be Daniela Omus, who finished today lead of the championship. If Caitlin Fielder has a blinded down that last hill, which she's certainly capable of, capable of she had second in Zagama, she could pick up places today and potentially finish first overall. We're not going to know until we see more of those finishes. But uh, we now have, is this Peter running in or is this our, is this our fourth place? This is, this is Manu running in, yeah. So this shows you how close it is. We've only just seen Peter cover these. Manu's not going to catch him now. There's about a 200 meter dif dif uh, difference between the two. And he's now running in. This is the final section before that U-turn into the finish. He's going to know this. Having to navigate some spectators along the way, some steps down into the centre of Chamonix. What a beautiful place to have a race and to end the race to. Absent. And, and you can hear the crowds coming now. They'll get a sense of the third place male is coming in and uh, the noise will start to ring out. He's never, he's never podiumed on a golden trail. He's grabbing his hat in disbelief. Did you see that? He must have just run past a friend. This is going to be a wonderful moment for him. And oh, hopefully a sign of... Don't stop for too long, though. You don't know who's behind you. We, we, we do believe he knew that, that lady. He wasn't, he wasn't just mugging a, uh, a, a local runner. But um, hopefully we're going to see him now on the, on the golden trail. The fact that he's come top three here, he'll have all expenses paid. Invitation to the Dolomites Dollar, run next month. Um, We'd expect to see a run of his calibre at Sierra Zanal as well. So 
fingers crossed this means he, this is the new man to watch on the Golden Trail. And if he's coming third in his first proper race here, he's only going to get better as well. Absolutely. And just imagine that feeling as you're running through the sunny streets of Chamonix, having just kind of smashed expectations, maybe smashed your own expectations. And he looks pretty fresh still, like he looks in control, doesn't seem to be have picked up any niggles or anything. And he just looks like he's enjoying this. Yeah, and, and this is where the noise will hit him and then it all comes home. Um, you, you, you live out these moments in your, in your head, you dream about it, but it's not until you see, there you go, you see the finish that reality happens and he's now coming through this is a tremendous performance by peter all the way from sweden um finishing off our top three podium peter engdahl uh, his first podium in the golden trail series what a performance from him mm. and a new talent to watch manu and bart there's a new downhill challenger in town yeah, and didn't he put out a great performance from Team Adidas Terex. And it was just so nice to see someone new coming through in that way and enjoying it so much. And look at that, just enjoying the moment. Oh, I mean, what a feeling to be like smashing those hands. And just think, not that long ago, we had COVID and it's just so brilliant to see these races at full capacity and have so many people come out and support again. Now, the big question will be, what's happening to second, third and fourth in the women's? It was looking like Miao Yao was back running fluidly. She had a couple of minutes lead over Oyana, but Oyana is very good on technical downhill. And having looked like she was starting to lag a bit on that uphill, she suddenly emerged again, the runner that we know she can be. She's very experienced. She's good at longer distances. And, and this is Manny Marias coming in fourth. He will be fighting all the way to the line, knowing how important these points are. Because if he wants to stay at the lead of the Golden Trail series, he needs to finish in fourth place to be tied with Remy at the top. Yeah, he'll be, he'll be, he'll, do you think he'll be happy with this performance of coming in fourth? I think so. I mean, he's, he loves the wet, he loves the technical. While there are some technical points on, on this race, this really suits people who are more of the, the fast, fluid runners. I mean, look at the smile on his face. That's a man who's had a good time, hasn't it? Maybe not the one, two, three that some people expected, but he seems pretty content with that. And, and with races like this, Often you know you've got a chance of winning, but it depends on a certain amount of luck. In previous years, we've seen the leaders all fall apart. No one who's won, who's been leading at the top of the first climb in the last four years, has ended up winning the race. This is the first year it's happened. Remy was leading at the top and not at the finish. And that's because people fall apart. And so Manu would have known he was pacing sensibly to try and ensure the best chance of the fastest finish time hoping that people would fall apart but actually so many athletes have got it right we didn't see anyone dropping yeah. out of that you know and five. that's really good to see just from a, a nutrition point of view and just from a from an athlete uh, point of view that see that they can all hold it together like that it's really great to see that they've got it right and also i mean remy has fought a few demons here hasn't he because he hasn't had the most luck but coming home in four in fifth it's bart it's Bart. I mean, a great performance for Bart. He's had a horrific season. He was burnt out from overtraining, had to miss the start of it. He then went to Pikes Peak two weeks early to train for Altitude. Altitude just doesn't like him. He'll be so pleased to be able to put an end to last year and to come back. Fifth place is good for him. He'll be happy enough with that. He just wants and gentlemen, the podium. He knows he's got him in him, but... ...winner of the Mont Blanc Marathon, Rémi Bonnet, the Swiss Rocket. First question that we all uh, are wondering, because you made it look so good. Did it feel so good the whole way? Yeah, until the 30th kilometer, I was finished. We're hoping we're going back to see some more of Rémi there. Um, fingers crossed. The... Uh, but it must mean we have another runner coming through. This looks like Miao Yao, I suspect, with the red in the bag. Five this could... to come. You had two DNFs, two fourth place, so never even on the podium. Now, the question is, you knew you, were, you wanted to stay ahead of the game. And so was it planned, however, to start leading from the climb of Plepozet? 
No, it was not planned, but I like I looked my watch. I was, I was like under 160 heart rate in the climb, so I was like like normal, like doing. I was not pushing hard, and I saw that the other was suffering a lot. So I decided to make a little bit more gas, and that was a good uh, good solution. You opened the gap, and so did you know the difference between you and Eli Hemming when you were at the last aid station in La Flegère? Yeah, I knew that it was uh, around six minutes, so I knew that it was okay for the win. So you're the 2022 Gold Trail World Series winner. What's the plan for the rest of the season? Ah, the same, huh? <laughs> the same always. Uh, when I go to a race, it's for winning it. So I will take risks and I will uh, do all I know to do. Like I will race fast and uh, try to go into the end. Well, then we wish you the best of luck. Thank you and congratulations again, ladies and gentlemen. Remy Bonnet. Great to hear from Remy Bonnet there. See that 160 heart rate up the climb. Mine's at about <laughs> 210, just sat here with the excitement of the race. But this this is where it really helps to have your watch on on your wrist, feeding back how you're doing. Because he knew there was an issue of going too hard too early. But when you can just see instantly, actually, I'm, I'm trusting my body, but I've got my watch reconfirming that my heart rate means I'm not working too hard, which meant he could attack a little bit more. And what a race it's been here for the Marathon de Mont Blanc for the second round of the Golden Trail World Series. Now, with the race continues for our second and third place in the ladies. We're not quite sure who we're seeing here. A little bit of a recap, maybe, from um, seeing... But we're now on the finish line. We suspect Miao Yao is going to be coming through. She's never podiumed a Golden Trail before. She's been known to be very good at trail previously. She's won um, a UTMV of T event. But in lockdown, she focused more on marathon due to the circumstances. And she became fast. But the question mark after Sagama was whether she'd be able to pace herself sensibly we and but we're going we to Sophia Lockyer, this, this week's winner. Marathon winner for what is your first marathon distance? We were talking a little bit about this fact yesterday and you were like, I know how to run, this is running, I'm just going to keep pushing. You made it look easy, did that feel easy all the way? Um, not all the way. I was like rising to 30k and I was like, oh my god, like I can do this. And then I was just like anticipating 30k mark because I was like, I've heard everyone like as soon as you hit that, even if you're like on cloud nine, it's going to hurt. And I it completely went that direction. But I was thinking about what I was talking about yesterday. Like I know how to run and like I was not moving fast, but I was like literally just freaking move your legs and uh, go up the hill and and hopefully it's fast enough and like I'm beyond shocked that it was because I was not I was like I was nervous. I was I thought I'd started out cautious and I was like man I don't know if it was cautious enough but I just somehow kept getting gaining more and more on the second woman and I think just knowing that fact was like pushing me through but man I was hurting. <laughs> You said you felt like you had a conservative start. It felt everything but that. Because when we saw Yao Meow pull away, and you so you responded right away. It's like, eh, eh, and we see Meow Yao just there, just coming through to take the second place. And in third, it's the Spaniard. Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic result for her. She, she's won events of this scale before, but, but not for some time. And at one point in the race, it looked like she may be dropping off. And... Uh, and faster. she looks like she's really enjoying this last part of the race, doesn't she? Yeah, and it's great to see. The second uphill was just a roller coaster for me. And then I uh, was beyond grateful for my lead on the last downhill because I was like, all I was thinking was like, just stay on your feet because I was tripping over everything. And I uh, definitely did not bring enough water. <laughs> so uh, I, I like was chugging so much stuff on the on the last downhill just to like keep the energy and it was enough so yeah i mean breaking such a cross record obviously is going to feel tough but you got the win 2023 Mont Blanc marathon champion congratulations and we look forward to seeing your race again in the gold trail world series thank you sophia
Now, we I hope you can see Oyana coming in, taking her podium. Look how much this means to her. A tremendous performance. Um, Zagama, that suited her. She wasn't top three there. So to come from, uh, from a race that you know plays your strengths, to a race like Bob Block Marathon. You can just see how much it means to her. It's so great because it looked like a right struggle for both her and Meow Yao, who, oh goodness, on that climb. And it would have been so easy for her once Meow Yao had gone to almost be head down knowing people were chasing her. But the great thing about Ayana, she's such a good technical downhill runner. She's always going to finish on the downhill. And I think that gave her the strength to push on. But yeah, I, I, I think she's a, she's she's surprised with this result herself yeah and it's brilliant to see it really is uh, daniel sands fantastic we think he's in fifth sixth place yeah sixth, i think it's sixth sixth place we met there's a chance we've missed someone crossing the line but this is a great result for danny as well he, he's done well at pikes peak was just climbing but this is a long run he's turned professional this year he's a um he's a qualified doctor very young in the sport Clearly very tired there. Um, uh, a wonderful, wonderful yeah. Spanish runner. Just these, these, these scenes on the finish line. Everyone's happy, exhausted. And who's that coming through there? And this looks like... Ooh, we, number 73. We'll have Mark a quick the set. German, that is. I don't know who just crossed the line. But it's just all of these scenes of smiling, happy people. No one looking too unwell, which is always what we want at the end of this. But Sophia Lackley, in that interview, gosh, she looked like she'd just been out for a gentle jog. She looked pretty yeah. great. I mean, she, she was saying towards the end there, she just was completely out of, of, uh, out of water. And um, I, number 73 says uh, is Onzo Ratti. Um, this was bib numbers we had previously. There's a chance it's changed, but... The fact that she was chugging water on the downhill. And here comes, this looks like a, is that a Czech flag? Polish flag, I believe. Red, white. Um, not sure who that gentleman is, but another top 10 finisher. Another new name who we expect to see on the Golden Trail in the future. Because they get all expenses paid for the next race. But the fact Sophia was having to chug so much liquid and energy on that final downhill. Yeah. It shows she just hadn't taken on enough I know. in the race. So this wasn't even... Her perfect performance. No, but what a performance it was. And we do know that the first Frenchman is Simon Packard, who came home in seventh. I don't know if we got that on our screens, but oh my goodness, just so many great athletes there. And it's been really good not to see so many struggling, do you know what I mean? And really falling mm. back. Like, just like Miao Yao had in, uh, in Zagama. It's so nice not to see that happen today. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the one person we haven't seen cross the finish line yet is um, Anthony Felber, and it, he had a brave race, took it hard, but we hope he's going to come in shortly. So here's some race highlights for you. I mean, what a race it has been. And this is the men. And, and early on, they, they were they were quite close together, weren't they? We had a few different leaders uh, in the American. And then we had the Swede. Uh, and then Remy Bonnet did pull out in front. But yeah, this is Oscar Cleason, who, who did lead for quite a long time, didn't he? Oh. Well, it's going to be interesting where he finishes today because he's an incredible 5K runner. I think it's 14.20 approximately his 5K time. And uh, he really used that speed for the first 10K. But this is the point that Remy overtook. And from this point on, there was no looking back really for Remy. Um, it, it was a brave race by him because he, he didn't need to attack so aggressively, but he was just feeling great. And, and same with Eli Hemming. Both of these runners knew that it was going to be a long race for them. And if they really wanted to try and make their mark, they had a choice. Do we attack early or not? They attacked early, but held on. But we can see here, Bart, at fourth, one of our more powerful descenders, Manu Marias, 
and Peter both behind at this stage, which goes to show you just how important it is to pace these races with the two big climbs and a, a huge 45 kilometer race to run. And uh, Remo was saying or on the uphill, his, his heart rate was only at 160 beats per minute. And so he just pushed on a little bit more as you do as you're running up thousands of meters of ascent. And that's where the big challenge is for him. He's so good at uphills. It's hard to know how hard to attack because he can jog these without feeling like he's, he's running too hard. But do you take advantage of your weapon at the start of the race or not? And this is the challenge he's always had. He's clearly got it right this week, which means in the future, he'll be able to run with more certainty. But we can see Eli Hemming here just looking so fluid still. Yeah, and he came through to take second. And it was such an impressive run by him, obviously fueling up at the fuel station. We love to see it. We love to see the aid stations being used. Grabbing some oranges there. He, he either he wanted a change of flavor in his mouth or he was like, I need fuel right now. But at this stage, this is Manu in fourth place um, with Peter just ahead. At the, we knew they were going to be coming up from behind and going to be attacking quite soon. But uh, Remy, the question mark would be whether on the downhill his legs were still there, his nutrition was right, but he just didn't stop running fast. No, I know. And he just looked comfortable the whole time, really, didn't he? He did say about the 30k mark that he had a bit of a wobble, but it didn't really ever look in doubt to us after he took up such a considerable lead. And then him coming home, he really enjoyed the home straight, didn't he? And, and, and this is, you can see how much this means to him. He's never won at Mont Blanc before. This is such a big race on the circuit, but it's not just that. He's tried so many times. He's led three times and he's never even been on the podium. So this was a huge question mark on whether he can deliver early in the season. The answer is yes. And this is ominous to the other runners in our series. At Sierras are now the next one live on international television. He'll be there wanting to tick off the final big race on his bucket list by winning Sierras and Al. And it does mean that in the overall rankings, we think that him and Manu are going to be tied because respectively they've become first and fourth in the two races so far. But Eli Hemming, he, did, he wasn't here for the first race of the season. An American runner coming over. We expect to see hopefully more of him at, at um, Sierras and Al. That certainly suits him. Hopefully the Dol Dolomis run in July but a second place here this early on this season is fantastic for him. And he's only, only going to grow in strength. But look what this means to runners. First podium at Golden Trail from Sweden. Our new runner, Peter. Fantastic result. Yeah, he absolutely loved that, didn't he? You saw how much it meant to him. And just absolutely stunning scenery for the backdrop of the Marathon de Mont Blanc. It definitely hasn't disappointed, has it? We've had incredible weather. We hope that the runners aren't too burnt out there. But we're still waiting from our fourth place, fifth place, which in, in a lot of running, in a lot of competitions, you'd think of first, second and third as important. But because this is a race series, every position has an impact on the overall race standings. There's the top 10 who all receive money and funding. Their sponsors, their points, their season depends on them battling all the way to the line. So races like Caitlin Fielder, who are yet to finish, Daniela Omus, Theresa LeBeouf, all of them will be wanting to be top five at the end of today in the overall rankings. And that means they need to perform well. But not just that, they need confidence going into the next race. And if you don't perform on a day like today, it starts to give doubts. But this is uh, Sylvia Nordskar there is coming. This and is Theresa Booth. So we've, we've clearly had at least our top five finishes. Yeah. And here we go. Here's official. The results are in for the men. And in at three hours and 35 minutes and four seconds was Remy Benet. And, and second, Eli Hemming at just five minutes, 46 after. And then in third, such a wonderful performance from Peter Engdahl at 11 minutes, 40 behind the winning pace. Fourth, Manuel Merias is going to be happy with that. And in fifth, it's Bart from Poland. At 3.35, uh, there were two extra kilometers this year. Last year was 3.35. That's effectively the course record. Let's find out some more from them. We're now seeing the finish line. We're hoping to get some interviews from uh, here's Eli Hemming, second place. Representing Salomon and taking a fantastic second place today. You had told me that that was the first race of the season. That was your big focus and it paid off. 
what, what, what did you do in the lead up to get to that kind of level of fitness? Oh, you know, uh, up where we live uh, in Colorado, we're living at altitude, so uh, up above uh, 10,000 feet, all still snow. So I uh, kind of had to wait till a little later. So, uh, the early races were uh, a bit hard to get to. So I uh, just kind of focused on this one and uh, did. Tried to learn how to ski, not good at skiing, uh, but just started riding up. Uh, up until now and uh, feeling really good. You were holding on to Remy for a while in that climb up to Les Posettes. You guys were with Anthony Felbert. But Anthony faded away a little bit. And then what did you think from that point on? You were in second place and kind of with no one. Like what was going through your mind? Uh, you know, uh, every time we got to a little bit steeper part, I uh, felt that uh, Remy was a bit in the league of his own today. So the and uh, so I knew I had to stay within my own uh, Within my own abilities, because uh, I knew the climb up the La Pagere was really where the race happens, and so I was trying to save it for that. And uh, even with that, I was I was almost cooked at La Pagere. But you did well because when Bart caught up with you after the the descent into Valorcine, we we're like, oh, maybe it's a change. And then as soon as you guys branched it out into that little var variant uphill, you pulled back up onto him. So you were still managing yourself at this point. Is that correct? Yeah. So that was. Uh, that was me not trying to cook my legs on the, that downhill. Uh, I knew, again, I knew La Fougere is where it happened. And uh, I, I had that drilled in my head, don't don't ruin it before La Fougere. So uh, that, that was the whole goal today, is be running well up to La Fougere. So there we go, you gotta do your homework and know when to pace yourself. You did the job right, second place. Eli Heming, ladies and gentlemen, second place of the 2023 Mobile Marathon. Congratulations, and we look forward to the rest of the season. I mean, he clearly judged his race to perfection. And you see the challenge with trying to race a marathon at this stage of the season. He said he was just too close, uh, too much snow. But we're going to find out for uh, what happened in the women's race shortly. Um, but yeah, he lives in Colorado. He couldn't trail run because there was too much snow on the ground. <laughs> he had to learn to ski to try and get his... So this... this who have we got coming here? Was that Daniela Omas? Coming through the line? Looks fairly similar. No, nope, I don't believe so. But we're going to have a recap of our women's performance now. So we, with the women's race, we set off at 7 a.m. local time. And we weren't sure who was going to go out fast, but it was Miao Yao who went out so speedy, didn't she, and took an early lead. And I wonder if she'll do that for the rest of the season because that might have punished her. She was caught faster than we were expecting. So at this stage in the woods, Sophia came onto her shoulder and, and really put the marker down, which was a huge surprise for us because Sophia had been nervous about this distance and whether or not she could hold on if she could get her nutrition right. But she's so good at climbing. Her ski, she's an Olympian. Her skiing lungs just allowed her to climb and climb and climb. You can see the energy there. At this stage though, Miao Yao was looking like she was starting to struggle. Her, her gait had changed and um, Ayana Cortazar, an unexpected person to be up in top three, was starting to be on her shoulder. And you can see the overtake here. Um, well, at this point in the race, we really thought this could be it for Miao Yao. This happened in Zagama. Yeah. She fell behind. She ended up outside of the top 15. And we thought this could be game over, but no, she, she hang on in there and, and you can see Ayana starting to press a bit with Tabor Hemming starting to make some ground on them as well, followed by Sylvia Norska from Norway. But just Sophia, luckily, as she took, I think she took the lead at about 16 minutes in and she just never gave it up and she just looked so spectacular. And whilst everyone else was walking up these bits, she was running and she just looked in control and it was just beautiful to watch. And she's, she's still learning how to run on trail. The good thing about Mont Blanc is that there is quite a lot of running where it's, it's fairly smooth or it's a little bit less technical. And she was really taking advantage of that. We did think we'd start to see though a change in pace from her by now. And it just wasn't happening. Whereas these two were locked in a battle back and forth the whole way. Yeah, I think it was really important for Miao Yao and, and the Spaniard to be together. And it really helped them each kind of secure those positions. I think maybe if they'd each been out there on their own, uh, it wouldn't have been the same story. They might have dropped back. And it just shows you the mental strength that these two have. Look at them here. They almost look broken and finished. And every time they overtook, there's a chance that your head would drop and you think, right, let's let them go. 
but they never shook each other off right until the top. They were battling all the way in the knowledge that they had to finish strong. Yeah, and Sophia, they're taking on some water, but not enough. She said she did not have quite enough water, but her lead was so big. I can't, I don't know, we haven't got the exact facts, but we're talking at least a 13 minute, maybe even more um, lead, which is quite exceptional uh, considering this woman has never run a marathon before. Yeah, absolutely incredible. And at some point she'd have been told she had a, a sizable lead and that she could relax a bit. But, and, and she finished in a time of like 4.12, 12 minutes ahead of the opposition. But to, to come out here, Ninka wasn't here. We, we weren't sure who was gonna be able to take out this race. And she's just demolished the field. This is early in the season for her. She's still adapting to trail. Her legs are still getting used to the, the pounding of those downhills. And this means that, yeah, this is a real cry to the opposition that she is in contention to win this overall series. Second for Miao Yao, she's put the demons as a gamma behind her. She's shown that even if she starts to lose her pace, she can battle to the end. And Ayana Cortazar, she's never podium golden trail. I think her last win as a gamma was back in 2012, 2015. This is an incredible turnaround for her. For her. And is that blood on the left-hand side there? Wow, and that looks like a right fool. We hope not, but that's, that's our top five there. Sylvia Nordskaff from Norway and Therese LeBeuf from Sweden. Our top five ladies, incredible performance. Yeah, incredible performances, incredible setting, and just an absolutely incredible race to be the first live TV broadcast of the Golden Trail Series here in Chamonix. And we've absolutely loved it. And I think this means Series of Birth could potentially be leading right, overall. We're, we're we now going to cut to the interview women. where there will be a translator, though, so there'll be a, a little bit of delay on the, the responses. China. But here we are with Miao Yao. You had an extremely strong start, aggressive in the lead on the flatter section. What was going through your mind at this point? Was this an attack for the win right from the beginning? And they've travelled with a delegation. Um, there's a, a few of them. Her coach is also a runner as well. That's always interesting. So does, does the coach travel with her to every race? Is she going to be taking part in every race? Okay, so that is one we should hopefully be hearing. Cost a little bit, but it turned around. And this is what we saw during the race. You kind of faded back a little bit, but then you kept fighting together with Oyana for second place. And China really is the sleeping giant of trail running. We've seen in the past the their athletes come to UTMB and they traditionally start very, very fast. A lot of them have got a, a fast road running, so running background is, and they're still trying to adapt. You were fighting for second place. In Chamonix, the last time you were here was for CCC. Did you remember this positive uh, energy from CCC? So she, he's mentioned CCC before. She's actually raced UTMB here before, where she took it out extremely fast and unfortunately couldn't finish that race. Um, but with, she is, she had the record for CCC. Um, she blew it apart by 20 minutes. And so to come back now, um, she is a mix of talent of pace on the road and is clearly more adept at trail than we'd suspected. Yeah. Yeah, so, so to use potentially the positive energy from good memories. So in Zigama, it was muddy and, and, and more technical and she fell on her knee. Did that? She, was she still injured or was she back at 100% at the start? And in, in Zagama, um, the weather was horrendous. She was battling with Blondie La Rondelle all the way up to the, to the, the, the uh, Sac de Spiritu, at which point Daniela Omas caught her. And because of that overtake, I think, in the fall, she really dropped, dropped ahead. The cold and the wind in the rain, as soon as you start running fast, really gets to you. And she just 
complete shed positions all the way down. So she was almost mentally checked out by having to look and pay attention to the terrain. So it's better this time. Where do we see her next time for the Golden Trail World Series? And if you didn't catch that at home, she was saying it's at Zagama. She was having to concentrate too much on the trail. And so she lost confidence and just wasn't able to run quickly. Whereas Mont Blanc is a little bit more runnable. Wow, so that's going to be a massive step up from 42 kilometers to 170 kilometers. Yao Miao will see her back in Chamonix for the UTMB. Well, thank you so much. Congratulations again for an amazing performance, and we look forward to seeing you back in Chamonix. Thank you and congratulations. And it just shows you the contrast between the two races. The fact that Zagama, she just couldn't deal with the technicality of it in the wet. Mont Blanc, beautiful sunshine, very runnable. But we're going next to the Dolomis run, which is it's only a half marathon distance. Yeah, so what type of terrain are we looking at there in comparison today? And that's so different, isn't it? Half the length. Yeah, and, and we're going to see some new runners on the circuit as well. People like Elise Ponset, specialists at shorter races, very technically diff gifted downhill. But this is our, this is our top 10 finishes. And uh, a lot of names we, we, we didn't necessarily expect to see in those positions. Um, Daniela Omis in sixth, still a good position there. You know, still a good race, but... Um, Therese LeBeouf in fourth, potentially our new overall leader. And Sylvia Norskar, turned professional this year, top five. She's, she's going to be very happy with that. Yeah, absolutely. But what a day we have had here for the Mont Blanc Marathon as round two of, you know, the Golden Trail Series. The first time we have been on TV. The camera footage has been amazing. The volunteers have been amazing. The race has been amazing. I've been Jess Rogers. I've been David Hellard. And we have just had an absolutely outstanding time commentating for you today and bringing you this amazing series. And if you enjoyed this race, the Dolomis race is known for its technicality. It's hopefully not going to be wet. So you're going to get to see the fastest downhill running of the season. They don't go on the paths. They split away. They break away. It is insane to see them. That is the next race next month. So come and join us then. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't forget to follow on social media and we will see you next time for the third round of the Golden Trail Series. It's going to be the race of the season.
envoyer une blague qui me commence en dehors, des bon, bah. Ah, je sais qu'il croit, mais bon, bah, tout le week-end, il avait des feuilles. Tout le week-end.
Et donc Jules de quatrième place, il prend la victoire d'un junior, premier junior aujourd'hui. Allez, il est posté le Jules. Et on a le deuxième 